The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix. Preface What the Witches of New York City personally told me, Dostix, you will find written in this volume, without the slightest exaggeration or perversion. I set out now with no intention of misrepresenting anything that came under my observation in collecting the material for this book but with an honest desire to tell the simple truth about the people I encountered and the prophecies I paid for. So far from desiring to do any injustice to the fortune-tellers of the metropolis, I sincerely hope that my labors may avail something towards making their true deservings more widely appreciated, and their fitting reward more full and speedy. I am satisfied that so soon as their character is better understood, and certain peculiar features of their business more thoroughly comprehended by the public, they will meet with more attention from the dignitaries of the land than has ever before been vouchsafed them. I thank the public for the flattering consideration paid to what I have heretofore written, and respectfully submit that if they would increase the obligation, perhaps the readiest way is to buy and read the present volume. The author, September 20th, 1858. End of Preface Chapter 1 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 which is simply explanatory, so far as regards the book, but in which the author takes occasion to pay himself several merited compliments on the score of honesty, ability, etc. Chapter 1, which is merely explanatory. The first undertaking of the author of these pages will be to convince his readers that he has not set about making a merely funny book, and that the subject of which he writes is one that challenges their serious and earnest attention. Whatever of humorous description may be found in the succeeding chapters is that which grows legitimately out of certain features of the theme, for there has been no overstrained effort to make fun where none naturally existed. The witches of New York exert an influence too powerful and too widespread to be treated with such light regard as has been too long manifested by the community they have swindled for so many years, and it is to be desired that the day may come when they will be no longer classed with harmless mountebanks, but with dangerous criminals. People curious in advertisements have often read the astrological announcements of the newspaper, and have turned up their critical noses at the ungrammatical style thereof and indulged the while in a sort of innocent wonder as to whether these transparent nets ever catch any gulls. These matter-of-fact individuals have no doubt often queried in a vague, purposeless way if there really can be, in enlightened New York, any considerable number of persons who have faith in charms and love-powders, and who put their trust in the prophetic infallibility of a pack of greasy playing-cards. It may open the eyes of these innocent querists to the popularity of modern witchcraft to learn that the nineteen she-prophets who advertise in the daily journals of this city are visited every week by an average of sixteen hundred people, or at the rate of more than a dozen customers a day for each one, and of this immense number probably two-thirds place implicit confidence in the miserable stuff they hear and pay for. It is also true that although a part of these visitors are ignorant servants, unfortunate girls of the town, or uneducated overgrown boys, still there are among them not a few men engaged in respectable and influential professions, and many merchants of good credit and repute, who periodically consult these women, and are actually governed by their advice in business affairs of great moment. Carriages, attended by liveried servants, not unfrequently stop at the nearest respectable corner adjoining the abode of a notorious fortune-teller, while some richly dressed but closely veiled woman stealthily glides into the habitation of the witch. 
Many ladies of wealth and social position, led by curiosity or other motives, enter these places for the purpose of hearing their fortunes told. When these ladies are informed of the true character of the houses they have thus entered, and the real business of many of these women, whose fortune-telling is but a screen to intercept the public gaze from it, it is not likely that any one of them will ever compromise her reputation by another visit. People who do not know anything about the subject will perhaps be surprised to hear that most of these humbug sorceresses are now or have been, in more youthful and attractive days, women of the town, and that several of their present dens are vile assignation houses, and that a number of them are professed abortionists, who do as much perhaps in the way of child murder as others whose names have been more prominently before the world, and they will be astonished to learn that these chaste sibyls have an understood partnership with the keepers of houses of prostitution, and that the opportunities for a lucrative playing into each other's hands are constantly occurring. The most terrible truth connected with this whole subject is the fact that the greater number of these female fortune-tellers are but doing their allotted part in a scheme by which, in this city, the wholesale seduction of ignorant, simple-hearted girls in the lower walks of life has been thoroughly systematized. The fortune-teller is the only one of the organization whose operations may be known to the public. The other workers, the masculine go-betweens who lead the victims over the space intervening between her house and those of deeper shame, are kept out of sight and are unheard of. There is a straight path between these two points, which is traveled every year by hundreds of betrayed young girls who, but for the superstitious snares of the one, would never know the horrible realities of the other. The exact mode of proceeding adopted by these conspirators against virtue, the details of their plans, the various stratagems by which their victims are snared and led on to certain ruin, are not fit subjects for the present chapter. But in the individual who is disposed to prosecute the inquiry for himself, will find in the various police records much matter for his serious cogitation, and may there discover the exact direction in which to continue his investigations with the certainty of demonstrating these facts to his perfect satisfaction. A few months ago, at the suggestion of the editor of one of the leading daily newspapers of America, a series of articles was written about the fortune-tellers of New York City, and these articles were, in due time, published in that journal, and attracted no little attention from its readers. These chapters, with such alterations as were requisite, and with many additions, form the bulk of this present volume. The work has been conscientiously done. Every one of the fortune-tellers described herein was personally visited by the individual, and the predictions were carefully noted down at the time, word for word. The descriptions of the necromantic ladies and their surroundings are accurate, and can be corroborated by the hundreds who have gone over the same ground before and since. They were treated in the most fair and frank manner. The same data as to time and date of birth, age, nationality, etc., were given in all cases, and the same questions were put to all, so that the absurd differences in their statements and predictions result from the unmitigated humbug of their pretended art, and from no misinformation or misrepresentation on the part of the seeker after mystic knowledge. This latter person was perfectly unknown to the worthy ladies of the black art profession. He was to them simply an individual, one of the many-headed public, a cash customer, who paid liberally for all he required, and who, by reason of the dollars he dispersed, was entitled to the very best witchcraft in the market. And he got it. He undertook a few short journeys in search of the marvelous. He went on a couple dozen voyages of discovery, without going out of sight of home. He penetrated to the out-of-the-way regions, where the two and sixpenny witches of our own time grow. He got his fill of the cheap prophecy of the day, and procured of the oracles in person their oracularest sayings at the very highest market price. 
for the business-like seers of this age are easily moved to prophecy by the sight of current monies of the land, no matter who presents the same, whereas the oracles of the olden time dealt only with kings and princes, and nothing less than the affairs of an entire nation or a whole territory served to get their slow prophetic apparatus into working trim. To the necromancers of early days the anxieties of private individuals were as naught, and from the shekels of humble life they turned them contemptuously away. It is probably a thorough conviction of the necessity of eating and drinking, and a constant contemplation from a penitentiary point of view of the consequences of so doing, without paying therefor, that induces our modern witches to charge a specific sum for the exercise of their art, and to demand the inevitable dollar in advance. Whatever there is of sorcery, astrology, necromancy, prophecy, fortune-telling, and the black art generally, practiced at this time by the professional witches of New York, is here honestly set down. Should any other individual become particularly interested in the subject, and desire to go back of the present record, and make his exploration personally among the fortune-tellers, he will find their present addresses in the newspapers of the day and can easily verify what is herein written. With these remarks as to the intention of this book, the reader is referred by the cash customer to the succeeding chapters for further information, and the public will find in the advertisements, appended to the name and number of each mysteriously gifted lady, the pleasing assurance that she will be happy to see not only the cash customer of the present writing, but also any and all other customers, equally cash, who are willing to pay the customary cash tribute. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix is devoted to the glorification of Madame Prewster of number 373 Bowery, the pioneer witch of New York. The individual also herein bears his testimony that she is oily and waterproof. Chapter 2. Madame Prewster, Number 373, Bowery. This woman is one of the most dangerous of all those in the city who are engaged in the swindling trade of fortune-telling, and has been professionally known to the police and the public of New York for about fourteen years. The amount of evil she has accomplished in that time is incalculable, for she has been by no means idle, nor has she confined her attention even to what mischief she could work by the exercise of her pretended magic, but if the authenticity of the records may be relied on, she has borne a principal part in other illicit transactions of a much more criminal nature. She has been engaged in the witch business in this city for more years than has any other one whose name is now advertised to the public. If the history of her past life could be published, it would astound even this community, which is not wont to be startled out of its propriety by criminal development, for if justice were done, Madame Prewster would be at this time serving the state in the penitentiary for her past misdoings, but in some of these affairs of hers, men of so much respectability and political influence have been implicated that, having sure reliance on their counsel and assistance, the madame may be regarded as secure from punishment, even should any of her many victims choose to bring her into court. The quality of her witchcraft, by which she ostensibly lives, and the amount of faith to be reposed in her mystic predictions, may be seen from the history of a visit to her domicile, which is hereunto appended in the very words of the individual who made it. The cash customer makes his first voyage in a shower, but encounters an oily and waterproof witch at the end of his journey. It rained, and it meant to rain, and it set about it with a will. It was as if some Union Thunderstorm Company was just then paying its consolidated attention to the city and county of New York or as if some enterprising Yankee of hydraulic tendencies had contracted for a second deluge and was hurrying up the job to get his money, or as if the clouds were working by the job, or as if the earth was receiving its rations of rain for the year in a solid lump. 
or as if the world had made a half turn leaving in the clouds the oceans and rivers and those auxiliaries to navigation were scampering back to their beds as fast as possible or as if there had been a scrub race to the earth between a score or more full-grown rainstorms and they were all coming in together neck and neck at full speed despite the juiciness of these opening sentences the individual does not propose to accompany the account of his heroical setting forth on his first witch journey with any inventory of natural scenery and phenomena or with any interesting remarks on the wind and weather those who have a taste for that sort of thing will find in a modern circulating library elaborate accounts of enough dew-spangled grass to make hay for an army of nebuchadnezzars and a hundred troops of horse or of bright-eyed daisies and modest violets enough to fence all creation with a party-colored hedge of early larks and sweet-singing nightingales enough to make musical pot-pies and harmonious stews for twenty generations of heliogabaluses to say nothing of the amount of twaddle we find in american sensation books about hawthorn hedges and heather bells and similar transatlantic luxuries that don't grow in america and never did and then the sunrises were treated to and the sunsets were crammed with and the golden clouds the grand old woods the distant dim blue mountains the crystal lakes the limpid purling brooks the green carpeted meadows and the whole similar lot of affected bosh is enough to shake the faith of a practical man in nature as a natural institution and to make him vote her an artificial humbug so the voyager in pursuit of the marvellous declines to state how high the thermometer rose or fell in the sun or in the shade or whether the wind was east by north or south by west or a little south the dew on the grass was not shining for there was in his vicinity no dew and no grass nor anything resembling those rural luxuries nor was it by any means at early dawn on the contrary if there be such a commodity in a city as dawn either early or late that article had been all disposed of several hours in advance of the period at which this chapter begins but at midday he set forth alone to visit that prophetess of renown madame prewster he was fully prepared to encounter whatever of the diabolical machinery of the black art might be put in operation to appall his unaccustomed soul but as he set forth from the respectable domicile where he takes his nightly roost it rained as aforementioned the driving drops had nearly drowned the sunshine and through the sickly light that still survived everything looked dim and spectral unearthly cars drawn by ghostly horses glided swiftly through the mist the intangible apparitions which occupied the driver's usual stands hailing passengers with hollow voices and proffering with impish finger and goblin wink silent invitations to ride fantastic dogs sneaked out of sight round distant corners or skulked miserably under phantom carts for an imaginary shelter the rain enveloped everything with a gray veil making all look unsubstantial and unreal the human unfortunates who were out in the storm appeared cloudy and unsolid as if each man had sent his shadow out to do his work and kept his substance safe at home the individual travelled on foot disdaining the miserable compromise of an hour's stew in a steaming car or a prolonged shower bath in a leaky omnibus being of burly figure and determined spirit he walked knowing that his too solid flesh would not be likely to melt thaw and resolve itself into a dew and firmly believing that he was not born to be drowned he carried no umbrella preferring to stand up and fight it out with the storm face to face and because he detested a contemptible sneaking subterfuge of an umbrella pretending to keep him dry and all the time surreptitiously leaking small streams down the back of his neck and filling his pockets with indigo colored puddles and because also an umbrella would no more have protected a man against that storm than a gun cottoned overcoat would have availed against the storm of fire that scorched old sodom he placed his trust in a huge pair of waterproof boots and a felt hat that shed water like a duck 
he thrust his arms up to his elbows into the capacious pockets of his coat, drew his head down into the turned-up collar of that said garment, like a boy-bothered mud turtle, and marched on. With bowed head, set teeth, and sturdy step, the cash customer tramped along, astonishing the few pedestrians in the street by the energy and emphasis of his remarks in cases of collision, and attracting people to the windows to look at him as he splashed his way up the street. He minded them no more than he did the gentleman in the moon, but drove forward at his best speed, now breaking his shins over a dry goods box, then knocking his head against a lamp post, now getting a great punch in the stomach from an unexpected umbrella, then involuntarily gauging the depth of some unseen puddle, and then getting out of soundings altogether in a muddy inland sea, now swept almost off his feet by a sudden torrent of sufficient power to run a sawmill, and only recovering himself to find that he was wrecked on the curbstone of some side street that he didn't want to go to. At length, after a host of mishaps, including some interesting but unpleasant submarine explorations in an unusually large mud-hole into which he fell full length, he arrived, soaked and savage, at the house of Madame Prewster. This elderly and interesting lady has long been an oily pilgrim in this vale of tears. The oldest inhabitant cannot remember the exact period when this truly great prophetess became a fixture in Gotham, and began to earn her bread and butter by fortune-telling and kindred occupations. Her unctuous countenance and penguin form are known to hundreds on whose visiting lists her name does not conspicuously appear, and to whom, in the way of business, she has made revelations which would astonish the unsuspecting and unbelieving world. She is neither exclusive nor select in her visitors. Whoever is willing to pay the price, in good money, a point on which her regulations are stringent, may have the benefit of her skill, as may be seen by her advertisement. Card. Madame Prewster returns thanks to her friends and patrons, and begs to say that after the thousands, both in this city and Philadelphia, who have consulted her with entire satisfaction, she feels confident that in the questions of astrology, love, and law matters, and books or oracles, as relied on constantly by Napoleon, she has no equal. She will tell the name of the future husband, and also the name of her visitors. Number 373 Bowery, between 4th and 5th Streets. The undaunted seeker after mystic lore rang a peal on the astonished doorbell that created an instantaneous confusion of the startled inmates. There was a good deal of hustling about, and running hither, thither, and to the other place, before any one appeared. Meantime, the dainty fingers of the damp customer performed other little solos on the daubed and sticky bell pole, and he also amused himself with inspection of, and comments on, the German silver plate on the narrow panel, which bore the name of the illustrious female who occupied these domains. At last the door was opened by a greasy girl, and the visitor was admitted to the hall, where he stood for a minute like a fresh-water merman, all dripping from the recent flood. The juvenile female who had admitted him thus far evidently took him for a disreputable character, and stood prepared to prevent depredations. She planted herself firmly before him in the narrow hall, in an attitude of self-defense, and squaring off scientifically, demanded his business. Astrology was mentioned, whereupon the threatening fists were lowered, the saucy underjaw was retracted, and the general air of pugnacity was subdued into a very suspicious demeanor, as if she thought he hadn't any money, and wanted to storm the castle under false pretenses. She informed him that before matters went any further he must buy tickets, which she was prepared to furnish, on receipt of a dollar and a half. He paid the money, which transaction seemed to raise him in her estimation to the level of a man who might safely be trusted, where there was nothing he could steal. One fist she still kept loaded, ready to instantly repel any attack which might be suddenly made by her designing enemy the other hand cautiously departed petticoatward, 
and after groping about some time in a concealed pocket, produced from the mysterious depth a card, too dirty for description, on which these words were dimly visible. Madame Prewster, 411 Grand Street, Number 1, 50 cents. The belligerent girl then led the way through a narrow hall, up two flights of stairs into a cold room, where she desired her visitor to be seated, and then carefully locked one of two doors leading into adjoining rooms, put the keys in her pocket, and departed. Before her exit she made a sly demonstration with her fists and feet, as if she was disposed to break the truce, commence hostilities, and punch his unprotected head, without regard to the laws of honorable warfare. She departed, however, at last, without violence, though the voyager could hear her pause on each landing, probably debating whether it wasn't best, after all, to go back and thrash him before the opportunity was lost forever. This grand reception room was an apartment about six feet by eight. It was uncarpeted, and was luxuriously furnished with six wooden chairs, one stove, with no spark of fire, one feeble table, one spittoon, and two coal scuttles. The view from the window was picturesque to a degree, being made up of cats, clotheslines, chimneys, and crockery, and occasionally, when the storm lifted, a low roof nearby suggested stables. The odor which filled the air had at least the merit of being powerful, and those to whose noses it was grateful could not complain that they did not get enough of it. Description must necessarily fall far short of the reality, but if the reader will endeavor to imagine a couple of oil mills, a peck slip ferry boat, a soap and candle manufactory, and three or four bone boiling establishments being simmered together over a slow fire in his immediate vicinity, he may possibly arrive at a faint and distant notion of the greasy fragrance in which the abode of Madame Prewster is immersed. For an hour and a half by the watch of the cash customer, which being a cheap article, and being alike insensible to the voice of reason and the persuasions of the watchmaker, would take its own time to do its work, and the long hands of which generally succeeded in getting once around the dial in about eighty minutes, was this too damp individual incarcerated in the room by the order of the implacable Madame Prewster. He would long before the end of that time have forfeited his dollar and a half, and beaten an inglorious retreat, but that he feared an ambuscade and a pitching into at the fair hands of the warlike servant. Finally, this last-named individual came to the rescue, and conducted him by a circuitous route, and with half-suppressed demonstrations of animosity, to the basement. This room was evidently the kitchen, and was fitted up with a customary iron and brazen apparatus. A feeble child, just old enough to run alone, had constructed a child's paradise in the lee of the cooking stove, and was seated on a dinner pot, with one foot in a saucepan. It had been playing on the wash boiler like a drum, but was now engaged in decorating some loaves of unbaked bread with bits of charcoal and splinters from the broom. The fighting servant retreated to the far end of the apartment, where she began to wash dishes with vindictive earnestness, stopping at short intervals to wave her dishcloth savagely as a challenge to instant single combat. There was nothing visible that savored of astrology or magic, unless some tin candlesticks with battered rims could be cabalistically construed. Madame Prewster, the renowned, sat majestically in a Windsor rocking chair, extra size, with a large pillow, comfortably tucked in behind her illustrious and rheumatic back. Her prophetic feet rested on a wooden stool. Her oracular neck was bound with a bright-colored shawl. Her necromantic locomotive apparatus was encased in a great number of predictive petticoats, and her whole aspect was portentous. She is a woman who may be of any age, from forty-five to one hundred twenty, for her face is so oily that wrinkles won't stay in it. They slip out and leave no trace. She is an unctuous woman, with plenty of material in her. Enough, in fact, for two or three. She is adipose to a degree that makes her circumference problematical, and her weight a mere matter of conjecture. 
Moreover, one instantly feels that she is thoroughly waterproof, and is certain that if she could be induced to shed tears, she would weep lard oil. Grim, grizzled, and stony-eyed is this juicy old Sibyl, and she glared fearfully on the hero with her fishy optics, until he wished he hadn't done anything. She was evidently just out of bed, although it was long past noon, and when she yawned, which she did seven times a minute on a low average, the effect was gloomy and cavernous, and the timid delegate in search of the mysterious trembled in his boots. At last, he, with uncovered head and timid demeanor, presented his card, entitling him to twelve shillings' worth of witchcraft, and made an humble request to have it honored. He had previously, while pretending to warm himself at the stove, been occupied in making horrible grimaces at the baby, and then sketching it in his hat as it disfigured its own face by frantic screams, and he also took a quiet revenge on the pugnacious servant by making a picture of her in a fighting attitude, with one eye bunged and her jaw knocked round to her left ear. When the ponderous witch had got all ready for business, and had taken a very long greasy stare at her customer, as if she was making up her mind what sort of a customer on the whole he might be, she determined to begin her mighty magic. So she took up the cards, which were almost as greasy as she herself, and prepared for business, previously giving one most tremendous yawn, which opened her sacred jaws so wide that only a very narrow isthmus of hair behind her ears connected the top of her respected head with the back of her venerated neck. She then presented the cards for her customer to cut, and when she had accomplished that feat, which he did in some perturbation, she ran them carelessly over between her fingers and began to speak very slowly and without much thought of what she was about, as if it was a lesson she had learned by heart. Each word slipped smoothly out from her fat lips, as if it had been anointed with some patent lubricator, and her speech was as follows. You have seen much trouble, some of it in business, and some of it in love. But there are brighter days in store for you before long. You face up a letter. You face up love. You face up marriage. You face up a light-haired woman with dark eyes. You think a great deal of her, and she thinks a great deal of you. But then she faces up a dark-complexioned man, which is bad for you. You must take care and look out for him for he is trying to injure you. She likes you the best, but you must look out for the man. You face up better luck in business. You face a change in your business, but be careful, or it will not bring you much money. You do not face up a great deal of money. Here followed a huge yawn, which again nearly left the top of her head an island. Then she resumed, If you will tell me the number of letters in the lady's name, I will tell you what her name is. This demand was unexpected, for her cool and collected customer replied at random, Four. The she Falstaff then referred to a book wherein was written a long list of names, of varying lengths from one syllable to six, and selecting the names with four letters, began to ask, Is it Emma? No. Anna? No. Ella? No. Jane? No. Etta? No. Lucy? No. Cora? No. At last, finding that she would run through all the four-letter names in the language, and that he must eventually say something, he agreed to let his true love's name be Mary. Then she continued her remarks. You face up Mary. You love Mary. Mary is a good girl. You will marry Mary at last. But Mary is not now here. Mary is far away, but do not fear, you shall have Mary. Then she proposed to tell the name of our reporter in the same mysterious manner, and on being told that it contains eight letters, the first of which is M, she turned to her register and began to read. It so happens that the proper names answering to the description are very few, and the right one did not happen to be on her list. So in a short time the greasy prophetess became confused, and slipped off the track entirely, 
and after asking about two hundred names of various dimensions, from Mark to Melchizedek, she gave it up in despair, and glared on her twelve-shilling patron as if she thought he was trifling with her, and she would like to eat him up alive for his presumption. Then she suddenly changed her mode of operation, and made the fearful remark, Now you may wish three wishes, and I will tell whether you will get them or not. She then laid out the cards into three piles, and her visitor stated his wishes aloud, and received the gratifying information in three installments, that he would live to be rich, to marry the light-haired maiden, and to effectually smash the dark-complexioned man. Then she said, You may now wish one wish in secret, and I will tell you whether you will get it. Our avaricious hero instantly wished for an enormous amount of ready money, which she kindly promised, but which he has not yet seen the color of. He asked about his prospective wives and children, with unsatisfactory results. One wife and four children was, she said, the outside limit. At this juncture she began to wriggle uneasily in her chair, and her considerate patron respected her rheumatics and took his leave. This conference, although the results may be read by a glib-tongued person in five minutes, occupied more than three-quarters of an hour, Madame Prewster's diction being slow and ponderous in proportion to her size. He now prepared to depart, and with a parting contortion of his countenance, of terrible malignity, at the unfortunate baby, which caused that weird brat to fling itself flat on its back and scream in agony of fear, he informed the madame, with mock deference, that he would not wait any longer. He was then attended to the door by the bellicose maiden, who seemed to have fathomed his deep dealings with the infuriate infant, and to be desirous of giving him bloody battle in the hall. But, as he had remarked that she had a rolling-pin hidden under her apron, and as he was somewhat awed by the sanguinary look of her dishcloth, he choked down his bloodthirstiness, and ingloriously retreated. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Wherein are related diverse strange things of Madame Bruce, the mysterious veiled lady, of number 513 Broom Street. Chapter 3 Madame Bruce, the Mysterious Veiled Lady, Number 513, Broom Street. The woman who assumes the title of the Mysterious Veiled Lady is much younger in the black art trade than Madame Prewster, and has only been publicly known as a fortune teller for about six years. The Mysterious Veil is assumed partly for the very mystery's sake and partly to hide a countenance which some of her visitors might desire to identify on after occasions. She confines herself more exclusively to telling fortunes than do many of the others, and has never yet made her appearance in a police court to answer to an accusation of a grave crime. She has many customers, and might have a respectable amount at the bank if she were disposed to commit her monies to the care of those careful institutions. It may be mentioned here, however, as a curious fact, that although all the witches profess to be able to tell lucky numbers, and will at any time give a paying customer the exact figures which they are willing to prophesy will draw the capital prize in any given lottery, their skill invariably fails them when they undertake to do anything in the Wheel of Fortune way on their own individual behalf. No one of the professional fortune-tellers was ever known to draw a rich prize in a lottery, or to make a particularly lucky hit on a policy number, notwithstanding the fact that most of them make large investments in those uncertain financial speculations. Madame Bruce is no exception to this general rule, and the propinquity of the lottery agency and the policy shop, just round the corner, must be accepted in explanation of the fact that this gifted lady has no balance in her favor at the banker's. The quality of her magic and other interesting facts about her are best set forth in the words of the anxious seeker after hidden lore who paid her a visit one pleasant afternoon in August. 
the individual visits madame bruce and has a conference with that mysterious veiled personage a man of strong nerves can recover from the effects of a professional interview with the ponderous prewster in about a week delicately organized persons particularly susceptible to supernatural influences might be so overpowered by the manifestations of her cabalistic lore as to affect their appetites for a whole lunar month and have bad dreams till the moon changed but the daring traveller of this voracious history was convalescent in ten days it is true that even after that time he in his dreams would imagine himself engaged in protracted single combats with the heroine of the rolling pin and once or twice awoke in an agony of fear under the impression that he had been worsted in the fight and that the conquering fair was one about to cook him in a steamer or stew him into charity soup and season him strong with red pepper or broil him in a gridiron and serve him up on toast to madame prewster like a huge woodcock in one gastronomic nightmare of a dream he even fancied that the triumphant maiden had tied him hand and foot with links of sausage then tapped his head with an auger screwed a brass faucet into his helpless skull and was preparing to draw off his brains in small quantities to suit cannibalic retail customers but he eventually recovered his equanimity his nocturnal visions of the warlike servant became less terrible and he gradually ceased to think of her except with a dim sort of half-way remembrance as of some fearful danger from which many years before he had miraculously preserved when he had reached this state of mind he was ready to proceed with his inquiries into the mysteries of the cheap and nasty necromancy of the day and to encounter the rest of the fifty-cent sibyls with an unperturbed spirit accordingly he girded up his loins and prepared the necessary amount of one-dollar bills for with the most politic and necessary carefulness he always made his own change note of caution to the future observer of these modern witches never let one of them break a large bank bill for you and give you small notes in exchange lest the small bills be much more badly broken than the large one not that the witch's money like the fairy's gold will be likely to turn into chips and pebbles in your pocket but all these fortune tellers are expert passers of counterfeit and broken banknotes and bogus coin and they never lose an opportunity thus to victimize a customer fortified with dinner dessert and cigars the cash customer departed on his voyage of discovery in search of madame bruce the mysterious veiled lady who carries on all the business she can by the subjoined advertisement astonishing to all madame bruce the mysterious veiled lady can be consulted on all events of life at number five one three broom street one door from thompson she is a second sightseer and was born with a natural gift the individual modestly speaking of himself in the third person admits that being then a single man of some respectability he was at that very period looking out for a profitable partner of his bosom sorrows joys and expenses he naturally preferred one who could do something towards taking a share of the expensive responsibility of a family off his hands and was not disposed to object to one who was even afflicted with money next to that woman whom he had not yet discovered a lady with a natural gift for money-making was evidently the most eligible of matrimonial speculations whether he really cherished an humble hope that the veil of madame bruce might be of semi-transparent stuff and that she might discover and be smitten by his manly charms and ask his hand in marriage and eventually bear him away a blushing husband to the altar or whatever might be hastily substituted for that connubial convenience will never be officially known to the world certain it is that he expected great results of some sort to eventuate from his visit to this obnubilated prophetess and that he paid extraordinary attention to the decoration of the external homo and to the administration of encouraging stimuli to the inner individual probably with a view to submerge for the time his characteristic bashfulness before he set out to visit the fair inscrutable of broom street 
The nature of his secret cogitations, as he walked along, was somewhat as follows, though he himself has never before revealed the same to mortal man. He was, of course, uncertain as to her personal attractiveness. Owing to that mysterious veil there was a doubt as to her surpassing beauty. At any rate, he did not regret the time spent on his toilet. Madame Bruce might be a lady of the most transcendent loveliness, or she might possess a countenance after the style of Mokana, the veiled prophet. In either case, a clean shirt collar and a little extra polish on the boots would be a touching tribute of respect. He thought over the stories of the Oriental ladies so charmingly and complexly described in the Arabian Nights' entertainments, and, in some strange way, he connected Madame Bruce with Eastern associations. He remembered that in Asiatic countries the arts of enchantment are the staple of fashionable female education, that the women imbibe the elements of magic from their wet nurses, and that their power of charming is gradually and securely developed by years and competent instructors, until they are able to go forth into the world, and raise the devil on their own hook. In this case the veil was of the east, eastern, and what was more probable than that the mysterious veiled lady was that fascinating oriental young woman whose attainments in magic made her the dire terror of her enemies, most of whom she changed into pigs and oxen and monkeys and other useful domestic animals, who had transformed her unruly grandfather into a cat of the species called Tom, had metamorphosed her vicious aunt into a screech owl, and had turned an ungentlemanly second cousin into a one-eyed donkey. What a treasure, thought the individual, would such an accomplished wife be in Republican America! How exceedingly useful in the case of her husband's rivals for custom-house honors, and how invaluable when creditors became clamorous! What a perfect treasure would a wife be who could turn a clamorous butcher into spring lamb, and his brown apron and leather breeches into the indispensable peas and mint sauce to eat him with! Who could make the rascally baker instantly become a green parrot with only power to say, Pretty Polly wants a cracker! Who would transform the dunning tailor into a greater goose than any in his own shop? who could go to Stewart's, buy a couple of thousands of dollars' worth of goods, and then turn the clerks into cockroaches, and scrunch them with her little gaiter if they interfered with her walking off with the plunder? Or who, in the event of a scarcity of money, could invite a select party of fifty or sixty friends to a nice little dinner, and then change the whole lot into lions, tigers, giraffes, elephants, and ostriches, and sell the entire batch to Van Amberg and Company, at a high premium, as a freshly imported menagerie, all very fat and valuable. Then he came down from his rather elevated flight of fancy, and filled away another tack. Before he reached the house, he had fully made up his mind that Madame Bruce, the mysterious veiled lady, must be a stray oriental princess, in reduced circumstances, cruelly thrust from the paternal mansion by the infuriated proprietor, her father, and compelled to seek her fortune in a strange land. He had never seen a princess, and he resolved to treat this one with all respect and loyal veneration. To do this, if possible, without compromising his conscience as a republican and a voter in the tenth ward, but to do it at all hazards. The immense fortune which would undoubtedly be hers in the event of the relenting of her brutal though opulent father, suggested the feasibility of a future elopement, and a legal marriage according to the forms of any country that she preferred. He couldn't bethink him of a Persian justice of the peace, but he did not despair of being able to manage it to her entire and perfect satisfaction. Her undoubted great misfortunes had touched his tender heart. He would see the suffering princess, he would tender his sympathy, and offer his hand, and the fortune he hoped she would be able to make for him. If this was haughtily declined, there would still remain the poor privilege of buying a dose of magic, paying the price in current money, and letting her make her own change. 
Having matured this disinterested resolve, he proceeded calmly on his journey, wondering as he walked along whether, in the event of a gracious reception by his princess, it would be more courtly and correct to kneel on both knees, or to make an oriental cushion of his overcoat, and sit down, cross-legged on the floor. This knotty point was not settled to his entire satisfaction, when he reached that lovely portion of fairyland near the angle of Broom and Thompson Streets. The princess had taken up her temporary residence in the tenant-house number 513 Broom, which elegant mansion affords a refuge to about seventeen other families, most Hibernian, without very high pretensions to aristocracy. His ring at the door of the noble mansion was answered by a grisly woman speaking French very badly broken, in fact irreparably fractured. This grisly gall led him into the house, heard his request to see Madame Bruce, and then she called to a shock-headed boy who was looking over the banisters to come and take the visitor in charge. Two minutes' observation convinced the distinguished caller that the servants of the princess were not particular in the matter of dirt. The walls were stained, discolored, and debauded, and the floor had a sufficient thickness of soil for a vegetable garden. At one end of the hall, indeed, an Irish woman was on her knees, making experimental excavations, possibly with a view to planting early lettuce and peppergrass. A glance at the shock-headed boy showed a peculiarity in his visual organs. His eyes, which were black naturally, had evidently suffered in some kind of fisticuff demonstration, and one of them still showed the marks. It was twice black, naturally and artificially, it had a dual nigritude, and might, perhaps, be called a double-barreled black eye. This pleasant young man conducted his visitor to the top of the first flight of stairs, where he said, Please stop here a minute, and disappeared into the princess's room, leaving her devoted slave alone in the hall with two aged wash-tubs and a battered broom. There ensued an immediate flurry in the rooms of the princess, and the customer thought of the forty black slaves with jars of jewels on their heads, who, in oriental countries, are in the habit of receiving princesses' visitors with all the honors. He hardly thought to see the forty black slaves, with the jars of gems, but rather expected the shock-headed youth to presently reappear, with a mug of rubies, or a kettle of sapphires and emeralds, and invite him in courtly language to help himself to a few, or that that active young man would presently come out with an amethyst snuff-box full of diamond dust, and ask him to take a pinch and then present him with the expensive article as a slight token of respect from the princess. Not so, not so, my child. The great shuffling and pitching about of things continued, as if the furniture had been indulging in an extemporaneous jig, and couldn't stop on so short a notice, or else objected to any interruptions of the festivities. Finally the rattling of chairs and tables subsided into a calm, and the boy reappeared, he came, however, without the tea-kettle full of valuables, and minus even the snuff-box. He merely remarked, with an insinuating wink of the lightest colored eye, Please to walk this way. It did please his auditor to walk in the designated direction, and he entered the room, when the eye spoke again to a very low accompaniment of his voice, as if he was afraid he might damage that organ by playing on it too loudly. The anxious visitor looked for the princess, but not seeing her or the slaves with the pots of jewels, and observing also that the chairs were not too luxuriously gorgeous for people to sit on, he sat down. A single glance convinced him that the princess could have had no opportunity to carry off her jewels from her eastern home, or that she must have spent the proceeds before she furnished her present domicile. An iron bedstead, a small cooking stove, four chairs, and a table, on which the breakfast crockery stood unwashed, was the amount of the furniture. A dirty, slatternly young woman of about twenty-three years, with filthy hands and uncombed hair, and whose clothes looked as if they had been tossed on with a pitchfork, seated herself in one of the chairs and commenced conversation, not in Persian, 
It was one o'clock p.m., but she attempted an apology for the unmade bed, the unswept room, the unwashed breakfast dishes, and the untidy appearance of everything. Before she had concluded her fruitless explanation, the boy with a variegated eye suddenly came from a closet, which the customer had not noticed and was unprepared for, and said, in winning tones, Please to walk in this room, which was done with some fear and no little trembling, whereupon the optical youth incontinently vanished. At last, then, the imaginative visitor stood in the presence of royalty, and beheld the wronged princess of his heart. He was about to drop on his bended knees to pay his premeditated homage, but a hurried glance at the floor showed that such a course of proceeding would result in the ineffaceable soiling of his best pantaloons, so he stood sturdily erect. Before he suffered his eyes to rest upon the peerless beauty who, he was convinced, stood before him, he took a survey of the regal apartment. An unpainted pine table stood in the corner, a gaudily colored shade was at the window, and an iron single bedstead upon which the clothes had been hastily spread up, and two chairs on one of which sat the enchantress, completed the list. The princess was attired in deep black and a thick black veil, reaching from her head to her waist, entirely concealed her features from the beholders who still devoutly believed in her royal birth and cruel misfortunes. Nor was this belief dissipated until she spoke. But when she called Pete to the double-barreled youth with the eye, and gave him a blowing up in the most emphatic kind of English for not bringing her pocket-handkerchief, then the beautiful princess of his imagination vanished into the thinnest kind of air, and there remained only the unromantic reality of a very vulgar woman in a very dirty dress, and who had a very bad cold in her head. There was still a hope that she might be pretty, and her would-be admirer fervently trusted that she might be compelled to lift her veil to blow her nose, but she didn't do it. Then he offered her his hand, not a marriage, but for her to read his fortune in, and stood, no longer trembling with expectation, but with stony indifference, for as he approached her, a strong odor of onion-laden breath from beneath the veil gave the death-blow to the fair creature of his imagination, and convinced him that he had got the wrong princess by the fist. She looked at him closely for a couple of minutes, and then spoke these words, the peculiar pronunciation being probably induced by the cold in her head. You are bad, who has saw a great many changes, and it seems here as if you was going to be bore settled in the future. It seems here like as if you had subtypes in your life be very much cast down. But it seems here like as if you had always got up again. It seems here like as if you had saw in your last life sub lady which you liked very much and had been disappointed. It seems here like as if there was two barrages for you, one in a very short time. One lady seems here to stand very dear to you and you two may be buried, or you may dot. If you are dot already buried, you will be very sued. It seems here as if you would have a very large family. Five children will be all that you will have. You will have a good deal of buddy, money, in your life. Some of your relatives that you have never saw will soon die and leave you some property. But you will not be expecting it, it seems here as if you would have trouble in getting it, for there was someone else tried to get it away from you. It seems as if the lady you will bury will not be too dark complexed, nor yet too light, not too tall, nor yet very short, not too large, nor too thin. She thinks a great deal of you, more than you do of her. You have already saw her in the course of your life, and she loves you very much. There are people about you in your business who are not so much your friends as they pretend to be. You are going to bake some change in your business. It will be a good thing for you, and will come out much better than you expect. Here she stopped and intimated that she would answer any questions that her customer desired to ask, 
and in reply to his interrogatories, the following important information was elicited. You will be log lived, and you will have two wives, and will live many years with your first wife. The individual proclaimed himself satisfied, and paid his money, whereupon Madame Bruce instantly yelled, Pete, when the eye-boy reappeared to show the door, and the cash customer departed, leaving the mysterious veiled lady shivering on her stool, and exceedingly desirous of an opportunity to use her pocket-handkerchief. And this is all there was of the Persian princess. As the seeker after wisdom went away, he made one single audible remark, by way of consoling himself for his crushed hopes and blighted anonymous love. It was to this effect. I believe she squints, and I know she's got bad teeth. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostics relates the marvelous performances of Madame Widger, of No. 3 First Avenue, and how she looks into the future through a paving stone. Chapter 4. Madame Widger, No. 3 First Avenue. Madame Widger came from Albany to this city about four years ago, and at once set up as an astrologer. She has been a witch for a great many years, and has directly and indirectly done about as much mischief as it is possible for one person to accomplish in the same length of time. She was a woman of great repute in and about Albany as a fortune-teller, and was supposed to be conversant with practices more criminal. She at last became so well known as a bad woman that she found it advisable to leave Albany after she had settled certain lawsuits in which she had become entangled. Among other speculations of hers in that place, she once sued the city to recover indemnifying monies for certain imaginary damages alleged to have been done to her property by the unbidden entrance of the river into her private apartments during one of the periodical inundations with which Albany is favored. By the shrewd management of certain of her lawyer friends, with whom she had business dealings, she at last got a judgment against the city, but owing to some other awkward law complications, it became expedient to change her place of residence before she had collected her money, and the amount remains unpaid to this day. She then came to this city, and set up in the sorceress way, and, by dint of advertising, she soon got a good many customers. She now has as much to do as she can easily manage to get along with, is making a good deal of money by astrology, and by other more unscrupulous means, and she is probably worth some considerable property. She is a bold, brazen, ignorant, unscrupulous, dangerous woman. She has some peculiar ways of her own in telling the fortunes of her visitors, and is the only person in the city who professes to read the future through a magic stone or second sight pebble. Her manner of using this wonderful geological specimen is fully described hereafter. The individual visits a grim witch who reads his future through a moderate sized paving stone. Disappointed in his fond hope of discovering, in the person of Madame Bruce, an eligible partner, who should bridle him and lead him coyly to the altar, that born from which no bachelor returns, the cash customer was for many days downcast in his demeanor and neglectful of his person. When he eventually recovered from his strong attack of Madame Bruce, he was not by any means cured of his romantic desire to procure a witch wife. He had carefully figured up the conveniences of such an article, and the sum total was an irresistible argument. If he could win a witch of the right sort, perhaps she could teach him the secret of the philosopher's stone, and the elixir of life, and show him the locality of the fountain of youth, so that he could take the wrinkles out of himself and his friends, at the cost of only a short journey by railroad. A barrel or so of that wonderful water, peddled out by the bottle, would meet a readier sale and pay a larger profit than any Paphian lotion that was ever advertised on the rocks of Jersey. All this, to say nothing of a family of young wizards and sorcerers, 
who could, by virtue of the maternal magic, swallow swords from the day of their birth, do mighty feats of legerdemain, such as cutting off the heads of innumerable pigs and chickens, and producing the decapitated animals alive again from the coat-tails of the bystanders, to the astonishment of the crowd, and the great emolument of their proud dad. Even if these profitable babies should not be natural necromancers, with the power of second sight, and any quantity of natural gifts, they must surely be spirit wrappers of the most lucrative sphere, capable of organizing circles, and instructing mediums, and otherwise bringing into the family fund large piles of that circulating medium so much to be desired. Or even failing this popular gift, they must all be born with some strong instincts of money-making vagabondism. If the girls failed in fortune-telling, they would certainly have a genius for the tightrope, or a decided talent for the female circus and negro minstrel business, and the boys would be brought into the world with the power of throwing a miraculous number of consecutive flip-flaps, of putting cocked hats on their juvenile heads while turning somersets over long rows of Arab steeds of the desert, of poising their infant bodies on pyramids of bottles and drinking glasses of molasses and water, under the contemptible subterfuge of wine, to the health of the terror-stricken beholders, or of climbing to the tops of very tall poles without soiling their spangled dresses, and their displaying their anatomy for the admiration of the gazing multitude, in diverse attitudes, for the most part extraordinarily wrong side up, with very particular care. Or, at least, they would be born with the astounding gift of tying their young legs in double bow-knots across the backs of their adolescent necks, and while in that graceful position kissing their little fingers to the bewildered audience. Under the constant influence of such comfortable and ennobling thoughts, it is not in the elastic nature of the human mind to remain long dejected. In the contemplation of the future glories of his might-be wife and possible family, the individual recovered somewhat of his former gaiety. Remembering that care killed a cat, he resolved that he would not be chronicled as a second victim. So he kicked care out of doors, so to speak, and warned despair and discouragement off the premises. He attired him in his best, and appeared once more before the world in the joyful garb of a man with hope in his heart and money in his pantaloons. In fact, so radiant did he appear, that he might have been set down, for a person who had just had a new mane of joy laid on in his heart, and had turned the cocks of all the pipes, and let on the full head just to see how the new apparatus worked. Or, as if he'd been in a shower-bath of good nature, and come out dripping. He also took kindly to that innocuous beverage, lager beer, which was a good sign in itself, inasmuch as he had, for a few days, been drinking as many varieties of strong drinks, as if he'd been brought up on Professor Anderson's inexhaustible bottle, and had never overcome the influences of his infant education. Seeking out a friend to whom he confided his hopes of a lucrative wife and a profitable progeny, the cash customer suggested that they proceed immediately in search of the fair enchantress who was to be his comfort and consolation for the rest of his respectable life. Being somewhat disgusted with the result of his visit to the witch with a romantic designation of the mysterious veiled lady, he had determined to seek out one on this occasion with the most commonplace and everyday cognomen in the whole list. There being a Madame Widger in that delightful catalogue, of course Widger was the one selected. It is true she sometimes advertised herself as the mysterious Spanish lady, but in the judgment of the individual, the Widger was too much for the Spanish and the mystery. So Madame Widger was resolved on, her modest advertisement is given, that the impartial reader may be brought to acknowledge that the inducements to wed the Widger were not of the common order. Madame Widger, the natural gifted astrologist, second sight seer, and doctress, tells past, present, and future events. Love, courtship, marriage, absent friends, sickness, 
prescribes medicines for all diseases, property lost or stolen, at number 3 First Avenue, near Houston Street. The slight lack of perspicuity in this announcement seems to be a mysterious peculiarity common to all the fortune tellers, as if they were all imbued with the same commendable contempt for all the rules of English grammar. The voyager being attired in a captivating costume, and being also provided with pencils and paper to make a life sketch, with a view to an expansive portrait of his enslaver, whose beauty was with him a foregone conclusion, set out with his faithful friend for the delightful locality mentioned in the advertisement, where the charming Circe, Widger, held her magic court. He was not aware at that time that his intended bride was not a blushing blooming maiden, but an ancient dame, whose very wrinkles date back into the eighteenth century, but of that hereafter. He was determined to have her tell his love, courtship, or marriage, absent friends, or sickness, and to insist that she should prescribe medicines for property lost or stolen, according to the exact wording of the advertisement. The dowdy individual trembled somewhat, with an undefined sensation of awe, as though some fearful ordeal was before him. To use his own elegant and forcible language, he felt as though he was going to encounter an earthquake with volcano trimmings. "'It is the fluttering of newborn love in your manly bosom,' remarked his companion. "'Well,' was the reply, "'if a baby love kicks so very like a horse of vicious propensities, a full-grown Cupid would be so unimaginable as to defy the very rarity and all his works. Without any noteworthy adventure they kept on their way to the First Avenue, and in due time stood, awestruck, before the mansion of the Enchantress. After the first impression had worn off, the scene was somewhat stripped of its mysteriousness, and assume an aspect commonplace, not to say seedy. As soon as the sense of bewilderment with which they at first gazed upon the domicile of the mysterious damsel so favored of the fates, had passed away, they found themselves in a condition to make the observations of the place and its surroundings that are detailed below. The house, a three-story brick, seemed to have that architectural disease which is a perpetual epidemic among the tenant houses of the city and which makes them look as if they had all been dipped in a strong solution of something that had taken the skin off. The paint was blistered and peeling off in flakes. The blinds were hanging cornerwise by solitary hinges. The shingles were starting from their places with a strange air of disquietude, as if some mighty hand had stroked them the wrong way. The doorsteps were shaky and crazy in the knees. The door itself had a curious air of debility and emaciation, and the bell-knob was too weak to return to its place after it had feebly done its brazen duty. There was no door-plate, but on a battered tin sign was blazoned, in fat letters, the mystic word, Widger. The cash customer rang the bell, not once merely, or twice, but continuously, in pursuance of a dogma which he had laid down as follows. It is a mistake to ever stop ringing till somebody comes. The feebler you ring, the more the servants think you're a dun, and therefore the more they don't come to let you in. But if you keep it up regularly, they'll think you're a rich relation, and will rush to the rescue. So he kept on, and the voice of the bell sharply clattered through the dismal old house, making as much noise as if it suddenly wakened a thousand echoes that had been locked up there for many years without the power to speak till now. If a timid ring denotes a dun, and a boisterous one a rich relation, then must the inhabitants of that cleanly suburb have been convinced that the present performer on the bell not only had no claims as a creditor on the people of the house, but was a rich California uncle, come to give each adult member of that happy family a gold mine or so, and to distribute a cartload of diamonds among the children. The door at last was opened by an uncertain old man with very weak eyes, who appeared to have, in a milder form, the same malady which afflicted the house, 
Perhaps he was a twin, and suffered from brotherly sympathy. At any rate, the dilapidating disease had touched him sorely. Its ravages were particularly noticeable in the toes of his boots and the elbows of his coat. Violent remedies had evidently been applied in the latter case, but the patches were of different colors, and suggestive of the rag-bag. The boots were past hope of convalescence. His shirt-collar was sunk under a greasy billow of a neckcloth, and only one slender string was visible to show where it had gone down. The nether garment was a ragged wreck that set a hundred tattered sails to every breeze, but was anchored fast at the shoulder with a single disreputable suspender. Guided by this equivocal individual, the two visitors entered a small shabbily furnished room, and bestowed themselves in a couple of treacherous chairs, in pursuance of an imbecile invitation from the battered old gentleman. The anticipations of the enthusiastic lover again began to fall, and in five minutes his heart, which so lately was burning with high hope, was so cold as to be uncomfortable. On a seven-by-nine cooking-stove, which three pints of coal would have driven blazing crazy, stood a diminutive iron kettle, in which something was noisily stewing. The something may have been a decoction of magic herbs, or it may have been Madame Widger's dinner. A tumble-down trunk in a corner of the room did precarious duty for a chair. A faded carpet hid the floor. A cheap rocking-chair, in the act of molting its upholstery, spread its luxurious arms invitingly near the dim window and a table, on which a pack of German playing-cards was coyly half-concealed by a newspaper, a coal-hod, and a poker, completed the necessary furnishings of the apartment. The ornaments are soon inventoried, a certificate of membership of the New York State Agricultural Society, given in Albany to Mr. M. G. Bivens, hung in a cheap frame over the table. The other decorations were a few prints of high-colored saints, an engraving of a purple Virgin Mary with a pea-green child, and a picture of a blue Joseph being sold by yellow brethren to a crowd of scarlet merchants, who were paying for him with money that looked like peppermint lozenges. Madame Widger, the mysterious Spanish lady, was not at first visible to the naked eye, but a loud, shrill, vicious voice which made itself heard through the partition, dividing the reception-room from some apartment as yet unexplored by them, directed the attention of her visitors to her exact locality. She was engaged with another gentleman, said the knight of the ragged inexpressibles. Had not what he had already seen of the mansion decidedly cooled the passion of the love-lorn customer, this intelligence would have been likely to rouse his ire against the interloping swain, and make him pant for vengeance and fistic damages to the other party. But in his present confused state of mind, he received this blow with philosophic indifference. The old man subsided into a chair, and in a weak sort of way began to talk, evidently with some insane idea of pleasingly filling up the time, until the prophetess should be disengaged. His conversation seemed to run to disasters, with a particular partiality to shipwrecks. He accordingly detailed, with wonderful exactness, the perils encountered by a certain canal-boat of his, loaded principally with butter and cheese, during a dangerous voyage from Albany to New York, and which was finally brought safely to a secure harbor by the power of the widger, which circumstance had made him her slave for life. The shrill voice then ceased, and the person to whom it had been addressed came forth. The lime on his blue jean garments, and the cloudy appearance of his boots, declared him to be something in the mason line. He deported himself with becoming reverence, and departed in apparent awe. He did not look like a dangerous rival, and he was not molested. A discreditable and disordered head now thrust itself out of the mysterious closet, opened its mouth, and the vicious voice said, I will see you now, sir. The sighing swain, with a fluttering heart and unsteady steps, 
summoned his courage and entered the place, to him as mysterious as was Bluebeard's golden-keyed closet to his ninth wife. The first glance at Madame Widger at once scattered again all his dreams of love and of happiness with that potent and fearful female. He encountered a cadaverous bony-looking woman, very tall, very old, though with hair still black, with gray eyes and false gleaming teeth. She was attired in calico, quality, ten cents a yard, appearance, dirty. Hardly was the door closed when the vicious voice spitefully remarked, Sit down, sir, and a skinny finger pointed to a cane-bottomed chair. While seating himself and taking off his gloves, he took an observation. The apartment was not large. In an unfurnished state, a moderately hooped bell might have stood in it without serious damage to her outskirts but there would be little extra room for any enterprising adventurer to circumnavigate her. In one corner was a small pine light-stand, on which was a skeptical-looking Bible, with a very black brass key tied in it, a volume of cowper bound in full calf, a little lamp with a single lighted wick, and a pile of the madam's business handbills. She at once showed her experience of human nature and her distrust of her present visitor by her practical and matter-of-fact conduct. She sat uncomfortably down on the very edge of an angular chair, folded her hands, shut herself half up like a jackknife, and the vicious voice mentioned this fearful fact. My terms are a dollar for gentlemen. And the gray eyes stonily stared until the dollar aforesaid was produced. The voice then prepared for business by sundry ahems, and when fairly in working order it proceeded, Give me your hand, your left hand. The widger took the extended palm in her shriveled fingers, and made four rapid dabs in the middle of it with the forefinger of her other hand, as if she were scornfully pointing out defects in its workmanship. Then she opened the drawer of the little stand with a spiteful jerk, and withdrew thence something which she put to her sinister optic, and began rapidly screwing it round with both hands, as if she had got water on the brain, and was trying to tap herself in the eye. Then the vicious voice began, in a loud mechanical manner, to speak with the greatest volubility, running the sentences together, and not thinking of a comma or a period, till her breath was exhausted, in a manner that would have fairly distanced Susan Nipper herself, even if that rapid young lady had twenty seconds the start. I see by looking in this stone that you were born under two planets. One is the planet Mars, you will die under the planet Jupiter, but it won't be this year or next. You have seen a great deal of trouble and misfortune in your past life, but better days are surely in store for you. You have passed through many things, which if written in a book would make a most interesting volume. I see by looking more closely in the stone that you are about to receive two letters, one a business letter, the other a let. Here her breath failed and as soon as it came back the voice continued. Tur from a friend, it is written very closely and is crossed, I see by looking more closely in the stone, that one of the letters will contain news which will distress you exceedingly for a little while, but you need not be troubled, for it will all be for your good. You are soon to have an interview with a man of light hair and blue eyes, who will profess great interest in you, but he will get the advantage of you if he can. You must beware of him. I see by looking more closely in the stone that you will live to be sixty-eight years old, but you will die before you are seventy. Here was another station, where the locomotive voice stopped to take an air, and then instantly dashed ahead at a greater speed than ever. I see by looking more closely in the stone that good luck will befall you, a near friend will die, and leave you a fortune. I see by looking more closely in the stone that this will happen to you when you are between thirty-two and thirty-four years old. That is all I see in this stone. Another grab brought from the little drawer another pebble, which the madam placed at her eye. The boring operation was recommenced, and the vicious voice once more got up steam. 
I see by looking closely in this stone that you will have two wives, one will be blue-eyed and the other will be black-eyed. With the first one you will not live long, but with the last one you will be happy many years. I see by looking more closely in the stone that you will have six children, which will be very comfortable. The lady who is to be your first wife is at this moment thinking of you. I see by looking more closely in the stone that a man with light hair and blue eyes is trying to get her away from you, but she scorns him and turns away. I see by looking more closely in the stone that she has a strong feeling for you. You need not fear the man with the light hair and blue eyes, for you will get her, and you only will possess her heart. I see by looking more closely in the stone that she is good, gentle, kind, loving, affectionate, true-hearted, and pleasant. The vicious voice resented each one of these good-natured adjectives as if it had been a gross personal insult to the widger, and spit them spitefully at her trembling customer, as if they tasted badly in her mouth. And will make you a good wife, you will be rich and happy, you will be successful in business, you will be hereafter always lucky, you will be distinguished, you will be eminent, you will be good, you will be respected, you will be beloved, honored, cherished, and will reach a good old age, I see by looking in this stone. That is all I see by looking in this stone. Here she ceased and choking down her indignation, which had risen to a fearful pitch during the complimentary peroration, she said, taking up the equivocal Bible with a key tied in it, Take hold of the key with your finger. I will give you one wish. If the book turns round, you will have your wish. The guest took the key in the required manner, and the widger closed her eyes and muttered something, which may have been either a prayer or a recipe for pickling red cabbage for he was unable to satisfy himself with any degree of certainty what it was. At the appointed time the book turned, and the wish was therefore graciously granted. Her hearer smiled his grimmest smile, and ventured to inquire if his unknown rival was making any progress in securing the affections of the lady in dispute, and received the satisfying answer. She scorns him and turns away. Reassured by this, the susceptible individual mentally and fiercely defied the blue-eyed intruder to do his worst, and with a reverential obeisance left the presence. As he departed, the skinny hand presented him with a handbill, but the vicious voice was silent. Carefully conning the handbill, as they slowly departed from the august realm of the madam, the seekers of magic for the lowest cash price read the following particulars. Madame Widger was born with this wonderful gift of revealing the destinies of man, and she has revealed mysteries that no mortal knew. She states that she advertises nothing but what she can do with entire satisfaction to all who wish to consult her. Also, she will scan aright dreams and visions of the night. The tender inquirer went away in a desponding mood. The widger was out of the question as a bride, for she was old enough, he said, to have been grandmother to his father's uncle. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Discourses of Mrs. Pugh of Number 102 South First Street, Williamsburg, and tells all that the nursing sorceress communicated to her cash customer. Chapter 5 Mrs. Pugh, number 102 South First Street, Williamsburg. It is traveling a little away from home to go to Williamsburg in search of a witch, but there are some peculiar circumstances about the present case that give it more than common interest. Mrs. Pugh is not an advertising sorceress, but practices all her magic slyly and generally under a promise of secrecy which is exacted lest the fame of her fortune-telling should come to the ears of certain respectable families who employ her as a nurse. She is much resorted to by a number of young persons of both sexes, and has considerable notoriety among the low and ignorant classes as a practiser of the black art. She is by no means the only nurse who is given to this reprehensible practice but very many of the old women who officiate as professional nurses are proficients in telling fortunes with cards and with the bible and key and are always glad of an opportunity to exhibit their pretended skill 
Being at times received into families where there are daughters not grown up, they become most dangerous persons if they are encouraged or permitted to thus practice on the credulity of these young girls. The mere encouragement of hurtful superstitious notions is a great ill in itself, but is by no means the extent of the evil done by some of these persons. They not unfrequently take an active part in bringing about meetings between unsuspecting girls and evil-disposed men, thus paving the way to the wretchedness and ruin of the former. More than one instance is known where the going astray of a loved daughter can be traced directly to the mischievous teachings of a fortune-telling nurse. These are the reasons that give the case of Mrs. Pugh an importance greater than attaches to many others. It is right that people should know that a certain degree of circumspection ought to be used with regard to moral character, as well as other qualifications, in the selection of a nurse, lest a person be employed who will work irreparable mischief among the younger members of the family. The individual calls on a nursing sorceress. Who shall say that broomstick locomotion is a lost art? and that steam has superseded magic in the matter of travelling. Because no one of us has ever encountered a witch on her basswood steed, shall we presume to assert that witches no longer bestride basswood steeds, and make their nocturnal excursions to blasted heaths, there to meet the devil in the social midnight orgy, and kick up their withered heels in the gay diabolical dance with other ancient females of like kidney with themselves? because no one of us has ever beheld with his own personal optics an old woman change herself into a black cat, shall we therefore assert that the ancient dames of our own day are unable to accomplish that feline transformation? Not by no manner of means whatsomever, as Mr. Weller would remark. Let us not then be found without charity for the peculiar and persistent faith of the hero of this book, who, though thrice bitterly disappointed in his matrimonial speculations among the witches, still clung to the fond belief that a bride with supernatural powers of doing things would be a splendid speculation, and that such a spouse could be found if he, her ardent lover, did not give up the chase too soon. Spite of his disappointment with Madame Bruce, and his crushing discomfiture with Madame Widger, Hope still sprang eternal in the individual's breast, and he felt, like the immortal Mr. Brown of classic verse, that it would never do to give it up so. He had something of a natural turn for mechanics, and having been of late engaged in some entertaining speculations on steam engines, he came not unnaturally to think of the wonderful advantage the magically endowed people of old had over the present age in the matter of locomotion. He thought of that wonderful carpet, on which a jolly little party had but to seat themselves, and wish to be transported to any far-off spot, and presto, change, there they were instanter. No collisions to be feared no running off the track at a speed of ever so many unaccountable miles an hour, no cast-iron-voiced conductor at short intervals demanding tickets, no old women with sour babies, no obtrusive boys with double-priced books and magazines, no other boys with peanuts, apples, and popcorn, nothing, in fact, save one's own social circle, but a civil genie, not of Irish extraction, to fly alongside, to mix the juleps, and carry the morning paper. It was very natural to consider whether there wasn't a yard or two left somewhere of that valuable carpet, and to regret that on the whole probably the original owners had occasion to use the entire piece. Then the thought was very naturally suggested of the marvellous wooden horse with the pegs in his neck, who soared with his riders a great deal higher than does Mr. Wise in his clumsy balloon, and always came down a great deal easier than ever Mr. Wise did yet. Of course, the cash customer was from the start perfectly convinced that that breed of horses is long since extinct, 
so long ago that no record of them is now to be found in either the American racing calendar or the English stud book. Then very naturally came the thoughts of the broomstick changes of the more modern witches. Perhaps, he thought, these are the colts of the wooden horse, degenerate, it is true, and lacking in the grace and symmetry of their extraordinary sire, but still, perhaps, not inferior in speed or in safety of carriage. The thought was a brilliant one, and it was really worth while to inquire into the matter and pursue this phantom steed until he was fairly hunted down and bridled ready for use. It needed no long cogitation or extended argument to convince Johann, the individual, the cash customer, of the immense practical value of such a steed to say nothing of his costing nothing to keep, and of its therefore being utterly impossible for him to eat his own head off, and of his never growing old, and of his never having any of the multitudinous diseases that afflict ordinary horses, without any intermixture of magic blood, and therefore of it being out of the question for anybody to cheat his owner in a horse trade. Why, only think of his value for livery purposes, in case his happy proprietor was disposed to let other folks use him for a proper compensation. He could, of course, be trained to carry double, and no doubt Mr. Rary, or some other person, potent in horse education, could easily break him to go in harness. It wasn't likely, Johann cogitated, that the judges would allow him to enter his ligneous racer at the fashion course, so that he'd not get a chance to win any money from Lancet and Flora Temple. Still there was hope, even on that point. So, in search of the witch wife, whose dower should be the broomstick horse, that should set the fond couple up in business, started the sanguine lover. Having had some experience of New York fortune-tellers, and others in the magic line, and not thinking they were of the sort likely to have so great a treasure, he started for the suburbs, and crossed the ferry to Williamsburg, in order to pay a visit of inquiry, and, if possible, to take the initiatory step in courting Mrs. Pugh of number 102 South First Street, in that city. He designed, of course, to buy a fortune at a liberal price, for the purposes of setting the lady in good humor as a necessary preliminary step. He really had hopes that she would prove to be of a slightly different style from some of the New York fortune-tellers, who seemed to have mistaken their profession, and to be hardly up to the reading of stars with success, although they might be fully equal to all the financial exigencies of an apple and peanut stand, or might win an honorable distinction crying radishes and lettuce in the early morning hours, or upon trial might, perhaps, evince a decided genius for the rag-picking business, or preside over the fortunes of a soap-fat cart with distinguished ability. Threading the winding ways of Williamsburg is by no means an easy task for one unaccustomed, and it was only by incessantly stopping the passers-by, and making the most minute inquiries, that this lady was ever achieved at all. This constant questioning of the public revealed, however, the fact that Mrs. Pugh does not by any means depend upon her fortune-telling for her bread and butter. She is a nurse, as many a Williamsburg baby could testify if it could command its emotions long enough to speak. What will be the influence of her supernaturalism and witchcraft upon the children entrusted to her fostering care, whether they will in after-life prove to be devils, demigods, heroes, or mere ordinary humans, time only can show. This illustrious lady does not advertise in the newspapers. In fact, her fortune-telling is done on the sly, as if she were yet an apprentice, and a little ashamed of her bungling jobs, for which, by the way, she only charges half price. She is in a very undecided state and evidently undetermined whether her proper vocation is tending babies or revealing the decrees of the fates at twenty-five cents a head, and when her visitors made their appearance she was puzzled to know whether their business was baby or black art. Her exertions in either profession have not as yet gained her a very large fortune. 
judging from the surroundings of her eligible residence. The domicile of this chrysalis enchantress is a low frame house of two stories, standing back from the street, directly in the rear of another row of more pretentious mansions, as if it had been sent into the back yard in disgrace, and never permitted to show itself in good society again. It seems conscious of its humiliation, and wears an air of architectural dejection that is quite touching. A troop of dirty-faced children was in the yard, and in the corner was a pile of other household encumbrances, consisting principally of mops and wash-tubs. Johann critically examined this interesting collection, but the wished-for broomstick was not there. A modest rap brought to the door a large ill-favored man, with a red nose and a ponderous pair of boots, whose specialty seemed to be drinking whatever spiritous liquors were consumed about the establishment. Having passed this shirt-sleeve sentinel without damage, though not without fear, the cash customer sat down to take an observation. The wooden courser was not to be seen at first glance. The room was a small, irregularly shaped one, with an intrusive chimney jutting out into the floor from one side, as if it were a sturdy brick-and-mortar poor relation of the premises come a-visiting and not to be got rid of at any price. A small cooking-stove was in the fireplace, with an attendant on either side, in the shape of a battered coal scuttle, and a small saucepan full of charcoal. The floor was covered with a dirty rag carpet that had long since outlived its beauty and its usefulness, and was now in the last extremity of a tattered old age. Half a dozen chairs of different patterns, all much shattered in health and enfeebled by long years of labor, and a decrepit lounge in the last stages of a decline, were the seats reserved for visitors. The other furniture of the room was an antique chest of drawers of a most curious and complicated pattern. It seemed as if the mechanic had been uncertain whether he was to construct a bureau or a cowshed, and had accordingly satisfied his conscience by making half a dozen drawers and building a sloping roof over them. The joints were warped apart, and through the chinks could be seen fragments of clean shirt and ends of lace and bits of flannel suggesting babies. At a wink from the female, the male, with the ponderous boots, retired from the presence. Mrs. Pugh is a woman of medium height and size, with a clear gray eye, and light hair, and wearing that sycophantic smile peculiar to people who have much to do with ugly babies, whose beauty must be constantly praised to the doting parents. She was attired in a neat calico dress, constructed for family use, and for the particular accommodation of the younger members of the household. Johann, who had been taking a sly look, had made up his mind that she would not be quite so objectionable for a wife as he had feared, and he had fully resolved to woo and wed her off-hand, provided she had the broomstick of his hopes. So, by way of a beginning, he announced that he would like her to exercise her magic powers in his behalf. Mrs. Pugh had evidently previously regarded him as an enthusiastic young father with a pair of troublesome twins who had come to seek her ministrations, and she undoubtedly had high wages, innumerable presents, and exorbitant prerequisites in her mind's eye at that instant. When, however, she learned that her visitor merely wished to know what the fates had resolved to do about his particular case, she was slightly disappointed for the babies are more profitable than the planets. However, she soon reconciled herself to her fate, and produced from some cranny immediately under the eaves of the cowshed bureau a pack of cards wrapped up in an old newspaper. She then carefully locked the door to keep out the children, and drew down the curtains, lest their inquiring minds should lead them to observe her mysterious operations through the window. Then, taking the wonder-working pieces of pasteboard in her hands, and seating herself opposite her visitor, she announced her gracious will thus, You shall have six wishes. Then, without asking him what he wished for, or whether he wished for anything, she shoveled the cards a few seconds, 
and read off their mysterious significance as follows her curious and anxious customer looking furtively around meanwhile to spy out the hiding place of the wooden cursor appears to me you will have good luck in future though it seems to me that you have had a great deal of bad luck and misfortune in your life but you will certainly do better in your future days than you have done yet in your life at least so it seems to me appears to me your good luck will commence right away pretty soon immediate in a very few days you will have some great good luck befall you within a nine i designate time by days and weeks and months and sometimes years so this good luck of which i told you you will certainly have within nine days or nine weeks or nine months or possibly nine years nine days i think yes i am sure within nine days at least so it appears to me you are going to make a change in your business so it seems to me you are going to leave your present business and make a change you will make this change within a seven which may be seven days or weeks weeks i think yes certainly within seven weeks at least so it appears to me this change in your business which will take place in seven days or weeks i think yes weeks i'm sure will be a change for the better and you will profit by it much at least so it seems to me and it will come to pass within a seven as i said before within a seven months or days it may be but weeks i think yes now i look again within a seven weeks i'm certain at least so it appears to me you will receive a letter within a three years perhaps months it may be but still it looks like days yes days i'm sure days it must be within a three and days they are you will receive a letter within three days i'm positively sure or so it appears to me you have friends across water from whom you will hear speedily and soon within a five which may be months although i think not for it looks like years did i say years no days yes days it is again within a five and days they are this letter you will have within five days it will contain excellent news which will please you much money the news will be and you will get the letter within a five which may be months or years but days it looks like and first-rate news it is of money i am positively certain that it is within a five at least it seems so to me you face up good luck and prosperity and you will be very rich before you die though i do not see how you are to get your money whether by business or legacy but you will be very rich or so it seems to me you will receive some money within a four it will be in three parcels and there will be considerable of it you will get it in three parcels within a four not hours nor years nor yet months but weeks money in three parcels within a four and weeks they are i'm certain the money will be in three parcels three parcels in three parcels you will get money within a four which now i look again it may be years but still i think not no it is weeks i'm certain at least so it appears to me there is a lady that has a good heart for you she is a light complexioned lady with black eyes she has a good heart for you and i do not see any trouble between you which means that there is no opposition to your match and that you will certainly marry her within a two at least so it appears to me within a two you will marry this light complexioned lady within a two which is not hours nor yet days i think it is months i'll look again no it is not months but years within a two and years they are yes two years before a two and years they are this lady will be your wife at least so it seems to me appears to me you will get money with her i do not know how much but you will certainly get money in three parcels as i once remarked before within a four which i'm sure is weeks you will be married twice once within a two once again within a five or seven after your first wife dies i think it is a five though it may be a seven and months it looks like though it may be weeks or days you will live with your first wife a ten days it can't be 
though it looks like days. A ten. You'll live with her at ten. Can it be hours? No, years it is. It must be, because you will have five children by your first wife, which makes it years. Ten years it is. I know, at least so it appears to me. You will have five children by your first wife, but you will not raise them all. All will die but two, and then your wife will die within a one, which is a month, or so it seems to me. The inquirer was charmed with the lively prospect of so many funerals, and mentally resolved to buy a couple of acres in Greenwood for the accommodation of his future family. His meditations were interrupted by the lady, who thus continued, You will marry a second wife, but you will have trouble about her. There is a dark-complexioned man who interferes, and who will trouble you for an eight, which may be years, although I think not, nor hours, nor days, but months. I'm sure it is. Yes, the dark-complexioned man will trouble you for an eight, which I am sure is months. Yes, months it is. And eight, I say, and months they are. I am certain, at least so it appears to me. By your second wife you will have three children, who will all live. I see a funeral here within a six. It does not look like a friend or a relative, but it is some acquaintance, or the friend of some acquaintance, or the acquaintance of some friend. The funeral is within a six, but it does not come very near to you. You will go to a wedding within a three and you will receive a present of a ring within a two, which may be days. You will after this be very prosperous and happy, and you will be very long-lived. You will get a letter and a present from the light-complexioned lady within a nine, which, as I said before, it may be hours, which I think it is, though weeks it may be, or months, or even years, though certainly within a nine, which, now I look again, is days, Yes, I am sure, certain, within a nine, a letter and a present from the light-complexioned lady, a nine it is, and days, within a nine, and days they are, at least so it appears to me. Here ended the communication, and on inquiring the price, Johann was astonished to learn that he had received but twenty-five cents worth, regretting that he had not invested a dollar in a commodity so cheap and very filling at the price for future consumption, he departed, first taking a long lingering look to find, if possible, the lurking place of the magic broomstick charger. He didn't see it, and gave it up, and came away declaring that such a woman was not qualified to take the social position his wife must assume. He did not, however, wish to discourage her, he thought that the watermelon trade might be comprehended by a lady of her abilities, or that she could perhaps thoroughly master the popcorn and molasses candy business and make it lucrative. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix In which are narrated the wonderful workings of Madame Morrow, the Astonisher, of number 76 Broom Street, and how, by a crinolinic stratagem, the individual got a sight of his future husband. Chapter 6 Madame Morrow, the Astonisher, number 76 Broom Street. Madame Morrow is the only one of the fortune telling fraternity in New York who refuses to dispense her astrological favors to both sexes. She positively declines receiving any visits from gentlemen, and confines her business attention exclusively to ladies, of whom many are her regular customers. One reason for this course of conduct is that she imagines her own sex to be the more credulous and more readily disposed to put faith in her claims to supernatural knowledge, and she naturally prefers to deal with believers rather than with skeptics. Her lady customers are more tractable and easily managed than men, and are not so apt to ask puzzling and impertinent questions, and, as the madam can manage more of them in a day, of course the pecuniary return is larger than if she exercised her art in behalf of curious masculinity as well. Of her history before she engaged in her present business, not much is known to those who have met her only of late years, 
for with regard to her early life she chooses to exercise a politic reticence. The whole style of the woman, however, her dress, manner, and conversation, are strong indications that her younger and more attractive days were not passed in a nunnery, but more probably in establishments where free love is more than a theory. The character of the greater part of her lady visitors is of a grade that goes to corroborate this supposition, and leads to the belief that among women of doubtful virtue old acquaintance is not easily forgot. By far the greater number of Madame Morrow's customers are girls of the town and women of even more disreputable character. The fact that a visit to this renowned sorceress must be paid in a feminine disguise made the attempt to secure an interview of more than ordinary interest. How this difficulty was mastered, and how an entrance was finally effected into the citadel from which all mankind is rigorously excluded, is best told in the words of the individual who accomplished that curious feat. How the cash customer visited the astonisher how he was astonished, and how he saw his future husband. The cash customer in pursuit of a wife had been rebuffed, but was not disheartened. He had, so to speak, fought a number of very severe hymenial rounds, and got the worst of them all. But he had taken his punishment like a man, and had still wind and pluck to come up bravely to the matrimonial scratch when time was called and as yet showed no signs of giving in. His backers, if he had any, would have still been tolerably sure of their money, and not painfully anxious to hedge. The bets would have been about even that he'd win the fight yet, and come out of the battle a triumphant husband, instead of being knocked out of the field a disconsolate and discomfited bachelor. But although his ardor had not cooled, and though his strength and determination still held out, he had grown slightly cautious, and had conceived a plan for going like a spy into the camp of the enemy, and there thoroughly reconnoitering the positions that he had to storm, and at the same time making himself master of the wiles and stratagems that were the peculiar weapons of the female foe, and so learn some infallible way to capture a first-quality wife. At any rate, he would give himself the benefit of the doubt, and make the experiment. He would a wooing go, not appareled in conquering broadcloth, in subjugating Marseilles, or overpowering doeskin, but carrying the unaccustomed but not less potent weapons of laces, moirantique, crinoline, and gaiters. In fact, there was also a stern necessity in the case for the lady on whom he had now set his young affections was particular as to her customers, and did not admit the shirt-collar gender to the honor of her confidence. But what was this to stop him? If the lady shut out the whole masculine world from the inevitable fascinations of her superabundant charms, was it not for sweet charity's sake? that a whole community might not go into ecstatic frenzies over her peerless beauty, and all men being stricken in love of the same woman go to cutting each other's throats with bowie knives and other modern improvements? It was easy to see that Madame Morrow did not want to become another Helen, to be abducted to some modern Troy, and have a ten years row, and any quantity of habeas corpuses, and innumerable contempts of interminable courts, after the modern fashion of conducting a strife about a runaway maiden. Such a considerate beauty, veiling her undoubted fascinations from the rude gaze of man, from purely prudential reasons, must be a prize of rare value, and well worth the winning. Her qualifications in magic, too, seem to be of the very first order, to judge from her notification to the wonder-seeking world. Astonishing to all, Madame Morrow claims to be the most wonderful astrologist in the world, or that has ever been known, as I am the seventh daughter of the seventh daughter, who is also a great astrologist. I have a natural gift to tell past, present, and future events of life. I have astonished thousands during my travels in Europe. I will tell how many times you are to be married, how soon, and will show you the likeness of your future husband, and will cause you to be speedily married 
and you will enjoy the greatest happiness of matrimonial bliss and good luck through your whole life. I will also show the likeness of absent friends and relations, and I will tell so true all the concerns of life that you cannot help being astonished. No charge, if not satisfied. Gentlemen, not admitted. Number 76, Broom Street, near Columbia. There was but one thing in this that troubled the individual with any particularly sharp pangs. He intended to marry the astonisher, but he was a little bothered what to do with the seven daughters, for of course the madam would not fail to follow the excellent example of her revered mother, and would never stop short of the mystic number. He finally concluded that all his duties as a father would be faithfully performed if he taught them to read, write, and play on the piano, and then gave them each a sewing machine to begin the world with. He did think of bringing them up for the ballet, but their success in that profession being somewhat dependent on the size and symmetry of their dancing implements, he felt it would be improper to positively determine on that line of business before he had been favored with a sight of the young ladies, reserving, therefore, his decision on this knotty point until time should further develop the subject, he prepared for the unsexing which was indicated as an inevitable preliminary to a visit to Madame Morrow by the sentence, gentlemen not admitted. He proposed to get himself up in a way that would slightly astonish the madam herself, although she had faithfully promised in her advertisement to astonish him. He would have been willing to wager a small sum that with all her witchcraft she would be unable to keep that promise, for in the regular course of his business he had become so accustomed to marvels, wonders, and miracles that the upheaval of a volcano in the park wouldn't discompose him unless it singed his whiskers. He had a strong desire, however, to realize the old sensation of astonishment, and he was of the opinion that the likeness of his future husband would accomplish that feat if anything could. Heroic was Johann, and withal ingenious, and this then was his wonderful plan. He would visit this Madame Morrow, not by proxy, but in his own proper person, if not as a man, then as a woman. Yes, he would petticoat himself up to the required dimensions, if it took a week to tie on the machinery. Off with the pantaloons, on with the skirts, down with the broadcloth, hurrah for the cotton, and hay for the victory, and a look at his future husband. To an inventor of theatrical costumes hide he, with this fell design in his heart. The requisite paraphernalia were bargained for and sent home to the ambitious voyager, who, at the sight thereof, was astonished in advance, and stricken aghast by the complicated mysteries of laces, ribbons, strings, bones, buttons, pins, capes, collars, and other inexplicable articles that met his gaze. The question instantly occurred, could he get into these things? Not a bit of it. He would sooner undertake to report in shorthand the speech of a thundercloud, and with much better prospects of success. He felt his own insignificance, and as he looked out at the window he regarded a passing female with awe. He felt that he was fast becoming imbecile, not to say idiotic, when he bethought him of his friends. Two discreet married men, who knew the ropes, were called to the rescue, and began the work. They piled on layer after layer of the material, and in the course of four or five hours had built him into a pyramid of the proper size, when they gave him their solemn assurance that he was all right. He has since discovered that they had tied his undersleeves round his ankles, and that the things he wore on his arms must have belonged somewhere else. There was trouble about the hair, and it required the combined ingenuity and wisdom of the masculine trio to keep the bonnet on, and this difficulty was only overcome at last by tying strings from the inside of the crown of that invention to the ears of the sufferer. Then, and not till then, had anybody thought of the whiskers. They must be sacrificed, and though the miserable victim to his own ambition consented to the disfigurement, how was it to be accomplished? The luckless Johann could no more sit down in a barber's chair than the city hall could get into an omnibus. At last he knelt down, which was the nearest approach he could make to a sitting position, 
and Jenkins, mounted on the bed, shaved him as well as he could at arm's length. When the operation was concluded, his head looked as if it had been parboiled and the skin taken off. He didn't dare to curse Jenkins for his clumsiness, knowing that if he relieved his mind in that desirable manner, Jenkins would refuse to help him undress when he wanted to get out of the innumerable manacles that now confined every joint. He was as helpless as a turtle that the unkind hand of ruthless man has rolled over on his back. However, the disguise was complete. He looked in the glass and thought he was his own landlady. His best friends wouldn't have known him, and the teller of the bank would have pronounced him a forgery and refused to certify him. He felt like a full-rigged clipper ship, and got under sail as soon as possible, and bore down upon Madame Morrow's residence. He nearly capsized as he stepped into the street, but he righted after a heavy lurch to the northeast, and kept his course without further serious disaster. He made a speedy run to Broom Street, the voyage being accomplished in less than the expected time, although a heavy sea, in the shape of a boy with a wheelbarrow, struck him amidships on the corner of Sheriff Street, doing some damage to his lower works, and carrying away a yard or so of lace from his main skirt. He finally came up to the house in splendid style, and cast anchor on the opposite sidewalk to take an observation. The anchorage was good, and he rode securely for a short time until he could repair damages, he having carried away some of his upper rigging. In other words, he had caught his veil on a meat hook and had been unable to rescue it. He rigged a sort of jury veil with the end of his shawl, so that he could hide his blushing countenance in case of too close scrutiny. Madame Morrow lives, as he now discovered, in a low three-story brick house, which cannot be called dirty, simply because that mild word expresses an approximation towards cleanliness which no house in this locality has known for years. City readers can get an idea of its condition by understanding that it is in the worst part of the hook. To readers in the country, who have luckily never seen anything filthier than a barnyard, no information can be given which would meet the case. Sunshine is the only protection for a well-dressed man against the population of this part of town. In the twilight or darkness he would be robbed, if not corroded and murdered. The boldest and most desperate burglars, and others of that stamp, have their homes about here, fathers who teach their children the thief's profession, and mothers who carry pickpockets at the breast. In the midst of this nest of crime the fortune-teller has her home, and here she thrives. The daring man, protected by his false colors, there being no officious authority in that neighborhood to exercise the right of search, came alongside the house and prepared, metaphorically, to board. That is, he rang the bell. He was admitted by an Irish girl, whose encrusted face showed that the same deposit of dirt had probably held possession undisturbed for weeks. They had just entered the hall door when two small children, who were contending for their vested rights with a big yellow dog that had interfered with their dinner, commenced an unearthly squalling, which, for the instant, made the millinery delegate fairly believe that Tophet was out for noon. The Hibernian maiden, with great presence of mind, immediately attempted to quiet the storm by administering to each inverted brat a sound correction in the manner usually adopted by mothers. Particulars are omitted. Then she resumed her attentions to the stranger, and convoyed him into port in the parlor. Securely harbored in this safe retreat, Johann took another observation. The room was small, and what few things were in it looked shabby and dirty, of course. The principal article of furniture was a huge basketful of soiled linen, which had probably been taken in to wash, and from a respectable family, for every single article looked ashamed to be caught in such company, and tried to burrow down out of sight. Disconsolate shirts elbowed humiliated socks, which in turn kicked against mortified flannels, or hid themselves beneath disconcerted sheets. Abashed shirt-collars and humble dickies tried to shrink out of sight in very shame beneath a dishonored tablecloth, 
the wine stains on which showed it to be long in better society a dejected and cast down woman was assorting the despairing contents of the basket with a look of desolation the girl who had disappeared now returned and with an air of mystery slipped into the hand of her visitor a red card on which was inscribed no person allowed to remain in the establishment without a ticket please present this on entering madame morrow's room fee in full one dollar for an hour and a half after the receipt of this card and the payment of one dollar therefore did johann quietly wait in the room with the big basket being entertained meanwhile by the two women who conversed with each other upon the relative merits of engines number eighteen and twenty seven and with a long discussion as to the comparative personal beauty of tom and dick who it seemed belonged respectively to those two mechanical constituents of our fire department at the end of that time the irish girl who had succeeded in establishing dick's claim to her satisfaction arose and invited the stranger to the room of madame morrow he passed up a narrow flight of stairs the condition of which as to dirt was concealed by no friendly carpet then he sailed into a front parlor which was furnished elegantly and perhaps gorgeously with carpets mirrors sofas and all the usual requirements of a lady's apartment madame herself appeared at the door she is a tall sallow-looking woman with a complexion the color of old parchment with light brown eyes and light hair being attired in a handsome delaine dress of half mourning and decorated with a costly cameo pin and eardrops she looked not unlike a servant out for a holiday making a sensation in her mistress's finery she led her lovely visitor into a little closet-like room in which were a bureau two chairs a table a small stand covered with a number of her business handbills and a pack of cards she asked first what month was you born on receiving the answer the astonisher took a book from the bureau and read as follows a person born in this month is of an amiable and frank disposition benevolent and an amiable and desirable partner in the marriage relation your lucky days are tuesdays and thursdays on which days you may enter on any undertaking or attempt any enterprise with a good prospect of success then she took up the cards again and after the usual shuffling and cutting the astonisher fired away as follows you face luck you face prosperity you face true love and disinterested affection you face a speedy marriage you face a letter which will come in three days and will contain pleasant news you face a ring you face a present of jewelry done up in a small package the latter will come within two hours two days two weeks or two months you face an agreeable surprise you face the death of a friend you face the seven of clubs which is the luckiest card in the pack you face two gentlemen with a view to matrimony one of whom has brown hair and brown eyes and the other has lighter hair and blue eyes they are both thinking of you at the present time but the nearest one you face is the one with light eyes your marriage runs within six or nine months there was very much more to the same effect but as johann was pining all this time for a look at his future husband he did not pay the strictest attention to it finally when she had finished talking she said step this way and see your future husband this was the eventful moment the disguised one went to the table and there beheld a pine box about the size of an ordinary candle box though shallower it was unpainted and decidedly unornamental as an article of furniture in one end of it was an aperture about the size of the eye-hole of a telescope this was carefully covered with a small black curtain this mystic contrivance was placed upon a table so low that the husband seeker was compelled to go on his knees to get his eye down low enough to see through he accomplished this feat without grumbling although his knees were scarified by the whalebones which surrounded him the astonisher then drew aside the little curtain with a grand flourish and her customer beheld an indistinct figure of a bloated face with a moustache with black eyes and black hair 
It was a hangdog, thief-like face, and one that he would not have passed in the street without involuntarily putting his hands on his pockets to assure himself that all was right. But he felt that he had no hope of a future husband if he did not accept this one, and he made up his mind to be reconciled to the match. This contrivance for showing the future husband is sometimes called the magic mirror, and may be procured at any opticians for a dollar and a quarter. The future husband may of course be varied to suit circumstances, by merely shifting the pictures at one end of the instrument, or a horse or a dog might be substituted with equal propriety and probability. Disappointed and sick at heart and stomach, the cash customer bore away for home and accomplished this return voyage without disaster. He didn't so much mind the unexpected difference in the personal attractions of Madame Morrow from what he had hoped, for he had been rather accustomed to disappointments of that sort of late, but he couldn't see that his admission to the camp of the enemy had enabled him to spy out anything of particular advantage to him in future operations. So he cogitated and mournfully whistled slow tunes, as he cut himself out of his unaccustomed harness by the help of a penknife with a file blade. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Contains a full account of the interview of the cash customer with Dr. Wilson, the astrologer, of number 172 Delancey Street. The fates decree that he shall peas on his first wife. Hooray! Chapter 7 Dr. Wilson, number 172 Delancey Street this ignorant, half-imbecile old man is the only wizard in New York whose fame has become public. There are several other men who sometimes, as a matter of favor to a curious friend, exercise their astrological skill, but they do not profess witchcraft as a means of living. They do not advertise their gifts, but only dabble in necromancy in an amateur way, more as a means of amusement than for any other purpose. On the other hand, Dr. Wilson freely uses the newspapers to announce to the public his star-reading ability and his willingness, for a consideration, to tell all events, past and future, of a paying customer's life. He professes to do all his fortune-telling in a strictly scientific manner, and it is but justice to him to say that he alone, of all the witches of New York, drew a horoscope, consulted books of magic, made intricate mathematical calculations, and made a show of being scientific. In his case only was any attempt made to convince the seeker after hidden wisdom that modern fortune-telling is aught else than very lame and shabby guesswork. The old doctor has by no means so many customers as many of his female rivals. He is old and unprepossessing. Were he young and handsome, the case might be otherwise. He has been a pretended botanic physician, or what country people term a root doctor, but failing to earn a living by the practice of medicine, he took up demonology and witchcraft to aid him to eke out a scanty subsistence. He does but little in either branch of his business, the public appearing to have slight faith in his ability either to cure their maladies or foretell their future. The character of his surroundings is noted in the following description and his oracular communication is given, word for word. An hour with a wizard, the cash customer is to peas on his first wife, and then get another. Hooray! I am like a vagabond pig with no family ties, who has no lady pig to welcome him home o' nights, and with no tender sucklings to call him papa, in that prattling porcine language that must fall so sweetly on the ears of all parents of innocent porklings. Like Othello, I have no wife, and really I can see little hope in the future. Thus moralized the individual, the morning after his experiment with the women's gear, and his failure to learn, at a single lesson, the whole art of catching a wife. Then he bethought him that perhaps the art could not be learned without a master. And then came the other thought, that no one could tell so well how to win a witch wife, as one who had himself been successful in that risky experiment. To find a man with a fortune-telling wife is no easy matter, for most of the marriages contracted by these ladies are by no means of a permanent character, and the male parties to the temporary partnerships 
are always kept in the background. But if he could discover up a wizard, a masculine master of the black art, there were strong probabilities that such an individual could put him in the way of winning a miracle-working spouse, at the very least possible trouble and expense. He would seek that man as a preliminary to winning that woman. The daily newspapers showed him that in the person of a learned doctor, surnamed Wilson, he would probably find the man he wanted. He searched out that wonderful man, and the results of his visit are given in this identical chapter. Old dreamy Saul Gills, of coffee-colored memory, has been admiringly recommended to the good opinion of the world by his friend, Captain Eddard Cuttle, mariner of England, as a man chock-full of science. From the same eminent authority we also learn that Jack Bunsby was an individual of learning so vast, and experience so varied, and comprehensive, that he never opened his oracular mouth but out fell solid chunks of wisdom that the person now dwells in our city who combines the scientific attainments of gills with the intuitive wisdom of bunsby we have the solemn word of johann the science is a trifle more dreamy and misty even than of old and the wisdom is solider and chunkier but both are as undeniable as convincing as stunning as in the best days of the little wooden midshipman the fortunate possessor of this inestimable wealth of knowledge secludes himself from the curious public in the basement of the house number one seventy two delancey street like an underground hermit however this unselfish and generous sage not wishing to hide entirely the light of his great learning from a benighted world kindly condescends in the advertisement herewith given to retail his wisdom to anxious inquirers at a dollar a chunk astrology dr wilson 172 Delancey Street, gives the most scientific and reliable information to be found on all concerns of life, past, present, and future. Terms, ladies, 50 cents, gentlemen, one dollar, birth required. The last sentence is slightly obscure, and it was not quite clear to Johann that he would not have to be born again on the premises but at all events there was something refreshing in the novelty of consulting a learned pundit in pantaloons after all the tough conjurers of the other sex that he had undergone of late so he repaired to delancey street in a joyous mood nothing daunted by the requirements of the advertisement delancey street is not paradise quite the contrary in fact it may be set down as unsavory not to say dirty in the extreme the man that can walk through the east end of this delicious thoroughfare without a constant sensation of seasickness has a stomach that would be true to him in a dissecting room. The individual that can explore with his unwilling boots its slimy depths without a feeling of the most intense disgust for everything in the city and of the city ought to live in Delancey Street and buy his provisions at the corner grocery. He never ought to see the country, or even to smell the breath of a country cow. He should be exiled to the city, be banished to perpetual bricks and mortar, be condemned to a never-ending series of omnibus rides, and to innumerable varieties of short change. The delegate picked his way gingerly enough, thinking all the while that if Leander had been compelled to wade through Delancey Street, instead of taking a clean swim across the sea, Hero might have died, a respectable old maid, for all Leander. And yet Johann says he doesn't believe that history will give him any credit for his valorous navigation of the said street. He at last reached the designated spot, sound as to body, though woefully soiled as to garments, and approached the semi-subterranean abode of the great prophet, and immediately after his modest rap at the basement door was met by the venerable sage in person, he walked in, and then proceeded to take an observation of the cabalistic instruments and mysterious surroundings of the great philosopher. The room was a small, low apartment, about ten feet by twelve, the floor uncarpeted and uneven. The walls were damp, and the whole place was like a vault. The furniture was very scanty, and all had an unwholesome moisture about it, and a curious odor, as if it gathered unhealthy dews by being kept underground. 
Three feeble chairs were all the seats, and a table which leaned against the wall was too ill and rickety to do its intended duty. Many of the books which had once probably covered it were now thrown in a promiscuous heap on the floor, where they slowly mildewed and gave out a graveyard smell. A miniature stove in the middle of the room sweated and sweltered, and in its struggles to warm the unhealthy atmosphere had succeeded in suffusing itself with a clammy perspiration. It was in the last stages of debility, old age and abuse had used it sadly, and it now stood helplessly upon its crippled legs, and supported its nerveless elbow upon a sturdy whitewashed brush. There were a few symptoms of medical pretensions in the shape of some vials, and bottles of drugs, and colored liquids on the mantelpiece. A great attempt at a display of scientific apparatus began and ended with an insulating stool, and an old-fashioned, cylinder and cushion, electrical machine. A number of highly colored prints of animals pasted on the wall, having evidently been scissored from the show-bill of a menagerie, had a look towards natural history, and a jar of two of acids suggested chemical researches. The books that still remained on the enervated table were an odd volume of Braithwaite's Retrospect, a treatise on human physiology, and another on Materia Medica, a number of bound volumes of Zadkiel's Astronomical Ephemeris, Raphael's Prophetic Almanac, Raphael's Prophetic Almanac, Raphael's Prophetic Messenger, and a file of Robert White's Celestial Atlas, running back to 1808. The appearance of the venerable sage of Delancey Street was not so imposing as to strike a stranger with awe. Quite the contrary. He partook of the character of the room, and was a fitting occupant of such a place. He seemed some kind of unwholesome vegetable that had found that noisome atmosphere congenial, and had sprung indigenously from the slimy soil. One looked instinctively at his feet to see what kind of roots he had, and then glanced back at his head as if it were a huge bud, and about to blossom into some unhealthy flower. The traces of its earthly origin were plainly visible about this moldy old plant. Quantities of the rank soil still adhered to the face, filled up the wrinkles of the cheeks, found ample lodging in the ears and on the neck, and crowding under the horny and distorted nails, made them still more ugly, and streaks and ridges of dirt clung to every portion of the garments, which answered to the bark or rind of the perspiring herb. To drop this botanic figure of speech, Dr. Wilson is a man of about fifty-eight years of age, rather stout and thick-set, with gray eyes and hair, which was once brown, but is now gray, and with thin brown whiskers. The top of his head is nearly bald, except a few thin, furzy, short hairs, which made his skull look as if it had been kept in that damp room until mold had gathered on it. He was in his shirt-sleeves, and was attired, for the most part, in a pair of sheep's gray pantaloons, which were made to cover that fraction of his body between his ankles and his armpits. The little patch of shirt that was visible above the waistband of that garment was streaked with irregular lines of dirty black, as if it had gone into half-mourning for the scarcity of water. The man of science made a musty remark or two about the weather and the walking, and then, after carefully seating himself at the decrepit table, he said, I suppose your business is of a fortune-telling nature. If so, my terms is one dollar. The affirmative answer to the question, and the payment of the dollar, put new energy into the moldy old man, and he prepared to astonish the beholder. He demanded the age of his visitor, and then desired to be informed of the date of his birth, with particular reference to the exact time of day. Johann drummed up his youthful recollections of that interesting event, and gave the day, the hour, and the minute, with his accustomed accuracy. The sage made an exact minute of these wet nurse items on a cheap slate, with the stub of a pencil. Then, taking another cheap slate, he proceeded to draw a horoscope thereon, pausing a little over the signs of the zodiac, as if he was a little out in his astronomy, and wasn't exactly certain whether there should be twelve or twenty. He settled this little matter by filling one half the slate as full as it would hold, and then carrying some to the other side, so as to have a few on hand in case of an emergency. 
When the figure was drawn, and all the mysterious signs completed, the shirt-sleeve prophet became absorbed in an intricate calculation of such mysterious import that all his customer's mathematical proficiency was unable to make out what it was all about. First he set down a long row of figures, which he added together with much difficulty, and then seemed to instantly conceive the most unrelenting hostility to the sum total. The mathematical tortures to which he put that unhappy amount, the arithmetical abuse which he heaped upon it, and the algebraic contumely with which he overwhelmed it, almost defy description. He first belabored it with the four simple rules. He stretched it with addition. He cut it into two with subtraction. He made it top-heavy with multiplication, and tore it to pieces with division. Then he extracted its square root, then extracted the cube root of that, which left nothing of the unfortunate sum total but a small fraction, which he then divided by a b, and made equal to an infinitesimal part of some unknown x. Having thus wreaked his vengeance on the unhappy number, he laid away the surviving fraction in a cold corner of the slate, where he left it, first, however, giving a parting token of his bitter malignity by writing the minus sign before it, which made it perpetually worse than nothing, and reduced it to a state of irredeemable algebraic bankruptcy. This praiseworthy object being finally achieved, he proceeded to translate into intelligible English the result of his calculations, which he announced in the terms following. The testimonial is not the most sanguine. If the time of birth is given correct, there is reason to apprehend that something of an effective nature occurred about eight years and ten months, at sixteen by ten, I think I may say, if the time of birth is given correct. There is from the figures reason to expect that there is a probability of a similar situation of events. At twenty-four, there was a favorable situation of events. If there was not somebody or something afflictive on the contrary, the which I am disposed to think might be possible. At twenty-five, if the time of birth is given correct, there is reason to expect great likelihoods of some success in life. I may, it is true, be mistaken in my calculations, but as the significators are angular, I think there is indications that such will be the situation of events. At thirty, if the time of birth is given correct, I think you are an individual, as may look for some species of misfortune. There will be some rather singular circumstances occur, which might denote loss of friends, or the fallen to you of a fortune, or great travelling by water or land, or losing money at cards, or breaking your leg, or making a great discovery, or inventing something, or getting put into prison on suspicion of sorcery and witchcraft. You will see that there are indications to denote that you will certainly be accused of sorcery and witchcraft by some individuals who are not your friends. The indications denote great likelihoods that this will make you uneasy in your mind, but I think there is nothing of a very serious nature to be feared at that time of life, if the time of birth is given correct. When any misfortune is coming upon you, there is no doubt, though I am not going to state positively that such will be the case, still there are strong likelihoods that the indications give such a probability, that it will give you a warning of its approach. At thirty-six, if the time of birth is given correct, there is indications of a likelihood that you will fall upon some other misfortune. I am not prepared to state positively that such will be the case, but I think you will have a misfortune, though I don't think it would be of a very afflictive nature. There is at that time a circumstance of an unfriendly nature, though it may not happen to yourself, it might denote that your brother will get sick. There is another evil condition about this time which I will examine still further. I see that there is indications of a likelihood that there is a probability of your having something amiss by a partner. If something of a favorable nature does not interpose, which is not unlikely, though I may be mistaken, and will not say positively. You will be lucky, however, after that, and many of your evils will gradually begin to recline, as it were. There is reason to believe that the significators denote that in the course of your future life you will sometimes be thrown in with men who you will think is your friends, but who will prove to be your enemy. This I will not say positively, for I may be mistaken, which I think I am not, but if the time of birth is correct, you are an individual as gives likelihoods that such might be the case. 
For more than an hour had the inquirer been edified and instructed by these solid chunks of wisdom, which, it will be remembered, were not delivered off-hand, but were carefully ciphered out by elaborate calculations on the slate aforesaid. Lucid and elegant as was the language, and interesting as was the matter of these oracular communications, he felt it to be his duty to interrupt them for a time and change the subject to a theme in which he felt a nearer interest. Accordingly he asked the musty seer about his prospects of future wedded bliss. This was a subject of so great importance that all the other calculations had to be erased from the slate. This little operation was accomplished in the manner of the schoolboys who hain't got any sponge, and the dirty hand plied briskly for a minute between the juicy mouth and the dingy slate, and became a shade grimier by this cleanly process. Then a new horoscope was drawn with more signs of the zodiac than ever, and in due time the result was thus announced. I shall now endeavor to give you a description of the sort of person you might be most likeliest to marry. There is indications that your wife might be respectable. The significators do not denote that there is a likelihood that you might marry a very old woman. She would be as likely to have fair hair and blue eyes as anything else, nor would she be likely to be very much too tall, and I don't imagine you are an individual that might be likely to marry a woman who was very short. She may not be very old, but I do not think that the indications point her out as being likely to be a child. In fact, I think it possible that she may be of the ordinary age, though I do not wish to be understood as being positive on all these points, for I may be mistaken, though I think you will find that there is a likelihood that these things may be so. You will be married twice, and I think you are an individual that would be likely to have children. Six children, I think, there is indications that you may be likely to have. The significators point out one very evil condition, and I think I may say that I'm quite sure, I'm positive that you will separate from your first wife. No, I will not say that yours is a quarrelsome nature, but the significators look bad. Things is worse, in fact, than I told you of, and now I look again and am sure you are prepared. I will say that there cannot be a doubt that you will peace on your first wife. It cannot be any other way. There is no mistake. It is so. It must be true. The fact is this, and thus I tell you, you will peace on your first wife. And, my young friend, I will advise you, in case your married future is unhappy, and you do find it necessary to give peace on to your consort, do not tell anybody of your intentions. Do not let it be known, and you must do it in such a way as not to be suspected, or people will think hard of you, and there may be trouble. This was a touch of wisdom for which Johann was not prepared, so he snatched his hat and hastily left the sepulchral premises, conscious of his inability to receive another such a chunk without being completely floored. He now expresses the opinion that Dr. Wilson wanted to get the job of pisoning his first wife, and that he would have done it with pleasure at less than the market price. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Gives a history of how Mrs. Hayes, the clairvoyant of number 176 Grand Street, does the conjuring trick. Chapter 8 Mrs. Hayes, a clairvoyant, number 176 Grand Street There are a dozen or more of these clairvoyants in the city who profess to cure diseases and to work other wonders by the aid of their so-called wonderful power. As their mode of proceeding is very much the same in all cases, a description of one or two will give an idea of the whole. Their principal business is to prescribe for bodily ills, and did they confine themselves to this alone, they would not be legitimate subjects of mention in this book. But, in addition to their medical practice, they also tell about absent friends, tell whether projected business undertakings will fall out well or ill, whether contemplated marriages will be prosperous or otherwise, whether a person will be lucky in life, whether his children will be happy, and, in short, they do pretty much the regular fortune-telling routine whenever the questions of the customer lead that way. The theory, as given by them, of a clairvoyant diagnosis of a malady is this, that the clairvoyant, 
when thrown by mesmeric influence into the trance state, is enabled to see into the body of the patient and discern what organs, if any, are deranged, and in what manner, or to ascertain precisely the nature of the morbific condition of the body, and having thus discovered what part of the vital mechanism is out of order, they are able, they argue, to prescribe the best means for restoring the apparatus to a normal state. There are many thousands of persons who believe this stuff, and endanger their lives and health by trusting to these empirics. Several of the most popular of them have as many patients as they can attend to, and are rapidly amassing fortunes. Most of them have a superficial knowledge of medicine, and are thus enabled to do, with a certain amount of impunity, many dark deeds. It is reported of more than one of these women that she has done as many deeds of child murder as did even the notorious Madame Rustel. In this regard, they are among the most dangerous and criminal of all the witches. The individual visited Mrs. Hayes, who is one of the most ignorant of the whole lot, and Mrs. Seymour, who is one of the most intelligent of all. He sets down the particulars of his visit to the former in the words following. How the individual sees a clairvoyant, how he pays a dollar, and what he gets for his money. Not all the sorcery of all the sorcerers, not all the necromancy of all the necromancers, not all conjurations of all masculine conjurers, not all the magic of male magicians, not all the charming of all the charmers, charm they never so wisely, could have induced Johann to ever more place the slightest trust in a wizard, or repose in any wonder-worker of the bearded sex the merest trifle of faith, even the most infinitesimal trituration of the homeopathicist grain. The single dose he had received from the renowned Dr. Wilson was quite enough, and had satisfied all his longings for wisdom of that sort. Besides, his coming events cast such peculiar and very unpleasant shadows before, that he preferred to keep out of the grim presence of such shady men, and for all after time to bask him only in the sunshine of smiling women. Pease on his first wife, would he? Well, he could have taken that pease on with tolerable composure from the lips of lovely woman, but to receive it from the mumbling mouth of a skinny old man was too much to accept without diverse rebellious grins. A peach-cheeked witch, a cherry-lipped conjuress, a Circe with only enough charms to make a respectable photograph, might with impunity have called him a counterfeiter, or a horse-thief, or even a thimble-rigger, or might have told him that he would, upon opportunity, garrote his grandmother for the small price of seventy cents and her snuff-box, or that he was in the habit of attending funerals to pick the pockets of the mourners, and of going to church that he might steal the pennies from the poor-box. All this would he have borne uncomplainingly from a woman. But these unpalatable statements from one of the masculine gender would be most tolerable and not to be endured. He felt that if he had not rushed incontinently from the presence of that underground star-gazer, Dr. Wilson, he must either have punched that respected person's venerated head, or have laughed in his honored face. In either case, he would, of course, have roused the extensive ire of that potent worthy, and have been at once exposed to a fire of supernatural influences that would have been probably unpleasant, to say the least. The unmusical Johann looks upon accordions as cruel instruments of refined torture, and detests them as the vilest of all created or invented things, and he had been very careful to offend none of the magic community, lest he should, by some high-pressure power of their enchanted spells, be transformed into an accordion, and be condemned to eternally have shrieking music pulled out of his bowels by unrelenting boys. Having this terrible possible doom continually before his mind's optics, he felt that it would be only the part of prudence to avoid the company of those black art professors in whose presence he could not keep all his feelings well in hand. So, no more wizards would he visit, 
but the witches should henceforth have his entire attention. It is a fortunate circumstance that there are no other men than the aforesaid Dr. Wilson in the witch business in New York, so that there would be no temptation to break this resolve, and he probably would not be troubled to keep it. There is one breed of the modern witch that pretends to a sort of superiority in blood and manners, and those who practice this peculiar branch of the business put on certain aristocratic airs and utterly refuse to consort with those of another stamp. They disdain the title of astrologers or astrologists, as most of them phrase it, and in their advertisements utterly repudiate the idea that they are fortune-tellers. These are the clairvoyants, who do business by means of certain select mummeries of their own, and who make a great deal of money in their trade. There are a great number of these in the city, so many indeed that the business is overdone, and the price of retail clairvoyance has come materially down. The same dose of this article, that formerly cost five dollars, may now be had for fifty cents, and the quality is not deteriorated, but is quite as good now as it ever was. To one of these supernatural women did the hero resolve to pay his next visit, and he selected the abode of Mrs. Hayes of 176 Grand Street for his initiatory consolation. With a mysterious psychological phenomena denominated by those who profess to know them best, clairvoyant manifestations, Johann had nothing to do, and was content, as every one of the uninitiated must perforce be, to accept the say-so of the spiritualistic journals, that there are such phenomena, and that they are unexplained and mysterious. No outside unbelievers in spiritualism and the kindred arts may ever know anything of clairvoyant developments and demonstrations, save such one-sided varnish statements as the journals that deal in that sort of commodities choose to lay before the world. Every man must be spiritually wound up to concert pitch, before he is in a condition to receive the highest revelations of the clairvoyant speculators. So that, whether the clairvoyance that is sold for money be a spurious, or a superfine article, few can tell. Certain it is, that it is the same sort of stuff that has ever been retailed to the public under the name of clairvoyance, ever since the discovery of that remunerative humbug. It is more than likely that the twaddle of Mrs. Hayes, Mrs. Seymour, and the rest of the fortune-telling crew would be repudiated by Andrew Jackson Davis and the rest of the spiritualistic first choppers. But it is none the less true that these gifted women sell their pretended knowledge of spirits and spiritual persons and things, with as much pretentiousness to unerring truth as that veritable seer himself, and at a much lower price. The clairvoyant department of modern witchcraft is necessarily carried on by a partnership, and one which is not identical with a legendary league with the devil. Two visible persons constitute the firm, for it takes a double team to do the work, and if the amiable gentleman just referred to makes a third in the concern, he is a silent partner who merely furnishes the capital, while his name is not known in the business. The whole theory of clairvoyance as applied to fortune-telling and other branches of cheap necromancy seems to be somewhat like this. A strong-minded person, generally a man with a physique like a center-market butcher-boy, obtains by some means possession of an extra soul or two, or spirit, or whatever else that intangible thing may be called. These spirits are always second-rate articles, not good enough to be put into vigorous and strong bodies, and which have been, therefore, hastily cased up in an inferior kind of human frame as a sort of makeshift for men and women. Your professional clairvoyant is always, both as to soul and body, a botched-up job that nature ought to be ashamed of, and probably is, if she'd own up. The senior partner of the clairvoyant fortune-telling firm, the strong-minded one, according to their professions, has the arbitrary control of the cast-off souls that animate these refuse bodies. By what spiritual hocus-pocus this is managed is not known to those outside the trade. 
He uses their half-baked spirits at his will and makes his living by farming them out to do dirty jobs for the paying public. He disconnects them from their mortal vehicles and sends them on errands in the spirit land in behalf of his customers, looking up their absent friends, both in and out of the body, telling of their health and prosperity if they are still alive, and picking up little bits of scandal about their angels if they are dead. The senior partner also sends his abject two and six penny souls to explore the bodies of his sick customers and examine their internal machinery, point out any little defects or disarrangements, and suggest the proper remedies therefor, and in short, to do whatever other dirty work the customer may choose to pay for. The senior partner, of course, pockets all the money, merely keeping the mortal tenement in which the working partner dwells in a good state of repair in consideration of services rendered. Such a partnership is the one of Mr. and Mrs. Hayes, whose place of business is advertised every day in the morning papers in the words following. Clairvoyance. Astonishing cures and great discoveries daily made by Mrs. Hayes that superior and wonderful clairvoyant. All diseases discovered and cured, if curable. Unerring advice given respecting persons in business, absent friends, etc. Satisfactory examinations given in all cases, or no charge made. Residence, 176 Grant Street, New York. Johann, whose general health was excellent, and whose internal apparatus was all right so far as heard from, had therefore no occasion to be astonishingly cured, or to have any great discoveries made in him by Mrs. Hayes. Still, he was desirous of a little unerring advice about absent friends, etc., from that superior and wonderful clairvoyant. Besides, it was barely possible that in the person of the superior and wonderful Mrs. Hayes, he might find the bride for whom he pined. With hope slightly renewed within his speculative breast, he set off joyfully for the designated domicile, which he achieved in the due course of travel. The house, number 176 Grand Street, is a brick two-story dwelling, of a dingy drab color, as though it had been steeped in a Quaker atmosphere, and had there imbibed its color, which had since been overlaid with world's people's dirt. The door was opened by Mrs. Hayes in person, her body, on this occasion, being sent with her spirit to do a bit of drudgery. She is a woman of the most abject and cringing manner imaginable, a female counterpart to Uriah Heep, with an unknown multiplication of that vermicular gentleman's writhings. She wore no hoops, she would have squirmed herself out of them in an instant. Her dress was fastened securely on, with numerous visible hooks and eyes and pins and strings, in spite of which precautions her visitor expected to see her worm out of it before she got upstairs, and would scarcely have been astonished to see her jerk her skeleton out of her skin and complete her errand in her bones. With a propitiating bow, whose intense servility would have become Mr. Sampson Brass in the day of his discomfiture, she asked her customer into the house, cringingly preceding him upstairs, deferentially placed a chair, and abjectly departed into an inner room, pausing at the door to execute an obsequious wriggle, and to once more humble herself in the dust, of which there was plenty, before her astonished visitor. The reception room to which she led him is an apartment of moderate size, from the front windows of which the beholder may regale his eyes with a comprehensive view of Centre Market and its charming surroundings. Mott and Mulberry Streets lie just beyond, and the tombs are visible in the dim distance. The room was furnished with a superfluity of gaudy furniture, and sofas, tables, chairs, and pictures crowded and elbowed each other showing plainly that the upholstery of a couple at least of parlors had been there compressed into a bedroom. From the inner room came a great sound, made up of so many household ingredients as to defy accurate analysis, but the crying of babies, the frizzling of cooking meat, the scraping of saucepans, and the sound of somebody scolding everybody else predominated. 
the voyager was unprepared for any mr hayes having taken it for granted that the misses of the superior and wonderful clairvoyant did not imply a husband but was merely assumed because it looks more dignified in the advertisement but there was a mr hayes and presently the door opened and that worthy appeared he was surrounded by an atmosphere of fried onions and the fragrant and greasy perspiration in his face seemed to have been distilled from that favorite vegetable mr hayes is a tall fierce sharp-spoken man of manners so very rough and bearish that his wife and children quailed when he spoke as if they expected an instant blow we don't know that it ever will be possible for a man to garrote his guardian angel for the sake of her golden crown but the idea occurred to johann that if that amiable feat is ever accomplished it will be by such another man as this he seemed as unable to speak a kind or gentle word as to pull his boots off over his ears he is an englishman and speaks with a most intolerable cockney accent moderating his harsh tones until they were almost as pleasant as the threatenings of an ill-natured bulldog and addressing his auditor he growled out the following specimen of delectable english there is lots of folks goin round town pretendin to do clairvoyance and to cure sick folks and to tell fortunes and businesses and journeys and stole property but we ain't none of them people we only do this for the sake of doin good and we don't want to do nothin that will make any trouble we used to tell things about stole property and about family troubles and so we sometimes used to get folks into musses but we don't do nothin of that kind now if your business is about any kind of muss and trouble in your family we don't want nothin to do with it sometimes folks that has quarrelled their wives away come to us and wants us to get them back again but we don't do nothin of that sort we can tell em if their wives are well or if they are sick and all about what ails em and so we can about any people that has gone off anywhere and them's what we call absent friends so if you've got any trouble with your wife we can't do nothin for you the lovelorn visitor had no wives a fact known to the reader already and when he does accumulate a helpmeet he sincerely trusts she may not be so unruly as to require the interference of outsiders to preserve harmony in the family he expressed himself to that effect and added that his business was to find out about the well-being of some friends in minnesota and to ascertain particulars about some other trifles necessary to his peace of mind hereupon mr hayes with a growl like a sulky rhinoceros opened a door which cut off the pot and kettle babble of the other room and commanded his wife to come and that estimable lady who was evidently in a state of excellent subordination instantly writhed herself into the room she sat down in an armchair and began to evolve a most remarkable series of inane smiles each one of which began somewhere down her throat rose to her mouth by jerks and finally faded away at the top of her head and the tips of her ears it was a purely spasmodic thing of disagreeable habit without a particle of geniality or feeling about it while this curious process was going on the doctor had drawn down the window shades thus darkening the room and now approached for the purpose of unhooking from its earthly tabernacle the soul that was to step up to minnesota and bring back word to his customer how all the folks got along this he accomplished by a few mysterious mesmeric passes and when the trance was induced and the spirit had so to speak tucked its breeches into its boots ready for the muddy journey he placed in the hand of johann that of the corpus which still remained in the armchair and said to the disembodied spirit now i want you to go with this gentleman to brooklyn and take a fair start from there and then go where he tells you to and tell him what things there is there that you see having delivered this injunction in a tone so indescribably savage that he had better a thousand times have struck her in the face this amiable animal retired to the babel taking with him the fried onion atmosphere then the woman in the chair began to speak in a style the most disagreeable and affected that anybody ever listened to it was more like the sickening gibberish that nurses call baby talk 
than anything else in the world. She spoke with a detestable whine, and pronounced each syllable of every word separately, as if she feared a two-syllable word might choke her. Sick at the stomach as was her visitor, at the whole babyish performance, he so far controlled his qualms as to note down the words hereunder written. Whoever has heard this woman in a professional way can testify to the verbatim truth of this sketch. There is water that we must cross. We must go in a boat, mustn't we? Now we're in a boat, and oh, I see so many putty things, men and dogs and ships and things going up and down, such beautiful things I have never seen before. Now we are across the river, and now we must get on the car, mustn't we? What car must we get on? Oh, I see it now, the yellow car. Now we are going along, and I can see. Oh, what a pretty dress in that store. Oh, what real nice candy that is. I wish I had some, don't you? Now we're at the house. Is it the one on the corner, or the next one to it? Or is it the brick house with the green blinds? No, the wood one with green blinds. So it is, but I didn't be here before ever in my life. Now we will go into the house. I see a carpet there and some chairs, and some. Oh, what a pretty picture! and what a nice fire. I see a lady of very pretty appearance. She is a young lady. She has got blue eyes. She is standing sideways, so I can't see nothing of her, but one side of her face. There is also an elderly lady, but I can't see much of her. They appear to be going on a journey. Shall I go with them? Yes, well, I will. Now we are on the water, and oh, what a pretty boat. Now we are getting off the boat. I didn't never be here before. Now we are on a railroad. I never seen this railroad before, but oh, what a pretty baby. Now we go along, 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 and now we are at the depot. I didn't ever be here either. There is a river here, and a mill, and a... Oh, what a pretty cow! Somebody is going to milk the cow. There is a town here. It seems as if I did be here before. Yes, I am sure. Oh, what a pretty little carriage! And what a pretty dog! Yes, I am sure I seen this town before. But these railroads didn't be here then. By this time, the travelers were supposed to have reached St. Paul, and the reliable clairvoyant then proceeded to describe that interesting young city, and in the course of her speech made more improvements there than will be accomplished in reality in less than a year or two, certainly. Among other things, Mrs. Hayes described, as at present existing in St. Paul, two colleges, a city hall built of white marble, a locomotive factory, and a place where they were building seven ocean steamers. She then, when she arrived at the house, in the course of her mesmeric journey, where the people concerning whom Johann had inquired were supposed to be at that present domiciled, proceeded to give descriptions of those whom she saw there, of the looks of the country and of the house and such descriptions, as much like the truth as a ton of tea-rail is like a boiled custard. By asking leading questions, the seeker after clairvoyant knowledge got some very original information. He only began this course after he found that she, if left to herself, could describe nothing, and could utter no speech more coherent or sensible than that already set down as coming from her illustrious lips. In fact, the policy of the clairvoyant witch, in every case, is to wait for leading questions from the anxious inquirer, so that the answers may be framed to suit the exigencies of the case. 
Johann was not slow to perceive this, and by way of testing the science, or rather art, of clairvoyance, he put a series of questions which established the following interesting facts, all of which were positively averred to be true by Mrs. Hayes, that superior and wonderful clairvoyant. Minnesota Territory is a small town, situated 911 miles southeast of the mouth of the Mississippi River. Its officers are a chief cook and 23 high privates, besides the younger brother of Shakespeare, who is the mayor of the territory, and whose principal business is to keep the American flag at half-mast, upside down. When this last important information had been elicited, Johann, who thought he had got the worth of his money, recalled Dr. Hayes, who reappeared, surrounded by the same old atmosphere of the same old onions. To him the customer resigned the hand of the twaddling adult baby, who had held his hand for an hour and a half, paid his dollar, and then prepared to depart. The soul of the woman then returned from its long journey, and was locked up in its squirming body by the doctor, ready to serve future customers at one dollar a head. She didn't seem glad to get her soul back again, there probably not being enough to give her any great joy, after she had got it. Johann turned moodily away, feeling that the conjuress, his future bride, the renovator of his broken fortunes, and the ready relief to his present necessities, was as far distant as ever. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Tells all about Mrs. Seymour, the clairvoyant, of number 110 Spring Street, and what she had to say. Chapter 9. Mrs. Seymour, clairvoyant, number 110 Spring Street. This woman is at the same time one of the most pretentious and most clever of the clairvoyants, and she does a very large business. Most of her customers come for medical advice, although, in accordance with her printed announcement, she is willing to talk about absent friends and whatever other business the client may choose to pay for. One branch of the clairvoyant trade, which formerly brought as much money to their pockets as any other department of their business, was the finding lost or stolen property, and giving directions for the detection of the thieves. This specialty has, however, been pretty much abandoned of late by nearly all of them, in consequence of law proceedings against certain ones of the sisterhood, which have in three or four instances been commenced by parties who have been wrongfully accused of theft through the agency of the clairvoyant impostors. Several suits have been instituted against them for defamation of character, and they have been made to smart so severely that they are now all very careful about accusing persons of crimes. As an evidence of the implicit faith put in these people by their dupes, it may be mentioned that many applications have been made to Judge Welsh of this city and to the other judges for warrants of arrest against respectable persons, for theft the only grounds of suspicion against them being that some clairvoyant had said that the property had been stolen by a person of such and such a height with hair and eyes of this or that color, and that the suspected person happened to answer the description. Of course, all such applications for legal process have been refused by the magistrates, and the applicants dismissed with a severe rebuke. Mrs. Seymour has an intimate friend of Mrs. Cunningham of the Burdell murder notoriety, and was a witness in that memorable trial. The cash customer had an interview with this woman, which he thus describes. Another clairvoyant, who is not much in particular, if a man be desirous of knowing what sort of a moral character he bears in the spirit world, and what style of society his disembodied soul will circulate in, or if he desires to know the particulars of the after-death behavior of any of his acquaintances, of course he will find it to his interest to marry a medium of average respectability, and in good practice, and so save the expense of frequent consultations. The rapping and table-tipping communications from the spirit world are hardly satisfactory. 
It is, very likely, pleasant for a man to be on speaking terms with his bedroom furniture, to spend an agreeable hour occasionally in conversation with his wash-hand stand, to enjoy a spirited argument with his bedstead and rocking-chair, or to receive now and then a confidential communication from his boot-jack. But on the whole, these upholstery dialogues do not satisfy the yearnings of the soul after the infinite. The powers of speech of a wash-hand stand are circumscribed. Bedsteads and rocking-chairs are seldom equal to sustained conversation, and the most talkative boot-jack has not a sufficient command of language to make itself agreeable for any great length of time. The logic of a poker may sometimes be convincing, but it is not generally agreeable, and the rhetoric of uneducated coal-scuttles is hardly elegant enough to pass the criticism of a refined taste. It is therefore much more satisfactory, as well as economical, for a person who desires to enjoy his daily chat with the spirits, to get a speaking medium to translate the eloquence of all parties and make the thing pleasant. Even then, confidential communications must be very guarded, and on this account the person who invents some means by which every man can be his own medium will win an equal immortality with the author of that invaluable book, every man his own washerwoman. Johann had been thinking over the spiritual subject, of course with a view to profitable matrimony, for he thought he could manage to turn an intimacy with the spirits to good pecuniary account, and inveigle those incorporeal gentlemen into doing something for those of their friends who are yet bothered with bodies. He knew that there are in New York plenty of spiritualists in such constant communication with their acquaintances on the other side of Jordan, that they know the bill of fare with which those seventh heaveners are served every day, and whenever their jolly ghost ships sit down to a pleasant game of whist, they send word to their earthly relatives by medium, every fresh deal, what the new trump is, who hold the honors, and how the game stands generally. So close a familiarity with superior beings as this could be easily turned to a practical account and made to pay handsomely by a spiritualist with a utilitarian turn of mind. If he could but get his spirits into proper subjection, how useful would they not be in the patent medicine business, in the way of inventing new remedies? How invaluable would they be to an editor? In fact, how particularly useful in almost any kind of business? But his great plan was to train a corps of light-footed and gentle ghosts to carry news. They would, of course, beat locomotives, carrier pigeons, and electric telegraphs out of sight. Seas, mountains, and such trifling obstacles would be no hindrance to them, and the associated press, to say nothing of the board of brokers, would pay handsomely for their services. Of course, a ghost with any pretensions to speed, would bring us detailed news from London in half an hour or so, without putting himself out of breath in the least, thus beating the telegraph by a length. And so Johann, fully determined on his promising scheme, began to cast about him for a medium who was acquainted in the spirit's fear, to introduce him to some of the eligible ghosts. He knew that most of the clairvoyant women are mediums, and thought very naturally that women who already earned their living by clairvoyance would be the very ones to enter heart and soul with him into his spiritualistic scheme. Yes, he would marry a medium, and if she was a professional clairvoyant, so much the better. His bow would have another string. In his search for a witch-wife, he would not have been justified in interfering at all with a clairvoyance, had it not been for the fact that they mix a little witchcraft with their regular business. Their ostensible trade is to diagnose and prescribe for different varieties of internal disease, and so this particular branch of humbug would not have come within the scope of the voyager's investigations, were it not that several of these practitioners advertise to tell the past, present, and future, describe the future husband or wife, mark out correctly the exact course of future life, give unerring advice about business, absent friends, etc. All this had too strong a savor of witchcraft to be ignored, and accordingly Johann set forth on his journey to visit another of these mysteriously clear-sighted persons, 
keeping in view all the time the probabilities of her being an A1 spiritual medium, and the very person whose aid would be invaluable in his new journalistic enterprise. Mrs. Seymour of No. 110 Spring Street was the person towards whose house the cash customer bent his steps after reading the subjoined advertisement of her powers and capabilities. Clairvoyance, Mrs. Seymour, 110 Spring Street, a few doors west of Broadway, the most successful medical and business clairvoyant in America. All diseases discovered and cured, if curable, unerring advice on business, absent friends, etc., and satisfaction in all cases or no charge made. The clairvoyant branch of the fortune-telling business seems to require a certain amount of respectability in its practices, and they sneer at the grosser deceptions of the more vulgar of the necromantic trade. They keep aloof from the greasier sisters of the profession, and they feel it due to the dignity of their station to reject the cards, the magic mirrors, the bibles and keys, the mysterious pebbles, and the other tricks which do well enough for twenty-five-cent customers to sojourn in reputable streets, in respectable houses, and to have clean faces when visitors come in. There are, it is true, clairvoyants in the city who live wretchedly in miserable cellars, whose garments and very hair are populated with various specimens of animated nature, and whose bodies are so filthy that the beholder wonders why the spirits, which are so often disconnected from them and sent on far-off missions, do not avail themselves of the leave of absence to desert for ever such unsavory corporeal habitations. But the majority of these persons prefer parlors to basements, and make up the difference in expenses by double charging their customers. Many of them, as before stated, combine a little spiritualism of the other sort with a clairvoyance, and they can all go into a trance on short notice and rhapsodize with all the fervor, if not the eloquence, of Mrs. Cora Hatch. They can all do the table-tipping trick, and are up to more rappings than the Rochester Fox girls ever thought of. For these several reasons, therefore, Mrs. Seymour would be a wife worth having, or at least so thought Johann as he pondered these truths, and arranged in his mind his plan of attack on the affections of that susceptible lady. The house number 110 Spring Street, occupied by Mrs. Seymour for business purposes, is not more seedy in appearance than the majority of halfway decent tenant houses, which all have a decrepit look after they are four or five years old, as though youthful dissipations had made them weak in the joints. From appearances, Mrs. Seymour's house had been more than commonly rakish in its juvenility, but it still had that look of better days departed which, in the human kind, is peculiar to decayed ministers of the gospel. It is a house where a man on a small salary would apply for cheap board. Hither the inquirer repaired, and shamefacedly knocked at the door, and was admitted by a frowsy, coarse, plump, semi-respectable girl, who would have been the better for a washing. She opened the door, and the customer entered the reception room, and had ample time before the appearance of the mistress to take an observation. The parlor was neatly, though rather scantily, furnished, with a rigid economy in the article of chairs. The apartment communicated by folding doors with another room, whence could be heard an iron noise as of someone scraping a saucepan with a kitchen spoon. The frowsy girl disappeared into the retired spot, and in about the space of time that would be occupied by an enterprising woman in rolling down her sleeves, taking off her apron, and washing her hands, the door opened, and Mrs. Seymour presented herself. She was a frigid-looking woman, of about thirty-five years of age, with dark hair and eyes, projecting lips and heavy chin, and was of medium height and size. Her appearance was perhaps ladylike, her movements slow and well-considered. She was perfectly self-possessed and calculating, and appeared to cherish no dissatisfaction with herself. Her demeanor, on the whole, was repelling and chilly, and impressed her visitor very much as if someone had slipped a lump of ice down his back and made him sit on it till it melted. She regarded him with a look of professional suspicion, 
cast her eye round the room with a quick glance, which instantly inventoried everything therein contained, as though to assure herself of the safety of any small articles which might be scattered about, and then seated herself with an air of preparedness, as if she was perfectly on guard and not to be taken by surprise by anything that might occur. She volunteered a frozen remark or two about the state of the weather, and then subsided into silence, evidently waiting to hear the object of the visit. Her appearance and demeanor had instantly frozen out the voyager's mind all thoughts of marriage. He would as soon have wedded an iceberg, or have taken to his heart of hearts a thermometer with its mercury frozen solid. All he could do was to buy a dollar's worth of her clairvoyance and then get out. As soon, therefore, as the first chill had passed off, and he had thawed out a few words for immediate use, he asked for a little of that commodity. When, as he announced, that he desired to know about the present well or ill of some absent friends, and that clairvoyance was the branch of her business, which would on this occasion be called into requisition, she rose from her seat, walked to the door, never taking her eyes from the hands and pockets of her customer, and called to some one to come in. In obedience to the summons, the frowsy girl entered. This latter individual, since her first appearance, had taken off her apron and pinned some kind of a collar around her neck, but had not yet found time to comb her hair, which was exceedingly demonstrative and forced itself upon attention. Mrs. Seymour seated herself in a rocking chair and closed her eyes. The plump girl stood behind her and pressed her thumbs firmly upon the temples of Mrs. Seymour for about two minutes, during which time this latter lady lost every instant something of life and animation, until at last she froze up entirely. Then the frowsy girl made one or two mysteriously mesmeric passes over the sleeping beauty from her head to her feet, to fix her in the iceberg state. Then, placing the hand of Mrs. Seymour in the palm of the customer, she left the room. The worst of it was that Mrs. Seymour's hand is not an agreeable one to hold. It is cold and flabby, and not suggestive of vitality. Her face, too, had become pallid and corpse-like, and her thin blue lips were not pleasant to regard. Johann was puzzled. He didn't know what to do with a flabby hand and how he was to get any information about absent friends from a fast-asleep woman he did not, as yet, exactly comprehend. At this juncture the lips asked, Where am I to go to? The sitter suppressed a sulfurous reply and substituted, To Minnesota. Thereupon, without any more definite direction as to what part of that rather extensive territory she was expected to visit, she sent her spirit off, and immediately uttered these words. I see two old people, two very old people. One is a man, and one is a woman. One of them has been very sick of bilious fever, but is now better, and will soon be quite well again. I can't tell exactly how these people look, except that they are very old, and both are very gray. They may be husband and wife. I think they are, they are both sitting down now. I also see two young people. One of them is a male and the other a female. The male I do not perceive very plainly, and I cannot make out much about him. He seems to be standing up and looking very sad, but I can't tell you a great deal about him. The female I can see much better, and can make out more about. She is tall, and she has dark hair, she appears to be connected in some way to the old people, but I do not think she is related to the young man, though I cannot exactly make out. She is a very agreeable-looking female, rather pretty, I should say, if not positively handsome. She has straight hair and does not wear curls. She is standing up now, and appears to be talking to the young man, who has his back partly turned toward her. I don't quite make out what they are saying. She has had a very severe attack of sickness, but has nearly or quite recovered. She is not, however, what I should call a healthy female, and she will soon have another fit of sickness, which will be worse than the first, and will bring her very low indeed, very near to death. But she will not die then, 
though she is not what I should call a long-lived person. She will certainly die in six or eight years. What disease she will die of I cannot just make out, but it will not be of a lingering character. It will carry her off suddenly. These people are all very anxious about you, as if you was one of their family. They have not heard from you lately, and are looking daily for intelligence from you. They have written to you twice within three months. One of the letters got to this city. A man took it out of the mail. I don't know where he took it out, and I can't exactly describe the man, but a man took it out of the mail. These people are not satisfied to live where they are now. They are discontented with the country and will return here in the spring. They are talking about it now. They would like to come back this winter, but circumstances are so that they cannot. You may be sure, however, that you will see them here in the spring. There is no doubt of it. They will come here in the spring. The other letter that I told you of they had written has got here safe and is now in the post office. You will find it there if you inquire. You will be sure to get it as soon as you go down to the office. This was delivered in a very jerky manner, with occasional twitchings of the face and violent claspings of the hand, which her visitor retained, although it gave him a cold sweat to do it. Johann, who has friends in Minnesota, and whose questions were therefore all in good faith, tried to get the sleeping female to descend a little more to particulars, to describe individuals or localities minutely enough to be recognized if the descriptions approached the truth. But Mrs. Seymour was not to be caught in this manner. She invariably dodged the question, and dealt only in the most vague and uncertain generalities, giving no description of persons or things that might not have applied with equal accuracy to a hundred other persons or things in that or any other locality. Her assertions concerning the persons supposed to be her customer's friends did not approach the truth in any one particular, nor was there the slightest shadow of even probability in any single statement she uttered. She is not, however, a woman to lack customers so long as there remain in the world fools of either sex. When the inquirer had concluded his questioning, he was somewhat at a loss how to awake the woman from her trance, but she solved that little difficulty herself by opening her eyes, as if she had been wide awake all the time, and calling for the beauteous maiden of the snarly hair, who accordingly appeared, and made a few mysterious mesmeric passes lengthwise of her sleeping mistress, and awoke her to the necessity of dunning her visitor, which she did instantly and with a relish. He paid the demanded dollar and departed. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Describes Madame Carzo, the Brazilian astrologist of number 151 Bowery, and gives all the romantic adventures of the individual with that gay southern American naiad. Chapter 10. Madame Carzo, the Brazilian Astrologist, Number 151 Bowery. The illustrious lady who was the subject of the present chapter came to the city of New York in 1856, and at once took lodgings and began business in the fortune-telling way. She did well, pecuniarily speaking, for a time, but the details of a visit to her having been published at length in one of the daily journals, she at once retired from the business, and subsided into private life. She is not now extant as a witch, and it is not impossible that she is earning an honester living in other ways. The newspaper article that convinced her of the error of her ways, and induced her to give up fortune-telling, is the subjoining chapter by the individual. He meets a Yankee Brazilian. She is not ill-looking, etc. Whether the budding beauties of maidenhood are inconsistent with the orgies of witchcraft, whether there be an irreconcilable antagonism between youth and loveliness, and the unknown mysteries of the black art, is a vexed question of some interest. Can't a woman be supposed to indulge in a little devilment before her hair turns gray and her teeth fall out? And is it impossible for her to have reliable and trustworthy dealings with old scratch until she is wrinkled and withered? That's what I want to know. 
and I am very naturally urged to the inquiry by the observation that every professional witch in New York calls herself a madam. There is not a miss, or a mademoiselle, in the whole batch. They all make a pretense of being widows, or wives at the very least, as if a certain amount of matrimonial tribulation was indispensable to their accomplishment in the arts of sorcery and magic. The only exception to this rule is found in the person of a female calling herself the gypsy girl, who is otherwheres mentioned, and in her case the several agencies of nature, rum, and smallpox have made her so strikingly ugly that old age could not add a single other trait of repulsiveness to her excruciating features. Now this is all a sad mistake. Let some young and undeniably pretty girl go into the business and she'd soon get a run of exclusive customers who would stand any price and pay without grumbling. If the original Satan should refuse to recognize her eligibility, and should decline to furnish her with the requisite quantity of diabolic knowledge to set her up in business, she should easily find an opposition devil who would provide her stock in trade, and possibly at something less than the usual rates. I'll be bound that Lucifer doesn't monopolize the whole trade in witchcraft, and pocket all the profits himself. For if some of the numerous clerks in his employ haven't yet learned the trick of stealing the stock and selling it at a reduced price, then the young gentlemen of our earthly mercantile houses are a good deal up to snuffer than the virtuous demons of Mr. Satan's establishment. This last-named dealer generally demands the soul of the contracting party in return for the powers and privileges conferred, and in very many cases he must get decidedly the worst of the bargain, for some of his precious adopted children never had soul enough to pay for the ink to sign it away with. But there is no doubt, in case a brisk competition should arise for customers, that some of his cashiers and head clerks would contrive to undersell him even at this price. The person who is so very anxious to effect this desirable consummation, and to bring on a crop of young and pretty witches to supersede the grizzled ones of this present generation, was Johann, who had of late been getting rather sick of the madams, and would prefer, if possible, to have the rest of his fortunes told by ladies of tenderer age and greater inexperience in the ways of the world. However, he was not the man to be deterred, in his pursuit of wisdom, by the age and ugliness, gray hairs, wrinkles, false teeth, no teeth, dirt, ignorance, and imbecility he had encountered, and he was determined to go on to the very end, and see if these are the sum total of modern witchcraft. And then Duns came o'er the spirit of his dream, and fond visions of sundry small debts, paid by magic and a wife, as soon as he should succeed in finding the wife who had the magic, floated across his hard-up brain, and encouraged him to perseverance in his matrimonial quest. And when he had won that invaluable lady, he would stuff his mattress with receipted bills, and cram his pillow with cancelled notes, lie down to pleasant dreams, and awake to ready cash. Sweet thought! So he made ready to visit the humble abode of Madame Carzo, the Brazilian astrologist, number 151, Bowery. To say that he discovered in this lady the ideal of his search, that he found her handsome, intelligent, learned in the stars, and thoroughly posted in the other branches of her trade, would be to anticipate. Suffice to say that boa constrictors, half-naked savages, dye-woods, Jesuits' bark, cockatoos, scorpions, and ring-tailed monkeys are not, as he had hitherto supposed, the only contributions to the happiness of mankind afforded by South America. For the province of Brazil grows fortune-tellers of a very superior quality as to the respectability and neatness of appearance. A Brazilian witch was something new, and without stopping to inquire how she had strayed so far away from home, he immediately argued that the single fact was decidedly in her favor. Thus ran the logic. If there be any diabolism in modern witchcraft, the practicers thereof who have received their education in tropical latitudes ought to be the most worthy of credence and belief, 
inasmuch as the temperature of their places of residence seems to afford a supposition that they live nearer headquarters and are therefore most likely to receive information by the shortest routes by the time he arrived at the spot where the great astrologist condescended to abide he had by this course of reasoning convinced himself that he ought to place implicit confidence in any revelations of the future made by the mysterious woman who advertised herself and her calling daily in the papers as follows madame carzo the gifted brazilian astrologist tells the fate of every person who visits her with wonderful accuracy about love marriage business property losses things stolen luck in lotteries absent friends at number one five one bowery corner of broom the south american lady had located her mysterious self in a fragrant spot the corner of bowery and broom street and vicinity seems to have some kind of constitutional disorder and it relieves itself by a cutaneous eruption of low rum shops and pustulous beer saloons which always look as if they ought to be squeezed and rubbed with ointment of red lead to an observing person it appears as if the city wanted to scratch itself in that particular part to relieve the local irritation and then ought for the sake of its general health to take a large dose of brimstone immediately afterward the liquors sold at these places are those pure and healthful beverages warranted to kill at forty rods and are the very drinks with which a convivial but revengeful man would wish to regale his friend against whom he held a secret grudge why madame carzo had chosen this particular locality does not appear perhaps because the liquor was cheap and the rent low certain it is that there she sat at a window overlooking the bowery in full view of all the pedestrians in the street and the passengers in the fourth avenue railroad madame carzo was doubtless deeply attached to her old brazilian home and loved to surround herself with circumstances and things that would constantly and vividly recall pleasant memories of her southern country cherishing probably kindly and regretful remembrances of the harmless reptiles of her own brazilian forests she had taken up her abode in the very thick of the bowery bar-rooms as the only things afforded by our frigid climate at all approaching in life-destroying malignity the speedier venoms to which she had been accustomed in her delightful southern home first-rate facilities for drugging a man into a state of crazy madness are offered at the bar across the way he may swill himself into a condition of beastly stupidity with lager beer from next door below he may be pleasantly poisoned by degrees with the drugged alcohol in various forms which is sold next door above or he may be more speedily disposed of with a couple of doses of doctored whiskey from the festering den just round the corner lucrezia borgia was a novice a mere babe in toxicology new york wholesale liquor dealers would teach her the alphabet in the fine art of slow poisoning she would no longer need the subtle chemistry of the borgias she could learn of them to poison wholesale and to do the work by labor-saving machinery johann resolved that if he should marry the astrologist he would move out of the neighborhood and take a house in a cleaner part of the city for he felt that if he had to do even the courting here he would have to fumigate himself after every visit to his lady love as though he had just come out of a yellow fever ship he knew that if he should chance to meet the health officer in the street after a two hours stay in that locality that trusty official would from the unhealthy smell of his coat quarantine him for forty days and put him up to his neck in a barrel of chloride of lime every morning but a full-fledged cupid is a plucky animal and not easily killed by anything no more tangible than smell and the particular cupid that had possession of the voyager's heart came of a long-suffering breed and was equal to almost any emergency so as johann did not feel his ardent passion die or even turn sick at the stomach he thought he could manage to get through if he couldn't get along any other way he could fill his pockets with brimstone matches and his boots full of blue vitriol or he could carry a bunch of chinese firecrackers in his hat 
and touched them off on the sly whenever he felt himself in need of a healthy smell. Then he could wash himself all over in lime water and drink a quart or so of some liquid disinfectant every time he came away. So he went ahead. Madame Carzo, the Brazilian interpreter of Yankee fate and fortunes, lives in the third story of the house, number 151 Bowery, with her sister, a girl of about fifteen years of age. The two occupy themselves with plain sewing, except when the madam is overhauling the future, and taking a look at the hereafter of some anxious inquirer, who pays her as much for the reliable information she imparts in three minutes, as she would charge him for making three shirts. The inquirer gave his customary modest ring at the door, and was admitted with as little question as if he had been the taxes, the croton water, or the gas. Up the two flights of stairs walked the gentleman, in the pursuit of witchcraft, gave a bashful knock at the door, at the side of which was painted on a small bit of pasteboard, Madame Carzo, repentant of his temerity before the echo of the knock had died away, but was admitted into the room before his repentance had time to develop itself into running away. A shabby-looking girl, with her hair in as much confusion as if the city had contracted to keep it straight, with one earring in her ear, and the other on the table, with her shoes down at the heel, her dress unhooked behind, and her breastpin wrong side up, was the model young woman who had answered the knock. She had evidently been engaged in an animated single combat with another young woman of about the same quality of age, who was seated on a low stool in the corner, for she instantly renewed hostilities by stabbing her antagonist in the arm with a needle, tapping her on the head with a thimble, and kicking her pincushion under the table, so she could not recover it without crawling on her hands and knees. On a small sofa or lounge at the side of the room was a quantity of what ladies call work, thrown down in a great hurry, with a needle yet sticking in it, and the scissors and the beeswax, and the measuring tape and the bodkin half concealed inside, as if the knock at the door had startled the needlewoman, and she had flown to parts unknown. It was undoubtedly Madame Carzo herself, who had so unceremoniously deserted her colors and her weapons, and Johann looked at the needle with veneration, viewed the thimble with respect, and regarded the beeswax and the bodkin with concentrated awe. A small cooking-stove was in the side of the room, and immediately over it was a picture of St. Andrew, in such a position that he could smell all the dinners. A number of other pictures of Roman Catholic subjects were neatly framed and hanging against the wall. St. Somebody, taking his ease on an X-shaped cross, St. Somebody Else, comfortably cooking on a gridiron, and St. Somebody, different from either of these, impaled on a spear like a bug in an entomological museum. There was also an atrocious colored print labeled Millard Fillmore, which, if it at all resembled that venerated gentleman, must have been taken when he had the measles, complicated with the mumps and toothache, and was attired in a sky-blue coat, a red cravat, yellow vest, and butternut-colored pantaloons. The room was neatly furnished, with carpet, table, chairs, cheap mirror, and a lounge. While the visitor was taking this observation, the two young ladies before mentioned had continued to spar after a feminine fashion, and had finished about three rounds. The model, who had answered the bell, had got the other one, who was black-haired and vicious, under the table, and was following up her advantage by sticking a bodkin into the tender places on her feet and ankles. When the model had at length thoroughly subjugated and subdued the black-haired one, and reduced her to a state of passive misery, she turned to her visitor with an amiable smile, and asked him if he desired to see the madam. Receiving an affirmative reply, she gave a sly kick to her fallen foe, stepped on her toes under pretense of moving away a chair, and then disappeared into another room to inform Madame Carzo that visitors and dollars were awaiting her respectful consideration in the anteroom. The gifted Brazilian astrologist regarded the suggestion with a favorable eye, for the model soon reappeared and showed the searcher after hidden knowledge into a bedroom nearly dark wherein were several dresses hanging on the wall, a bed, two chairs, a table, 
and Madame Carzo. The light was so arranged as to fall directly in the face of the stranger, while the countenance of the Madame was, to a certain extent, hidden in shadow. Johann, nevertheless, in spite of this disadvantage, by careful observation, is enabled to give a tolerably accurate description of Madame Carzo as follows. She is a tall, comely-looking woman, with unusually large black eyes, clear complexion, dark hair worn a la Jenny Lind, a small hand, clean, and with the nails trimmed, and she has a low, sweet voice. Her dress was ladylike, being a neat half-mourning plaid, with a plain linen collar at the neck, turned smoothly over. Altogether, Madame Carzo, the Brazilian astrologist, who speaks without a symptom of foreign accent, impressed her customer as being a transplanted Yankee schoolma'am, with shrewdness enough to see that while civilization and enlightenment would only pay her twenty dollars a month, and superstition and ignorance would give her twice that sum in a week, she couldn't, of course, afford to live in a civilized and enlightened neighborhood, and depend exclusively on civilization and enlightenment for a living. And Johann was smitten. He had found her, and if his fortune was propitious, he would yet win and wed the Brazilian astrologist, and she should have the honor of paying his debt and earning his bread and butter. But he would make no advances yet for fear of accidents. He would not commit himself until he had called upon the rest of the witches on his list, to see if, perchance, he might not find one more eligible. If not, then by all means Madame Carzo should be the chosen one. The first thing, evidently, was to ascertain her proficiency in the magic arts. The sorceress and the anxious inquirer seated themselves face to face, and the following dialogue ensued. Do you wish to consult me, sir? Yes. My terms are a dollar for gentlemen. The expected dollar was handed over, when the acute Yankeeism of the Brazilian lady blazed out brilliantly for she instantly produced a Thompson's banknote detector from under a pillow, and a one-dollar note, issued by the President and Directors of the Quinnipiac Bank of Connecticut, underwent a severe scrutiny. At last, the genuineness of the bill and the solvency of the bank were certified to the Madam's satisfaction. In his oracular pamphlet by Thompson, with a P, and Madam Carzo was evidently satisfied that her customer didn't mean to swindle her, but was good for small debts not exceeding one dollar each. Accordingly, she took his left hand, regarded it for some time, apparently delighted with his model symmetry, but at last so far conquered her silent admiration as to speak and say, You were born under two planets, Moon and Mars. Moon brings you a great deal of trouble in the early part of your life. Moon has occasioned a great deal of anxiety to your parents on your account. Moon made you liable to accidents and misfortunes while you was a boy, and Moon will give you great trouble until you arrive at middle age. You were born, I should say, across the water, and you will die across the water in a city, but not a great city. You are, I should say, now far away from that city, and from your home and parents and friends, who are, I should say, all now far across that water. You will be sure, however, I should say, for to see them all before you die, and to die in the city that I told you of. Your line of life runs to sixty. You will, I should say, live to be sixty, but not much after. Moon will cause you much trouble for many years, but you will be certain for to succeed well in the end, I should say. You will be certain for to have final success, and to conquer every obstacle, in spite of Moon, I should say. Incensed as was Johann at the moon, for thus unjustifiably interfering with his prospects and meddling with his private affairs, he still admired the more profitable science of the wonderful lady, whose acquirements in magic had given her so intimate an acquaintance with moon, as to enable her to tell so exactly the plans and intentions of that unruly and adverse planet. He mastered his indignation, and listened attentively to the sequel. On the small stand were two packs of cards of different sizes, and a volume of Byron. Madame Carzo took up one pack of the cards, presented them to the young man, 
waited for them to be cut three times, after which she said, You face up a good fortune, I should say. You have had trouble, but can now, I should say, see the end of it. You face up money, which is coming to you from over the water, I should say, and you will be sure for to get it before a great while. You will never have much money from relations or friends, though you will, I should say, perhaps have some, but though you will handle a great deal of money in your lifetime, you will make the most of it yourself, I should say. You will not, however, I should say, ever be able for to become very rich, for you will never be able for to keep money, although you will have the handling of a great deal in your life. No, I am certain that you will never be rich. Here Johann remembered the malicious influence of Moon upon his fortunes, and as he clenched his fists, felt as if he would like to get at the man who resides in that ill-conditioned planet, and have a backhold wrestle with him on stony ground. But the astrologist continued thus, You face up a letter. You also face up good news, which is to come speedily, I should say. You don't face up a sick bed or a coffin, or a funeral, or any kind of immediate bad luck that I am able to see. You face up two men, one dark and one light, complexioned. You must beware of the dark-complexioned man, for I should say he will do you an injury if you allow him for to have a chance. You like to study, the kind of business you would do best in is doctor. You face up a light-complexioned lady, you will, I should say, be able to marry this lady, though a dark-complexioned man stands in the way. You must, I should say, be particularly careful to beware of the dark-complexioned man. You will be married twice. Your first wife will die, but your last wife, I should say, will be likely for to outlive you. You will have three children, which will be all, I should say, that you will be likely for to have. And this was all for the present, except that she told her visitor that he might draw thirteen cards and make a wish, which he did, and she, uncarefully examining the cards, told him that he would certainly have his wish. Cheered by this grateful promise, and bidding a mental defiance to Moon, the traveller left the room. In the reception room he found the model and the black-eyed one, just coming to time for what he should judge was the twenty-seventh round, both much damaged in the hair, but plucky to the last. Johann walked briskly away, feeling that his matrimonial prospects were brighter now than for many a day and fully determined that, if, on going further, he fared worse, he would certainly retrace his steps and wed Madame Carzo off-hand. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostics In which is set down the prophecy of Madame Leander Lent of number 163 Mulberry Street and how she promised her customer numerous wives and children. Chapter 11. Madame Leander Lent, number 163, Mulberry Street. I have before suggested, in as plain terms as the peculiar nature of the subject will allow, that these fortune-telling women, having most of them been prostitutes in their younger days, in their withered age become professional procuresses, and make a trade of the betrayal of innocence into the power of lust and lechery. This assertion is so eminently probable, that few will be inclined to dispute it, but I wish to be understood, that this is no matter of mere surmise with me, it is a proven fact. And the evidences of its truth have been gathered, not alone from the formal and hurried records of the police courts, but from the lips of certain inmates of various Magdalen asylums, who have been reclaimed from their former homes of shame, and from the mouths of other repentant women, who, under circumstances where there was no object to deceive, and at times when their hearts were full of grateful love for those who had interposed to save them from utter despair, have in all simple truthfulness and honor related their life histories, it is impossible to give even a plausible guess at the aggregate number of young women in this great city who compromise their honorable reputations in the course of a single year, but of those whose shame becomes publicly known, and especially of those who eventually enter houses of ill repute, 
the percentage whose fall was accomplished through the instrumentality more or less direct of the professional fortune tellers is astounding and a curious fact connected with this subject is that of these unfortunates who thus wander astray not one in ten but has ever after the most superstitious and implicit faith in the supernatural powers of the witch each one sees in her own case certain things that have been foretold to her by the fortune teller with such circumstantiality of time and place and which have afterwards come to pass so exactly in accordance with the prophecy that she can only account for it by ascribing supernatural prescience to the prophetess the true solution of the matter is of course that the wonderful fulfilments are achieved by means of confederacy and collusion with parties with whom the dupe is never brought in contact a common modus operandi of this sort is elsewhere described nor are the fortune tellers and the brothel keepers by any means content with playing into each other's hands in a general sort of way there are in new york several firms consisting each of a fortune teller and a mistress of a body house who have entered into a perfectly organized business partnership and who ply their fearful trade with as much zeal and enthusiasm as is ever exhibited in the active competition between rival commercial houses engaged in legitimate trade although this fact is one that cannot be substantiated by the production of any sworn documents it is as well proven by the observations of keen-eyed detectives attached to the police department and to some of the charitable institutions of this city as though attested articles of co-partnership could be exhibited with the signatures of the contracting parties attached thereto a gentleman of this city in whose word i have the most perfect confidence tells me that he once by a curious accident overheard a business consultation between the two members of such a firm and that such partnerships do exist and that by their means hundreds of ignorant young women of the lower classes are every year betrayed to their moral ruin i no more doubt than i doubt the rotundity of the earth if the illustrious woman who is the subject of the present chapter should ever surmise that the foregoing observations are intended to have a personal application to herself the author will give her much more credit for sagacity and discernment than he did for supernatural wisdom madame leander lent is one of the most shrewd unscrupulous and dirty of all the goodly sisterhood of new york witches she has so great a run of customers that her doors are often besieged by anxious inquirers as early as eight o'clock in the morning and the servant is frequently puzzled to find room and chairs to accommodate the shamefaced throng till her ladyship sees fit to get out of bed and begin the labors of the day she is then impartial in the distribution of her favors the audiences are governed by barber shop rules and the visitors are admitted to the presence in the order of their coming and any one going out forfeits his or her turn and on returning must take position at the tail end of the queue the fates show no favoritism the quarter in which madame lent has domiciled herself and her familiars is by no means in the most aristocratic part of the city mulberry is the promological name of the street and it has never been celebrated for its cleanliness or for its eligibility as a site for princely mansions in fact it has been on the whole rather neglected by that class of society who generally indulge in palatial luxuries hercules in his capacity of an amateur scavenger once attempted the cleaning of the augean stables or some such trifle and his success was trumpeted throughout the neighborhood as a triumph of ingenuity and perseverance if hercules would come to gotham and try his hand at the purgation of mulberry street our word for it he would in less than a week knock out his brains with his own club in utter despair there never yet were swine with stomachs strong enough to feed upon the garbage of its gutters or with instincts so perverted as to wallow in its filth dogs lean and wild-eyed the outcasts of the canine world sometimes driven by sore stress of hunger sneak here with drooping tails and shamed-faced looks to search for bones 
and then, wounded in their self-respect by the very act, they draw their osseous provender to a distance, and upon some sunny mud-heap dine in dainty neatness. The very pavement is broken into countless hillocks and ruts like waves, as if, in utter disgust at the place and its associations, the street was trying to roll itself away in stony billows. The shattered wrecks of worn-out drays and carts stand forsaken in the street, keeping each other dismal company, while an occasional shackly wheelbarrow makes the place look as though, after some monstrous fashion, it were a lying-in hospital for poverty-stricken vehicles, and the wheelbarrows were the newborn children decrepit even in their babyhood. The houses in this pleasant vale have a disheartened tumble-down look, and give the impression of having been originally built by apprentices out of second-hand material. They lean maliciously over the narrow sidewalks, and keep up a constant threatening of a sudden collapse and a general smash of passers-by. If the houses are not dirtier than the street, it is only because every possible element of filth enters into the latter. If they are not dirtier inside than outside, it is because superlatives have no superlative. Pawnbrokers' shops are plentiful, kept always by sharp-featured restless Jews, who watch for unwary passers-by, like unclean beasts crouching in noisome, dangerous lairs while bar-rooms yawn in frequent cellars to devour bodily the victims the Jews only rob. And this, one of the dirtiest streets in this dirty metropolis, directly opposite the English Lutheran Church of St. James, in one of the dirtiest tenant-houses in the street, abideth Madame Leander Lent, the prophetess. Why the mysterious powers didn't select an earthly representative with a more reputable dwelling-place is a mystery, but there seems to be an inseparable congeniality between prophetic knowledge and concentrated nastiness, utterly beyond all power of explanation. The madam advises the public of her business in the terms following. Astrology. Madam Leander Lent can be consulted about love, marriage, and absent friends. She tells all the events of life at number 169 Mulberry Street, first floor, back room. Ladies, twenty-five cents. Gents, fifty cents. She causes speedy marriage. Charge extra. Her customers are much more addicted to love than marriage, so that the wedlock clause cannot be relied on to bring many fish to the net. But it is supposed to give an air of respectability to the advertisement. The cash customer was, perhaps, an exception to this general rule, and feeling that he would, on the whole, rather like a speedy marriage, and wouldn't so much mind the extra charge, he went in cold blood, with this matrimonial intent, to the street, found the number, and heroically entered the house in the very face of a threatened unclean baptism from the upper windows. His timid knock at the door of the room was answered by a sturdy, come in, from the inside. Hat deferentially in hand, he modestly entered, and was received by a fat woman with a bust of proportions exceeding those of Mrs. Myrtle in Little Dorrit, and who was attired in a dress which may have been clean in the earlier years of its history, though the supposition is exceedingly apocryphal. This lady pointed to a chair, and then composedly seated herself and resumed her explorations with a comb, in the hair of a vicious boy of about three years old, the eldest scion of Madame Leander. Her enthusiasm in the cause of entomological science was too ardent to be quenched by the mere presence of an observer, and she continued to hunt her insect prey with all the ardor of a she-nimrod, and with a zeal that was rewarded by a brilliant success. The youth, over whose fertile head the game seemed to rove and range in countless numbers, was somewhat restless under the operation and oftentimes disturbed the eager sportswoman by manifesting a desire to run into the street and carry the hunting ground with him, and was as often recalled to a sense of the proprieties by a few judicious slaps, which he stoically endured, without a whimper, being evidently used to it. This feminine lover of the chase, this Diana of the fiery scalp, looked up from her occupations long enough to say to her visitor that Madame Lent, 
would soon be disengaged. Meantime, he made a careful survey of the premises. Two chairs, an old lounge, with its dingy red cover fastened on with pins, and a trunk covered with an old bit of carpet, were the accommodations for seating visitors. A cooking stove, and a suspicious-looking washbowl, which stood in the corner of the room, without a pitcher, were probably for the accommodation of the madam and the lady with a comb. On the shabby lounge sat a stolid-looking Irish girl, who was waiting her turn to have her fortune told. Having fully comprehended the room, and everything in it, the visitor turned his attention to literary pursuits, and thoroughly perused an odd copy of a newspaper that lay invitingly on the table. Visitors kept dropping in, mostly servant-appearing girls, though there were three women attired in silk and laces, who would have appeared respectable had their faces been hidden and their conversation been suppressed. The lady with the comb and the boy presently departed to some unknown region, and soon returned with a reinforcement of chairs and stools. The number of visitors increased, until besides the original stranger, nine were waiting. Among others there came, in a friendly way, but still with a sharp eye to business, a tall woman attired in a red dress and a purple bonnet, who is the keeper of a well-known house in Sullivan Street, and whose name is not strange to the police. An unrestrained business conversation ensued between her and the heroine of the comb, which must have been interesting to the female listeners. One hour and eleven minutes did the cash customer patiently wait before he was admitted to the mysterious conference with the Queen of Magic. At last, after the man who was at first closeted with her had concluded his inquiries, and the stolid Irish girl had been disposed of, the woman with a suggestive bust beckoned the long-suffering and patient man to follow, and he fearfully entered the sanctum. The room of conjuration was a closet, dark and dirty, and was lighted by one tallow candle, stuck in a scotch ale bottle. A number of shabby dresses, bony petticoats, and other mysterious articles of women's gear hung upon the walls. Two weak-kneed chairs, a tattered bit of carpet upon about two feet square of the floor, and a little table covered with greasy oilcloth, composed the furniture of the mystic cell. The cabalistic paraphernalia was limited, there being nothing but a dirty pack of double-headed cards, a small pasteboard box with some scraps of paper in it, and two kinds of powder in little bottles, like hair-oil pots. Madame Lent is a woman of medium height, about thirty-five years of age, with light gray eyes, false teeth, a head nearly bald, and hair, what there is of it, of a bright red. Her manner is hurried and confused, and she has a trick of drawing her upper lip disagreeably up under the end of her nose, which labial distortion she doubtless intends for a smile. She was robed in a bright colored plaid dress, a dirty lace collar, and a coarse woolen shawl over her shoulders. Motioning her visitor to one chair, she instantly seated herself in the other, and, without demanding pay in advance, commenced operations. She handed the cards to be cut, and then laying them out in their piles, uttered the following sentences. I see that your fortune has been, and is quite a curious one. Your cards run rather mixed up. You have been very much worried in your head. You were born under two planets, which means that you have seen a great deal of trouble in your younger days. But you are now getting over it, and your cards run to better luck. But it is rather mixed up. Your cards run to a lady. She is light-haired and blue-eyed, but she is jealous of you, for sometimes you treat her more kinder and sometimes more harsher. And just now she is in trouble, and very much mixed up about you. There is a man of black hair and eyes, a dark-complected man, who pretends to be your friend, and is very fair to your face, but you must beware of him, for he is your secret enemy, and will do you an injury if he can. He is trying to get the lady, but I don't think he'll do it, though I don't know, for the thing is so much mixed up. He has deceived you, and the lady has deceived you. They have both deceived you. But now they have got mixed up, and she turns from him with scorn, and seems to like you the best. I don't exactly see how it all is, for it seems rather mixed up like. 
You must persevere. You must coax her more. You can coax her to do anything, but you can't drive her any more than you can drive that wall. Always treat her more kinder and never more harsher, and she will soon be yours entirely. Beware of the dark-complected man. You must not talk so much and be so open in your mind, and above all don't talk so much to the dark-complected man, for he seems to worry you, and your affairs and his are all mixed up like. Here her auditor expressed a desire to know something definite and certain about his future wife, whereupon the red-haired prophetess shuffled the cards again with the following result. You will have but one more wife. She will be good and true, and will not be mixed up with any dark-complected man. She will be rich, and you will be rich, for your business cards run very smooth, but your marriage cards do not run very close to you, and you will not be married for six or eight months. You will have three children. You will see your future wife within nine hours, nine days, or nine weeks. Do not blame me if it runs into the tens, but I tell you it will fall within the nines. Another man is trying to get her away from you. He is a light-complected man. He has had some influence over her, but she now turns from him with disdain, and she will be yours, and yours only. Things are a little worried and mixed up now, but she will be yours and yours only. The light-complected man can't hurt you. I have something that I can give you that will make her love you tender and true. It will force her to do it, and she won't have no power to help herself. But you can do with her just what you please. I charge extra for that. Here was a chance to procure a love filter at a reasonable rate, and unless the dark woman kept that article ready-made and done up in packages to suit customers, he could observe the terrible ceremonies with which it was prepared, listen to the spells and incantations with an intent eye, and make mental notes of all the mighty magic. The opportunity was too good to be lost, and he at once signified his desire to try a little of the extra witchcraft, and his willingness to draw on his purse for the requisite amount of ready cash, to purchase this gratification of a laudable curiosity. Madame Lent now assumed an air of the most intense gravity, and shook into a very dirty bit of paper a little white powder from one of the pomatum pots, and a corresponding quantity of grayish powder from pot number two, and stirred them carefully together with the tip of her finger. When she had mixed them to her liking, she folded the diabolical compound in a small paper, then she prepared another mixture in the same manner, and made a pretense of adding another ingredient from a little pasteboard, which probably hadn't had anything in it for a month. Folding this also in a paper, she presented them both to her interested guest, with these directions. You must shake some of the first powder on your true love's head, or neck, or arms, if you can. But if you can't manage this, put it on her dress. The other powder you must sprinkle about your room when you go to bed tonight. This will draw her to you, and she will love you and you alone, and can't help herself. This will surely operate. If it don't, come and tell me. One more cabalistic performance, and the hocus-pocus was ended. She desired her customer to give her the first letter of his true love's name. He, unabashed by the unexpected demand, with great presence of mind, promptly invented a sweetheart on the spot, and extemporized a name for her before the question was repeated. Then the mysterious madam required his own initial, which, being obtained, she wrote the two on slips of paper, with some mystic figures appended in manner following, E. 17. M. 24. Then she shiveringly whispered, you must do as I told you with the powders before eleven o'clock to-night, for between the hours of eleven and twelve I shall boil your name and hers in herbs which will draw her to you, and she can't help herself, but will be tender and true, and will be yours and yours only. When she is drawn to you, then you must marry her. The anxious inquirer promised obedience and agreed to give the powders as per prescription before the midnight cookery should commence, paid his dollar, fifty cents for the consultation, and a like sum for the love powders, and made his exit with a comprehensive bow, which included the madam, the bony petticoats, 
the beer bottle, and the fast vanishing remains of the single tallow candle in one reverential farewell. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12 of the Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix. Wherein are inscribed all the particulars of a visit to the gypsy girl of number 207 Third Avenue, with an allusion to gin and other luxuries dear to the heart of that beautiful rover. Chapter 12 The Gypsy Girl. There is much less affection of high-flown and lofty-sounding names among the ladies of the black art mysteries than might very naturally be expected. Most of them are content with plain Madam Smith or an adorned Mrs. Jones, and the gypsy girl is almost the only exception to this rule that is to be encountered among all the fortune-tellers of the city. This arises from no poverty of invention on their part but from a sound conviction that in this case simplicity is an element of sound policy. There has been no lack of mysteriously gifted prophetesses and of astonishing star readers. There have been, I believe, within the last few years, a daughter of Saturn and a sorceress of the silver girdle, and once the queen of the seven mysteries condescended to sojourn in Gotham for five weeks but on the whole it has been found that a more modest title pays better. To be sure, the daughter of Saturn was tried for conspiring with two other persons to swindle an old and wealthy gentleman out of seventeen hundred dollars, and the queen of the seven mysteries was dispossessed by a constable for non-payment of rent, and these untoward circumstances may have acted as a modest quencher on the then growing disposition to indulge in fantastic and romantic appellations. At this present time, the gypsy girl enjoys almost a monopoly of this sort of thing, and she is by no means constant to one name, but sometimes announces herself as the gypsy woman, the gypsy palmist, and the gypsy wonder, as her whim changes. This woman has not been in New York years enough to become complicated in as many rascalities as some of her elder sisters in the mystic arts, but her surroundings are of a nature to indicate that she has not been backward in her American education on these points. She has not been remarkably successful in making money as a witch. Not having been educated among the strumpets and gamblers of the city, she lacked that extensive acquaintance on going into business that had secured for her rivals in trade such immediate success. Her fondness for gin has also proved a serious bar to her rapid advancement, and has given not a few of her customers the idea that she is not so eminently trustworthy as one having the control of the destinies of others should be. In fact, she loves her enemy, the bottle, to that extent that she has many times permitted her devotion to it to interfere seriously with her business, leading her to disappoint customers. The quality of her sober predictions is about the same as that of others in the same profession, but her intoxicated foretellings are deserving of a chapter to themselves, and they shall have it, for from force of peculiar circumstances which will be explained hereafter, the cash customer made three visits to this celebrated woman. Her first address was 207 Third Avenue, between 18th and 19th Streets. The Gypsy Girl, how romantically suggestive was this feminine phrase to the fancy of an enthusiastic reporter. Was it then indeed permitted that he should know Meg Merrilies in private life? His heart danced at the poetic possibility and his heels would have extemporized a vigorous hornpipe, but that his saltatory ardor was quenched by the depressing sturdiness of cowhide boots. With the most pleasing anticipations he perused the subjoined advertisement again and again, and looked to the happy future with a joyful hope. A wonder, the gypsy girl, if you wish to know all the secrets of your past and future life, the knowledge of which may save you years of sorrow and care, don't fail to consult the above-named palmist. Charge fifty cents. The gypsy has also on hand a secret which will enable any lady or gentleman to win or obtain the affections of the opposite sex. Charge extra. Number 207 Third Avenue, between 18th and 19th Streets. How the knowledge of all the secrets of his past life was to save him years of sorrow and care at this late day he could not exactly comprehend, and was willing to pay fifty cents for the information. And then wasn't it worth half a dollar to see a live gypsy? Of course it was. 
kettles, campfires, white tents under green trees, indigenous brown babies and exotic white ones, with a panorama of empty cradles and mourning mothers in the distance, moonlight nights, midnight foraging excursions, expeditions against impertinent gamekeepers, demonstrations against hen roosts, successful by masterly generalship and pure strategic science, and the midnight forest cookery of contraband game, surreptitious pigs and clandestine chickens, were among the romantic ideas of a delightful vagabond gypsy life that at once suggested themselves to the mind of the cash customer. He did not really expect to find the Third Avenue gypsy camped out under a bed-quilt tent in the lee of the house, or cooking her dinner in an iron pot over an outdoor fire in the back yard, but he had a vague, undefined hope that there would be some visible indications of gypsy life, if it was nothing more than the pawn tickets for stolen spoons. He thought to find at least one or two beautiful babies knocking about, decorated with coral necklaces and golden clasps, suggestive of rich parents and better days, and had firmly resolved to send the little innocents to their almshouse by way of improving their condition. Full of these romantic notions, the reporter started on his philanthropic mission, taking the preliminary precaution of leaving at home his watch and pocket-book, and carrying with him only small change enough to pay the advertised charges. In one of those three-story brick houses so abounding in this city, which seemed to have been built by the mile and cut off in slices to suit purchasers in the Third Avenue above 18th Street, dwelt at that time the gay Bohemian. The building in which she lived, though three stories in height, is very short between joints, which style of architecture makes all the rooms low and squat, as if somebody had shut the house into itself like a telescope and had never pulled it out again. Out of the chimney, which was the little end of the telescope, issued a sickly smoke, and through a door in the lower story, which was the big end thereof, was the stranger admitted by a little girl. This girl was, probably, a pure article of gypsy herself originally, but had been so much adulterated by partial civilization that she combed her hair daily and submitted to shoes and stockings without a murmur. Ragged indeed was this reclaimed wanderer, Saucy and dirty-faced was this sprouting young maiden, but she was sharp-witted, and scented money as quickly as if she had been the oldest hag of her tribe. So she asked her customer to walk upstairs, which he did. She herself went up the stairs with a skip and a whirl, showed her visitor into the grand reception room with a gyrating flourish, and disappeared in a courtesy of so many complex and dizzy rotations that she seemed to the eyes of the bewildered traveller to evaporate in a red flannel mist. As soon as she had spun herself out of sight, he recovered his presence of mind and looked about him. The romantic gypsy who sojourned here had tried to furnish her rooms like civilized people, doubtless out of respect to her many patrons. A threadbare carpet was underfoot, a little parlor stove with a little fire in it was standing on a little piece of zinc, and did its little utmost to heat the room. An uncomfortable-looking sofa, covered with shabby and faded red damask, graced one side of the apartment, and a lounge of curtailed dimensions, partially covered with shreds of turkey-red calico, adorned another side. This latter article of furniture, with its tattered cover, through which suspicious bits of curled hair peeped out, and wide crevices in its rickety frame were plainly visible, looked much too suggestive of cockroaches and other insect delicacies of the season to be an inviting place of repose. Three chairs were dispersed throughout the room, on one of which the reporter bestowed himself, and the rest of the furniture consisted of a table, so exceedingly shaky and sensitive in the joints that it might have been the grim skeleton of some former table, loosely hung together with unseen wires, and a cheap-looking glass that had suffered so serious a comminuted fracture as to be past all surgery, this was all except some little plaster images of saints, strangers to the cash customer, and a black rosary, which article would seem to show that efforts had been put forth to Christianize this nut-brown gypsy maid. A clinking of glasses was heard in the adjoining apartment. Then the door was opened with an independent flirt, and the gay bohemian appeared on the scene. If it were desired to fancy visions of enchanting loveliness, it would be necessary to insert therein other ingredients than the gypsy girl of the Third Avenue. Alone she would be insufficient, too much would be left to the imagination, 
and in any event the illusion would be too great to last long. She is of medium height, her eyes are brown and bright, and her hands are very large and red. She has no hair, but wears a scratch red wig, which gives her head a utilitarian character. Her face is deeply pitted with the smallpox, more than pitted, gullied, scarred, and seamed, as though some jealous rival had been trying to plough her complexion under. Little short light hairs are thinly scattered on her cheekbones and upper lip, and in the shadows of the little ridges that disease had left, irresistibly compelling the mind to make an absurd comparison of her face with a sterile field, and imagine that at some past day it had been spaded up to plant a beard, which had only grown in scanty patches here and there. Her nails were horny and ill-shaped, and underneath them, and at their roots, were large deposits of dirt and other fertilizing compounds, under the stimulating influence of which they had grown lank and long. Her attire was a sort of cross between the picturesque wildness of the gypsy and the more civilized and unbecoming dress of Third Avenue Christians. She was apparelled principally in a red flannel jacket and a check handkerchief, which was passed under her chin and tied on the top of her wig, where the knot looked like a blue butterfly. There was a gown, but a series of subsoiling experiments would have been necessary to determine the material and texture. The surface was palpably dirt. Accompanying her there was a strong smell of gin, and from the odor of the liquor, the visitor judged that it was a very poor article. This gay old gypsy drew a chair to the table and sat down not in a graceful and composed manner, but more as if she had been dumped from a cart. She soon partially recovered herself and straightened up slightly from the heap into which she had collapsed, and turning her head away from her customer, she elaborately remarked, Fifty cents and your left hand. The individual made a careful search for his small change, and fished out the exact amount which he promptly paid over. This delightful gypsy then took his left hand and looked at it for a minute in an imbecile kind of way, as if she didn't know exactly what to do with it, and was undecided whether it was to be made into soup, or she was to drink it immediately with warm water and a little sugar. This last impression evidently prevailed, for she tried to pour it into her apron, and only recovered from her delusion when the fingers tangled themselves up in the strings. Then a glimmering of the true state of the case seemed to dawn upon her, and she began to have a dim idea that she was expected to say something. Now the roving gypsy was not by any means intoxicated at this time. That is to say, she may have been partaking of gin, or gin and water, or may have been sucking sugar that had gin on it, or she may have been taking a little gin and peppermint for a stomach ache, or she may have been bathing her head in gin, or have been otherwise making use of that potent remedy as a medicine but she was by no means a subject for official interference in case she had wandered into the street but she was to tell the truth not in her most clear-headed condition although probably she did not see more than one cash customer sitting solemnly before her still that one was quite as many as she could well manage at that time after the signal failure of her little demonstration on the hand of her guest she by a strong effort seemed to concentrate her faculties, and after several trials she roused herself and spoke as follows, emphasizing the short words with spiteful vindictiveness, and paying the most particular attention to the improper aspiration of the H's. You are a person as has seen a great deal of diff— The gay bohemian here evidently desired to say difficulty, but the word was a sad stumbling-block, a four-syllable rock ahead, which was too much for her powers in her then exhausted state of mind. She charged on the unfortunate word boldly, however, and tried to carry it by storm, but each time was repulsed with great loss of breath. A great deal of diff, 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 diffle. It was no use, so she tried back and began again. You are a man, as has seen, a great deal of difficulty was what she said, but it didn't seem to satisfy her, so she tried again, and after a number of trials she hit a happy medium between diff and difficulty, and compromised on difficulty, which useful addition to the language she took occasion to repeat as often as possible with an air of decided triumph. You are a man as has seen a great deal of difficulty and trouble. 
I would not go to say as you have been through too much difficulty and trouble, still you have seen difficulty and trouble. If you had been a luckier man in your past life, you would not have seen so much difficulty and trouble, still you have seen difficulty and trouble. I hope you will not see so much difficulty and trouble in the future. Life, you will live long. You will live to be sixty-nine years of age, and will die of a lingering disease. You will be sick for a long time, and will not suffer much difficulty and trouble. Sixty-nine years of age you will live to be. Death, don't think of death. That is too far half of you to think of. But you will die when you are sixty-nine years of age, and you may hope to go right up to Evan, for you will have no more difficulty and trouble then. Money, you will have money, and you will have plenty of money. But you must not look for money until you have reached your middle age. A distant English relative of yours will leave you money, but you will have difficulty and trouble in getting it. Do not expect to get this money without difficulty. No, do not cherish such a hope. It will be in the hands of a man who won't answer your letters nor take notice of your applications. You will have to cross the ocean yourself. This money will be a good deal of money and will make you happy for the rest of your days. Business. You will thrive in business. You will never be unfortunate in business. You will have luck in business. You will always do a good business. May expect to make money by large speculations in business. Difficulty and trouble in business you will not know. Great troubles. You need not expect to have many great troubles, for you will not. You have had your great troubles in your early days. Sickness. You will never see no sickness. Have no fear of sickness, for you will not see none. Sickness. Do not care for it, and make your mind easy. Friends. You have got many friends, both here and elsewhere. Your friends will be happy, and you will be happy. There will be no difficulty and trouble between you. You have had trouble with your friends, but you face brighter days. Be happy. Wives. You will have but one wife. In the third month from now, you will hear from her. You will get a letter from her, and in the fourth month you will be married. She is not particularly handsome, nor she is not specially ugly. She has got blue eyes and brown hair, is particular fond of Ohm, and is now eighteen years of age. Happiness, you will be the happiest people in all the land. You can't imagine the happiness you will have. Children, you will have three children. After you are married, you will see no more difficulty and trouble. You will die in a foreign land, across the ocean, but you will die happy. Hope for happiness, and have no uneasiness. Thus prophesied the gay bohemian, the nut-brown maid, the dark-eyed oracle, the wise charmer, the female seer, the beautiful sibyl, the lovely enchantress, the romantic gypsy girl of the Third Avenue. Romance and poesy were effectually demolished by the overpowering realities of dirt, vulgarity, Cockneyism, ignorance, scratch wigs, bad English, and bad gin. Sadly, the individual walked downstairs behind the gyrating girl, who reappeared with an agile pirouette, twirled down on her toes, and opened the door with a dizzy revolution that made her look as if her head and shoulders had got into a whirlpool of petticoats and were past all hope of mortal rescue. The little chink, as of a bottle and glass, came faintly from the apartment which is the home of the gypsy, and the individual fancied that the gay bohemian had returned to her devotions. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Witches of New York by Q.K. Philander Dostix Contains a true account of the magic establishment of Mrs. Fleury of number 263 Broom Street and also shows the exact quantity of witchcraft that snuffy personage can afford for one dollar. Chapter 13. Madame Fleury, Number 263 Broom Street. From what the reader has already perused of the predictions and prophecies of these modern dealers in magic, he will hardly think them of a character to inspire any great degree of confidence in the minds of people of ordinary common sense. Still less will he be disposed to believe that merchants of credit and renown, businessmen engaged in occupations, the operations of which are presumed to be governed by the nicest mathematical calculations, 
are ever so far influenced by the miserable jargon of these fortune tellers as to seriously consult them in business matters of great importance such however is the humiliating truth there are in new york city a number of merchants bankers brokers and other persons eminent in the business world and respectable in all social relations who never make an important business move in any direction until after consultation with one or another of the witches of new york there are many who are regular periodical customers and who visit the shrine of the oracle once a month or once in six weeks as regularly as they make out their balance sheets or take an account of stock and who guide their future investments and business ventures as much by the written fifty-cent prophecy as by either of the other documents. Many country merchants have also learned this trick, and some of them are in constant correspondence with the cheap sibyls of Grand Street, and others, when they come to the city for their stock of goods for the next half-year, visit their chosen fortune-teller, and get full and explicit directions how to conduct their business for the coming six months. Of course, these proceedings are conducted with the greatest possible secrecy, and the attention of the writer was first awakened to this fact by the indiscreet boastings of certain ones of the witches themselves, who are not a little proud of their influence, and after observations afforded ample proof and corroboration of all he had been told. Great money enterprises have without doubt been seriously affected by the yea or nay of the Bible and key and perhaps the atlantic cable company would have received more hearty assistance and its stock more extensive subscriptions in wall street if certain ones of the fortune tellers had possessed more faith in its success and had so advised their patrons incredible as these statements may seem they are nevertheless true and this fact is another proof that gross superstition is not confined to the low and filthy parts of the city where rags and dirt are the universal rule but that it has likewise a thrifty growth in quarters of the town where stand the palaces of the merchant princes and in avenues where rags are almost unknown and broadcloth and gold and fine twined linen are the common wear it is said that certain counsel eminent in the learned profession of the law and that certain even of the judges of the bench have been known to consult the female practicers of the black art but the author has never been personally cognizant of a case of this kind and has no means of knowing whether the consultation was intended to benefit the lawyer or the witch whether the former desired enlightenment as to the management of some knotty professional point or whether the latter wanted legal advice as to some of the side branches of her business Mrs. Fleury, whose domicile and mode of procedure are described in this present chapter, has a large run of this sort of what may be termed respectable custom, and she does not fail to profit by it to the utmost. She came to New York from France about six or seven years ago, and at once established herself in the witch business, which she could advertise extensively in the papers, although the other branches of her profession by which she probably makes more money than by telling fortunes would by no means bear newspaper publicity what these other branches are is more explicitly stated in other chapters of this book and in fact needs to be but hinted at to be at once understood by nearly all who read madame fleury advertised the world of her arrival in america and of her supernatural powers and in a short time customers began to flock in it is now her boast that she has a respectable connection as any one in the trade, and that she has a great number of regular, reliable customers as any conjuress in America. She says that most of her regular customers visit her once in six weeks, six being with her a favorite number, and she not undertaking to guarantee her business predictions for a greater length of time. Whether she makes any discount from her ordinary prices to these regular traders she did not state, but probably witchcraft is governed by the same rule as other commodities, and comes cheaper to the wholesale dealers. Duly armed and equipped with staff and scrip, and duly fortified within, by such stimulants as the exigencies of the case seemed to demand, the cash customer set out for 263 Broom Street and after strict trial and due examination of the premises and the people he made the following report 
It was a favorite remark of a learned though mistaken philosopher of the olden time, that you can't make a whistle of a pig's tail. The philosopher died, but his saying was accepted by the world as an axiom, a bit of incontrovertible truth, eternal, godlike, fully up to par, worth a hundred percent, with no possibility of discount. Time, however, which often demonstrates the fallibility of human wisdom, has not spared even this oft-quoted adage, and now there is not a collection of curiosities in the land which lacks a pigtail whistle to proclaim in the shrillest tones the falsity of the wise man's proposition and the triumph of Yankee ingenuity. Had this same philosopher been interrogated on the subject, he would undoubtedly have announced, and with an equal show of probability on his side of the argument, that you can't make a star-reading prophetess out of a snuffy old woman. But had he lived to the present day, the cash customer would have taken great pleasure in exhibiting to him these two apparently irreconcilable characters combined in a single person, and that person, Mrs. Flurry, who pays for the daily insertion of the following advertisement in the newspapers. Astrology, Mrs. Flurry from Paris, is the most celebrated lady of the present age in telling future events true and certain. She answers questions on business, marriage, absent friends, etc., by magnetism. Office number 263, Broom Street. There is not so much of promise in this paragraph as there is in some of the more grandiloquent announcements of the older witches. Not probably that Madame Fleury is any less pretentious than they, but her knowledge of the English language is not perfect enough to enable her to give her ideas their full effect. The cash customer resolved to visit this most celebrated lady of the age, who had come all the way from Paris to tell his future events true and certain. Nothing daunted by the circumstance that she lives in the filthiest part of Broom Street, which has never been swept clean since it was a very new broom indeed. If our fancy farmers, who expend so much money upon the various foreign manures and fertilizing compounds, would but turn their eyes in the direction of Broom Street, a simple glance would convince them of the inexhaustible resources of their own country, while guano would instantly depreciate in value and the island of Ichabo not be worth a quarrel. This prolific and valuable deposit that covers Broom Street bears perennial crops. In the spring and summer, dirty-faced children and mean-looking dogs seem to spring from it spontaneously. They are succeeded during the colder weather by a crop of tumble-down barrels and cast-away broken carts while the humbler and more insignificant things, the uncared-for weeds, so to speak, of the abundant harvest, such as potato parings and fish-heads and shreds of ragged dishcloths and bits of broken crockery and old bones, are in season all the year round. In the midst of this filth, with policy shops adjacent, and pawnbrokers' offices close at hand, and rum shops convenient in the neighborhood, where the reeking streets and stagnant gutters and the heaps of decomposing garbage send up a stench so thick and heavy that it beslimes everything it touches, and makes a man feel as if he were far past the saving powers of soap and soft water, and was fast dissolving into rancid lard oil. In this congenial atmosphere flourishes the prophetess, and here is found the mansion of Mrs. Flurry, the most celebrated lady of the age in telling future events. Her mansion is not one that would be selected as a permanent residence by any one with a superabundance of cash capital, nor did it seem quite suited to the dwellings of the most celebrated lady of the present age. The house, a three-story brick, originally intended to be something above the common, has been for so many years misused and badly treated by reckless tenants that it has completely lost its good temper, as well as its good looks and is now in a perpetual state of aggravated sulkiness. It resents the presence of a stranger as an impertinent intrusion, and avenges the personality in various disagreeable ways. It twitches its rickety stairways impatiently under his feet, as if to shake him off and damage him by the fall. It viciously attempts to pinch and jam his fingers with moody dogged doors, which hold back as long as they can, and then close with a sudden snap exceedingly dangerous to the unwary. 
it tears his clothes with ambushed rusty nails and unsuspected hooks and sharp and jagged splinters it creaks its floors under his tread with a doleful whine and complains of his cruel treatment in sharp pointed many cornered tiers of plaster which it drops from the ceiling upon his head the instant he takes his hat off it yawns its wide cellar doors open like a greedy mouth evidently hoping that an unlucky step will pitch him headlong down and it conducts itself in a thousand ill-natured ways like a sulky child that has been waked up too early in the morning and not properly whipped into good behavior the individual however entered the doors unabashed by the malignant scowl which was visible all over the face of the unamiable mansion and stumbled through a narrow dirty hall up two flights of groaning stairs before he discovered any sign of the whereabouts of madame she evidently did not occupy the entire of this sulky edifice or he would have seen some of the servants or retainers who would have been only too happy to direct him to the headquarters of the sorceress but the few people he saw about the place seemed to be each one occupied with his or her own private affairs and to be too much taken up therewith to pay the slightest attention to the newcomer their attentions to each other were confined to reproaches uncomplimentary assertions and sundry maledictory remarks accompanied in case of the younger members of the various tribes with pinches pokes punches and small but frequent showers of brickbats the individual disregarded these evidences of good feeling not considering himself called upon to reply to any which were not addressed to him individually and plodded on till his roving eye rested on a tin sign on which was inscribed madame fleury room number four there were no mysterious emblems or cabalistic flourishes accompanying this simple announcement he pulled the knob and the door was instantly opened by the lady herself so quickly that the bell had no time to ring until all necessity for it was over she had evidently heard the advancing footsteps of her customer and had stood ready to pounce upon him she ushered him into the apartment where he soon recovered his self-possession and took an observation the room was a small square one shabbily furnished with very few articles of furniture and these were dimly visible through the snuffy mist which filled the apartment there was snuff everywhere there was a snuffy dust on the chairs there was a precipitate of snuff on the floor and if snuff was capable of crystallization there would undoubtedly have been stalactitic formations of snuff depending from the ceiling the madame herself was snuff-colored as if she had been boiled in a decoction of tobacco she is a frenchwoman and has had about half a century's experience of her present fleshly tabernacle which is somewhat worse for the wear although from the fossil remains of bygone beauty still visible in her ancient countenance her customer inclined to the belief that in some remote age she was comely and pleasant to the eye he founded this hypothesis upon the brown hair and hazel eyes which time has spared in respect to personal cleanliness the individual regrets to say that the madam was not in every respect what a critical observer would wish to see her hands and arms were in a condition which would naturally lead to the belief that the croton corporation had cut off the water and under each of her fingernails was a dark colored deposit which may have been snuff but looked like something dirtier she was dressed in a light striped calico dress over which was a black velvet mantle trimmed with fur and on her head was a portentous headdress which was fearfully and wonderfully made of shabby black lace her face was in the same condition as her hands and arms as was also her neck which was only visible to the upper edge of the collar-bone further deponent saith not she more nearly approached the cash customer's notion of the witch of endor than any other lady he had ever heard mentioned in polite society she at once prepared for business she seated herself behind a small stand dusty with snuff on which there were a number of little books on astrology written in french and german and as dirty and as fragrant as if they had been some kind of clumsy vegetable which had been grown in a tobacco plantation she asked her visitor if he spoke french or german to which he replied 
that had he been conversant with all the languages invented at the Babel smash-up, he would on this occasion, for particular reasons, prefer to confine himself to English. He also ventured an inquiry as to terms upon which she produced a card containing a list of her charges, printed in English, French, and German. He learned from the dingy document that the prices of telling fortunes by lines of the hand, by cards, and by the stars, varied in amount from one to five dollars. The individual concluded that one dollar's worth would suffice, and approaching the little table he announced the result of his cogitations. The enchantress, who was so saturated with snuff and tobacco that every time her customer looked her in the face he sneezed, then brought a pack of very filthy cards, which were covered over with mysterious hieroglyphs done in black paint. She asked her visitor to cut them, which he reverently, though daintily, did, whereupon she laid them on the table before her in four rows, and spoke, having previously explained that she used no witchcraft, but did all her wonders by the signs of the zodiac. The individual concentrated his attention, and listened with all his ears, while the witch of Broom Street spoke thus. I will tell you first what these cards indicate then I will look at the lines of your hand, and then I will answer three questions. Here she paused, while her agitated listener sneezed a couple times, then she resumed, speaking with a strong foreign accent. You are good disposition, having excellent memory, you don't have many enemy, but what you do is of your own sex, you are very frank person, and you was born in the sign of the crab. You have some lucky days, which are Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Whatever you do on these days is well. But you shall not wash your hair on Thursdays. If so, you will wash all your luck away. You must be very careful of fire and water, and you will be in great danger of fire and water, and you must be very careful. You may die by fire or water. I cannot say, but you must certain be very careful of fire and water. You must also be very careful of dogs very careful of dogs. You may die by a dog, but you must certain be very careful of dogs. Here she paused again, and while her visitor was meditating on the full force of what he had heard, and was inwardly resolving to go immediately home, shoot Juno, and drown her as yet unoffending but in after days dangerous to his peace of mind and the happiness of his life, pups, she prepared for the second portion of her discourse taking the individual's hand in hers, a proceeding which made him feel as if he had put his fingers into a bladder of Maccaboy, she made the following prediction. You will be the father of five children. Two of them will be boys, who will be a great comfort to you when you grow old. She spoke no good of the girls, and the customer foresaw feminine trouble in his household with those same young ladies. Having a few moments to himself before she resumed, he worked himself into a great passion with the ungrateful hussies who were about to treat their kind old father in so scandalous a manner. But presently recollecting that they were as yet in the condition of your sister Betsy Trotwood, who never was born, he felt that he was slightly premature in his wrath, so he cooled down and resolved to make the best of it with his comfortable boys. The yellow sorceress continued, Your line of life is long and you will live to a good old age. You have had much trouble in love affairs, and now your first love is entirely lost to you. You can never reclaim her, and you must never venture anything in lotteries. Whether Madame Fleury supposed that her visitor intended to spend his salary in lottery tickets in the hope of winning back his early love, or whether she supposed that the woman then exhibiting herself as Purim's gift lady was the person, is not in evidence but from the peculiar construction of her last remark, something of the kind must have been in her thoughts. She had now reached the third part of her discourse, and come to the three questions. She produced an old French Bible, dingy with age and snuff, and which she informed the observer had been in her family for three hundred years. An old iron key was tied between the leaves, with the ring part of the shank of the key projecting and the Bible was tightly bound round with many folds of black ribbon. Making her visitor hold one side of the ring of the key, while she held the other, she said, Ask your three questions, 
and if they are to be answered in the affirmative the book will turn the individual who had been much impressed by her canine observation of a few minutes before and whose thoughts were still running upon his pet juno and her six innocent offspring in a fit of absence of mind propounded this interrogatory shall i marry the person of who i am now thinking the potent enchantress repeated the question aloud in french and then with pale lips and trembling voice she addressed the book in key thus holy bible i ask you in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost will this man marry the person now in his mind then she closed her eyes for a moment placed one hand over her heart and rapidly muttered something in so low a tone that it was inaudible to her listener immediately the bible commenced to turn slowly towards her and soon had made a complete revolution thus expressing a very decided affirmative having started a matrimonial subject with so satisfactory a result her customer thought he could do no better than to follow it up and accordingly asked question number two if i marry this person will the marriage be a happy one the same answer was given in the same manner being now satisfied as to his own matrimonial prospects he concluded to ascertain those of his children and question number three was asked as follows shall i live to see my children happily married there was a long delay which was undoubtedly occasioned by the difficulty of properly providing for those refractory girls but at last there came a reluctant yes having now got all that his dollar entitled him to the customer prepared to depart the madam informed him that in a few days she would have her magic mirror from paris with which she could do new wonders and she hoped that he would soon call again adding if i was ten years younger i would not admit gentlemen but now i am old and i must End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the witches of new york by q k philander dosticks describes an interview with a colored seer mr grommer of number thirty four north second street williamsburg and what the respectable whitewasher and prophet told his visitor chapter fourteen a black prophet mr grommer number thirty four north second street williamsburg besides those who advertise in the daily journals there are many other witches in and about the city who do not deign so to inform the world of their miraculous powers either they have not full faith in their own supernatural gifts or they distrust the policy of advertising at any rate they are only known to the inquiring stranger by accidental rumors and mysterious side whisperings emanating from those credulous ones who have had ocular proof of the miracle working facility of these veiled prophets in certain of the older states of the union there cannot probably be found any country village that does not boast its old crones of fortune-telling celebrity women who are not named by the awestruck youngsters of the town but with low breath and a startled sort of look thrown backward over the shoulder every minute as if in half fear that the evil eye is even there upon them and in almost every neighborhood in any part of the country there will be one or more old women who delight in mystifying the young folks by telling fortunes in teacups by means of the ominous settling of the grounds or who sometimes even run the cards or aspire to read the fates by the portentous turning of the bible and key all these conjurations are given without money and without price in the rural districts but they sometimes work no little mischief there people do not advertise their willingness to read the fates and only exercise their gifts in that direction as a matter of friendship to certain favored ones the city and the suburbs are full of people of this kind who profess to know the gift of prophecy and of miracles but who do not make their whole living by the exercise of their supernatural powers depending in part on some popular branch of industry they differ however from their sisters of the country in this regard whenever they do consent to do a little magic for the accommodation of an anxious inquirer they are very careful to charge him a round price for it 
many of them combine fortune-telling with hard work, and do their full day's work of faithful toil at some legitimate employment, and in the evening amuse themselves with witchcraft. These are chrysalis witches, prophets in embryo, magicians in a state of apprenticeship. They are learning the trade, and as soon as they feel competent to do journey work, they drop their hard labor, and at once set up for full-fledged witches or conjurers. Mr. Gromer, the black sage of Williamsburg, and his solid, amiable wife, were in this halfway state when they were visited by the cash customer. Their fame had reached his ears by the means of some kind friends who were cognizant of his peculiar investigations at that time, and who told him of the supernatural gifts of this amiable couple. Accordingly, the individual, having made exact inquiries as to their local habitation, one fine morning set out in pursuit, and in due time made up the following report. Since that time it is reported that this worthy pair have followed the law of progression herein before hinted at, and having arrived at the fullness of all magical knowledge, have laid aside the whitewash pail and discarded the scrubbing brush, and given their time entirely to the practice of the black art. The individual beginneth his discourse thus. It is an old saying, that the devil is never so black as he is painted. What may be the precise shade of the complexion of his amiable majesty, the cash customer has no means of ascertaining to an exact nicety at this present time of writing. But he makes the positive assertion that some of the satanic human employees are so black as to need no painting of any description. Whether or not the ancient wise men from the East were swarthy skinned, he is not competent to decide, but he is able to prove by ocular demonstration to an unbelieving skeptic that some of the modern wise men are particularly dark complected. Mrs. Gromer of number 34 North 2nd Street, in the suburb of Williamsburg, is a case in point. The fame of this illustrious ebony lady had gone abroad through the land, and her skill in prophecy had been vouched for by those who professed to have personal knowledge of the truthfulness of her predictions. But an air of mystery surrounded the sable sorceress, and it was declared to be impossible to obtain a knowledge of her exact whereabouts except by a preliminary visit to a certain mysterious cave, the locality of which was accurately described. A cave? This promised well. No other witches encountered by the cash customer had he found in a cave, or in anything resembling that hollow luxury. A cave, the very word smacked of diabolism, and had the true flavor of genuine witchcraft. Our overjoyed hero thought of the witch of Vesuvius in her mountain cavern, of her lank, gray, dead hair, her livid, corpse-like skin, her stony eye, her shriveled blue lips, her hollow voice, and her threatening arm, and skinny menacing forefinger, of the red-eyed fox at her side, the crested serpent at her feet, the mystic lamp above her head, and the statue in the background, triple-headed with skulls of dog, and horse, and boar. Something of this kind he hoped to witness, in the present instance, for he argued that any sorceress who lived in a cave must surely be supplied with some more cabalistic instruments with which to work her spells than greasy playing cards or rusty brass door keys. At last, then, he had discovered something in modern witchcraft worthy the ancient romance of the name. Triumphant and overjoyed, he prepared for the visit, confident in his ability to witness any spectacle, however terrible, without flinching and in his courage to pass any ordeal, however fearful. He swallowed no counter-charms or protective potions, and did not even take the precaution to sew a horseshoe in the seat of his pantaloons. It is true he was rash, but much must be forgiven to youthful curiosity, especially when conjoined with professional ambition. The carelessness in respect to his own safety was productive of no ill effects, for he returned from his perilous excursion in every regard as good as he went. He had by this time entirely recovered from his matrimonial aspirations, and had given up all hope of a witch-wife. Still, he hoped to find in the cave 
something more worthy the ancient and honorable name of witchcraft than anything he had yet seen. Alas, for the uncertainty of mortal hopes, all is vanity, bosh, and both oration. On arriving at the enchanted spot, it soon became evident to the senses of our astonished friend that the cave was not a cavern, fit for the habitation of a powerful sorceress, but was merely a mystifying cognomen applied to a drinking saloon with a billiard-room attached, which had accommodations also for persons who wished to participate in other profane games. On entering the cave, your deluded customer saw no toothless hag with the expected witch-like surroundings, but observed only a company of men, seemingly respectable, indulging in plentiful potations of beer and certain other liquids, which appeared at the distance from which he observed them to be the popular compounds designated in the vulgar tongue as whiskey toddies. Addressing the nearest bystander, the gold individual ascertained the habitation of Mrs. Grommer, and immediately departed in search of that interesting female. The way was crooked, as all Williamsburg ways are, but after an irregular, curvilinear journey of half an hour, the anxious inquirer stood in front of the looked-for mansion. The grating of the street has left at this point a gravel bank some six or eight feet high, on the summit of which is perched the house of Mrs. Grommer, like a contented mud-turtle on a sunny stump. It is a one-story affair, with several irregular wings or additions sprouting out of it at unexpected angles, and, on the whole, it looks as if it had been originally built tall and slim, like a tallow candle, but had melted and run down into its present indescribable shape. The architect neglected to provide this beautiful edifice with a front door, and the inquirer was compelled to ascend the bank by a flight of rheumatic steps, and to make a grand detour through currant bushes, chickens, wash-tubs, rain-barrels, and colored children, irregular as to size, and variegated as to hue, to the back and only door. Here his modest rap was unanswered, and he composedly walked in, unasked, through the kitchen, and took a seat in the parlor, where he was presently discovered by the lady of the house, but not until he had time to take an accurate observation. Mrs. Grommer had, up to this time, been engaged in making a public example of certain ones of her grandchildren, who had been trespassing on the current bushes of a neighbor, and had been caught in the act. Their indulgent grandmother, being scandalized by this exhibition of youthful depravity, with a regard for the demands of strict justice that did her infinite credit, had inflicted on several of the delinquents that mild punishment known as spanking. The novelty of the sight had drawn together quite a collection of the neighbors, who signified their approval of the deed by encouraging cheers. Meantime, the individual had ample time to contemplate the inside beauties of the mansion of the sable prophet. Mrs. Grommer soon finished her athletic exercise outdoors, and came into the house to rearrange her dress and receive her company. The reception room was about ten by twelve, and so low that a tall man could not yawn in it without wrapping his head against the ceiling. In places the plaster had been displaced, and the bare lath showed through, reminding one of skeletons. The floor was dingily carpeted. A double bed occupied one side of the room, a small cooking stove stood in the middle of the floor, and had a disproportionately slim pipe issuing out of the corner, like a straw in a mint julep. Seven chairs of varied patterns, a small round table, on which lay a pack of cards, covered with a cloth, and a tumbled-down chest of drawers, completed the necessary furniture of the apartment. The ornaments are quickly enumerated. A black wooden cross hung by the windows. A few cheap and gaudy scriptural prints were fastened against the wall. A chemist's bottle, of large dimensions, and filled with a blue liquid, reposed on the chest of drawers, side by side, with a few miniature casts of lambs and dogs, and on a little shelf stood a quarter-sized plaster bust of some unknown worthy, of which the head had been knocked off and its place significantly supplied with a goose-egg. 
In a short time Mrs. Grommer emerged from an unlooked-for apartment and entered the room. She is a negress and a grandmother. Her age is sixty-five, and a brood of children, together with a swarm of the aforesaid grandchildren, reside near at hand and keep the old lady's mansion constantly besieged. As to size, she is large, apparently solid, and would struggle severely with a two-hundred-pound weight before she would acknowledge herself conquered. She was neatly attired, and, in fact, a most grateful air of cleanliness pervaded the entire establishment, and it was a refreshing contrast to most of the dens of the fairer-skinned witches heretofore encountered by the cash delegate. The sable one entered into conversation, and a few minutes were passed in cheerful chat, in the course of which she thus referred to the scapegrace husband of one of her numerous daughters. They think Anson is dead, but I can't station him dead. I think he's at sea somewhere, or in a foreign land, but I can't station him dead. He might as well be underground for all the good he is, for he is such a poor, miserable drinkin' feller that he ain't no use. But, after all, I can't run him dead. At last the object of the visit was mentioned, and to the individual's great surprise, Mrs. Grommer positively and peremptorily refused to give him the benefit of her prophetic powers. She said, It ain't no use. I never does for gentlemen. I does sometimes for ladies, but I can't do it for gentlemen. Remonstrance and entreaty were alike useless. She was immovable. At last she said she would call her old man, who could tell fortunes as well as she could. But she added, with a determined shake of the head, he'll do it, but he will charge you a dollar, and he won't do it under neither. When her hearer expressed his willingness to learn his future fate by the masculine medium, she addressed him thus, You station there, in that chair, and I'll send him. The disappointed one stationed in the designated chair, and awaited the coming of the old man. He soon appeared, and seated himself, ready to begin. Old Man Grommer is a professor of the whitewashing branch of decorative art. He occasionally relaxes his noble mind from the arduous mental labor attendant upon the successful carrying on of his regular business, and condescends to earn an easy dollar by fortune-telling. He is a shrewd-looking old man, with a dash of white blood in his composition. His hair curls tightly all over his head, but is elaborated on each side of his face into a single hard-twisted ringlet. Short, crisp whiskers, streaked with gray, encircle his face, and an imperial completes his hirsute attractions. His cheeks and forehead are marked with the smallpox. He was attired in a gray and striped dress the peculiarity of which was that the coat and vest were bound with wide stripes of black velvet. He speaks with but little of the peculiar negro dialect, except when he forgets himself for an instant, and unguardedly relapses into the old habits, which he has evidently carefully endeavored to overcome. He looked at his visitor very sharply for a minute or two, while he pretended to be abstractedly shuffling the cards, and collecting his valuable thoughts, at last he remarked, I suppose you want me to run the cards for you. The reply was in the affirmative, and the colored prophet concentrated his mind and began. Slowly he dealt the cards, and spake as follows. You don't believe in fortunes, my son, I see that. Must tell you what I see here, can't help it. If I see it in the cards, must tell you. You've had great deal trouble, my son, more coming. Can't help it must tell you. I see trouble in the cards. I see exactly what it is. Here he suddenly stopped, and resuming his guarded manner, continued, You've lost something, my son, something that you think a great deal of. Now, I don't like to tell about lost things. I's afraid I'll get myself into a snare. I'd rather not say nothing about it, for I'll get myself into trouble. His auditor here, gave him the most positive assurances that he should never be called into court to identify the thief of the missing article, and that he should be held free from all harm, whereupon he consented to impart the following information. This thing you lost is something that hangs up on a nail, something bright and round. 
You think a great deal of it, my son. When it went away, it had on a bright guard. Hasn't got a bright guard on now. Got a black guard. You see, I knows all about de article, my son, and I can tell you exactly where de article is. But I's rather not tell you about it, my son. Fraid I'll run myself into a snare. That's the truth, my son. Rather no say nothing about de article. Being again assured of safety, he went on. Well, my son, I'll tell you about this year thing. Has you got any boys in your employ? No. Got two girls, have you? One of dem girls is light-haired, and de other is dark. The light one is de one who comes in your room in your boarding-house every morning when you's gone away, cause you lives in a boarding-house, I sees that. Can see it in the cards, can always tell exactly. If you make a fuss about dat article, you make your landlady feel bad. You has accused somebody of taking that article, but you accused de wrong person. The light-haired girl is who's got that article. Can't help it, my son, must tell you. De light-haired girl is de person. Maybe she's put it back, my son. I'll see. Here he got the cards carefully and continued. There's trouble about that article, my son. Can't help it, must tell you. But you'll get the article, but you'll have disappointment. Whenever you see dat card, you may know there's disappointment coming. Dat card is always disappointment. Can't help it, my son. Must tell you. Here he exhibited the nine of spades, to the malignant influence of which he attributed the future woes of his hearer. When you go home, look in your bed between the mattresses, and see if the article is there, for maybe she'll put it back. If it ain't there, you must go to her and cuse her of it, cause it's in the house, and she's got it. Can't help it, my son, must tell you. It is perhaps needless to say that the customer had met with no loss of property, and that all of this was entirely gratuitous on the part of Mr. Grommer. Having, however, settled the matter to his satisfaction, that gentleman turned his attention to other things, and in the intervals of repeated shufflings and cutting of the cards, he said, There is a journey for you, son, and this journey is going to be the best that ever happened to you. But there is a little disappointment first. Can't help it, my son, must tell. Here you can see for yourself and out came the malicious nine of spades again. You will get money from beyond sea, my son. Lots of money, lots of money, my son. Here it is, you can see for yourself. And he exhibited the cheerful faces of the eight, nine, and ten of diamonds. You will have disappointment before you get this money. And up came the hateful visage of the nine of spades once more. You was born under a good star, my son, under a morning star. You was born under the planet Jupiter, my son, at twenty-eight minutes past four in the morning. Lucky star, my son, very lucky star. You are going to make a great change in your business, my son, which will be good. You will always be successful in business, but I think there is a little disappointment first. Can't help it, must tell you. Here the listener looked for the nine of spades again, but it didn't come. After a little while you turned your back on trouble. Here you can see for yourself. See, this is you. The king of clubs was the individual at that instant, and the troubles upon which he turned his back are, as nearly as he can remember, the knave of clubs, the nine of spades, and the deuce of diamonds. The sage went on, I'm coming now to your marriage. You's going to be married, but you'll have some disappointment first. Can't help it, my son, must tell you. You see, here is a dark-complected lady that you like, and she has a heart for you, but her father don't like you. He prefers a young man of lighter complexion. See, here you are, my son, this is you, and he showed the king of clubs, and this is her. The her, of whom he spoke so irreverently, was the queen of clubs. This is the heart she has for you, and he exhibited the seven of that amorous suit. This is her father, the obstinate and cruel parient here displayed was the king of spades, and this year is the young man her father likes, and he placed before the eyes of the customer a hated rival in the shape of the knave of diamonds. You see how it is, my son, there is trouble between you, can't help it. You may possibly marry the dark-complected lady yet, but you don't do it, my son, don't you do it. Now mind I tell you, don't you do it. She is not the lady for you, can't help it, must tell you. If you marry that lady, you will be sorry that you ever died to not. See, here is the knot. 
and he showed the ace of diamonds. See, this is the lady you ought to marry, and he produced the queen of diamonds, and she will be your second wife if you marry the dark-complected lady. But you'd better marry her first if you can get her, and let the dark-complected lady go for ever. That's so, my son. Now mind, I tell you. He condescended no more, and the cash customer dispersed his dollar and departed, all the grandchildren gathering on the bank to give him three cheers as a parting salute. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix How the Individual Calls on Madame Clifton of Number 185 Orchard Street and how that amiable and gifted seventh daughter of a seventh daughter prophesies his speedy death and destruction, together with all about the Chinese ruling planet charm. Chapter 15 Madame Clifton, 185 Orchard Street Perhaps there is no class of men brought constantly and prominently before the public eye that is so great a puzzle to that public as the class popularly denominated sporting men. There is not a corner on Broadway where they do not congregate, there is not a theater where they do not abound, and there is not a concert room that does not overrun with them. There is a uniformity in their appearance that makes them easily recognized, for they all affect the ultra stylish in costume, even to the extreme of light kid gloves in the street. They all have the crisp mustache, the smooth-shaven cheeks, and the same keen, ever-watchful eye, constantly on the lookout for a customer, that respectable word meaning, in their slang, a person to be victimized and swindled. Every lady who walks the street has to run the gauntlet of their insolent glances, and not unfrequently to hear their vulgar and offensive criticisms on her personal appearance and every gentleman whose business calls him into Broadway of a pleasant day, has seen these persons grouped on the corner, leisurely surveying the passers-by, or gathered into a little knot before some favorite rum shop, discussing what is, to them, the absorbing topic of the day, probably the good strike Blobsy made, fighting the tiger, the night before, the heavy run a favorite billiard-player made on a certain occasion, or the respective chances of success of the two distinguished gentlemen who may chance at that time to be in training with a view of battering each other's heads until one concedes his claim to the brutal honors of the prize ring. No gentlemen of fashion and fortune are more expensively dressed than these men. No class of people wear more finely stitched and embroidered linen, more costly broadcloth, more showy golden ornaments, or more brilliant diamonds. But for all, the man is yet to be found who has ever seen one of them put his hand or his brain to one single hour's honest work. Unsophisticated persons are often puzzled to account for the apparently irreconcilable circumstances of no work and plenty of money, and in their endeavors to invent a plausible hypothesis on the basis of honesty must ever be bewildered. The city man knows them at a glance, to be sporting men. This phrase is a particularly comprehensive one. The sporting man is a gambler by profession, and therefore a swindler by necessity, for an honest gambler would fill a niche in the scale of created beings that has never yet been occupied. In addition to this, nearly every sporting man is a thief whenever opportunity offers. They probably would not pick a sober man's pocket, or knock him down at night, and take his watch and money, for the risk of detection would be too great. But they are kept from downright stealing by no excess of virtue. These remarks apply to the sporting men, by profession, to those plausible gallow-birds who have no other ostensible means of getting a living. There are many men who sometimes spend an hour or two at a faro-table, or who occasionally pass an evening in gambling at some other game, who do all fairly, and are above all suspicion of foul play. These persons are of course plundered by sharpers who surround them, and are called good fellows because they submit to their losses without grumbling. The sporting men, 
all have mistresses on whom they sometimes rely for funds whenever an unlucky hit or a bad streak of luck has run their own purses low it is not part of the present purpose of this book to give particulars as to who and what their mistresses are further than to state that at least one or two of the witches described herein officiate in that capacity it is true that the most of them are not of a style to tempt the lust of any man but there are certain exceptions to the general rule and in one or two instances the individual found the fortune teller to be comely and pleasant to the eye as these women generally have plenty of money they are very eligible partners for gamblers who are liable to as many reverses as ever mr micawber encountered and who when once down might remain perpetually floored did not some friend set them on their financial feet again and this is one of the duties of the moneyed mistress when the sporting man is in funds no one is more recklessly extravagant than he and no one cuts a greater dash than his lady love if he chooses so to do but when the cards run cross and the purse is empty it devolves upon her to furnish the capital to start in the world again the fact is well known to those who have taken the trouble to inquire into the subject that several of the more fashionable fortune tellers of the city sustain this sort of illicit relation to certain sporting men whose faces a man may see perhaps half a dozen times in the course of a lounge up and down broadway of a pleasant afternoon madame clifton is on the whole a comely woman and does a good business but of course no sane person will think of applying these remarks personally to that respected matron the individual paid a lengthened visit to madame clifton and his remarks are recorded below because he met a sleek close-shaved finely mustached gentleman coming away from the door he was of course not justified in believing that the said gentleman belonged to the establishment of course not the female professors of the black art hitherto visited by the cash customer had not impressed him with a profound belief in their supernatural powers he was anxious and was awakened to inquiry but he still had doubts and there was great danger of his backsliding if there wasn't something immediately done for him he had been greatly disappointed by the absence from the domiciles of these good ladies of all the traditional necromantic implements and tools his disposition to adhere to the modern witch faith would have been greatly strengthened by the sight of a skull and crossbones a tame snake or a little devil in a bottle would have fixed his wavering belief and his conversion would have been thoroughly assured by the timely exhibition of a broomstick on which he could see the saddle marks none of these things had as yet been forthcoming and the anxious inquirer mourning the departure of all the romance of the art of witchcraft was fast sinking into a state of incurable scepticism on the subject of even its utility in the degenerate hands of modern practitioners hope had not however entirely deserted his heart but still retained her fable position in the bottom of his chest near that important viscous and he therefore courageously continued his pursuit of witchcraft under difficulties his next visit was to orchard street and he was induced to expect favorable results by the encouraging and positive assertion which concludes the subjoined advertisement that madame clifton is no humbug an astrologist that beats the world and five thousand dollars reward is offered to pay any person who can surpass her in giving correct statements on past present and future events particularly absent friends losses lawsuits etc she also gives lucky numbers she surpasses any person that has ever visited our city she is also making great cures all persons who are afflicted with consumption liver complaint scrofula rheumatism or any other lingering disease would do well to call and see this wonderful and natural gifted lady and you will not go away dissatisfied n b madame clifton is no humbug call and satisfy yourselves residence number one eighty five orchard street between houston and stanton 
although orchard street is by no means so objectionable a thoroughfare as human ingenuity might make it still in spite of its pleasant sounding name it is not altogether a vernal paradise if there ever was any fitness in the name it must have been many years ago and the ancient orchard bears now no fruit but low brick houses of assorted sizes and colors seedy and in appearance semi-respectable occasionally a blacksmith's shop a paint room or a livery stable lower and meaner and more contracted than their neighbors look as if they never got ripe but had shriveled and dropped off before their time the street is in a state of perennial bloom with half-built dwellings like gaudy scarlet blossoms which are ripened into tenements by the fostering care of masons and carpenters with the most industrious forcing and buds of buildings are scattered in every direction in the shape of mortar beds and piles of brick and lumber waiting the due time for their architectural sprouting the house of madame clifton is of moderate growth being but two stories high it has a red brick front and green window blinds and is so ingeniously grafted to its nearest neighbor that some little care is necessary to determine which is the parent stock it presents a fair outside is but little damaged by age or weather and is seemingly in a state of good repair a neat-looking colored girl answered the bell and showing our reporter into the parlor asked his business and if he knew madame clifton's terms now when it is understood that fortune-telling is by no means the only or the most lucrative part of madame clifton's business it will be perceived that this inquiry had a peculiar significance having the fear of libel suits before his eyes the individual cannot state in precise and plain terms the exact nature of the business which the colored girl evidently thought had brought him there he will content himself with delicately insinuating that if his errand had been of the nature insinuated by that female delegate from africa there would have been a lady in the case fortunately the cash customer had erred not thus but he made known to the colored lady his simple business learning that he only wanted to have his fortune told by the madam and had no occasion to test her skill in the more extensive departments of her profession the girl appeared to be satisfied of the responsibility of her visitor for that limited amount and departed to inform her mistress the customer took an observation the room was a neatly furnished parlor a little flashy perhaps in the article of mirrors but the sofas chairs carpet etc were plain and not offensive to good taste a piano was in the room but it was closed and its tone and quality are unknown one curious article for a parlor ornament stood in the corner of the room it was the huge signboard of a perfumery store and bore in large letters the name of a dealer in sweet scented merchandise blazoned thereon in all the finery of dutch metal and bronze this conspicuous article though mysterious and unaccountable was not cabalistic and savored not of witchcraft presently the quiet colored girl returned and in a low voice and with a subdued well-trained manner invited her visitor to follow her meekly obeying he was led up two flights of respectable stairs into a room wherein there was nothing mysterious nor was there anything particularly suggestive except a large glass case filled with a stock of perfumery what was the propriety of so many bottles filled with perfumes and medicines did not at first appear but the assortment of imprisoned odors and liquid drugs and the store sign downstairs and madame clifton and a certain perfumery store in broadway and the proprietor thereof so tangled themselves together in the brain of the inquirer that he has never since that time been able to disconnect one from the other upon a small stand there were two packs of cards the one an ordinary playing pack and the other what are known sometimes as fortune-telling cards the devices on these latter differed materially from those in ordinary use there were no plain cards 
every one was ornamented with some kind of a significant design. There were pictures of women, of men, of ships and raging seas, of hearses and sickbeds, and shrouds and coffins, and corpses and graves and tombstones, and similar cheerful objects. And there were squares and circles, and hands with scales, and hands with daggers, and hands sticking through clouds, and purses of money, and carriages, and moons, and suns, and serpents, and hearts, and cupids, and eyes, and rays of light coming from nowhere, and shining on nothing, and Herculeses with big clubs and big arms, bigger than the clubs, and big legs, bigger than both together, and swords and spears and sundials, and many other designs equally intelligible and portentous. Soon the madam appeared, and the attention of the individual was immediately diverted from surrounding objects, and riveted on the incomprehensible woman, who was no humbug, and who, according to her own opinion of herself, would have exactly realized Mr. Edmund Sparkler's idea of a demmed fine woman with no by God nonsense about her. On the first glance, Madame Clifton is what would be called fine-looking, but she does not analyze well. She is of medium height, aged about thirty-five years, with very light, piercing blue eyes and very black hair, one little lock of which is precisely twisted into a very elaborate little curl, which rests in the middle of her forehead between her eyes, as if to keep those quarrelsome orbs apart. Her eyebrows are unusually heavy, so much so as to give a curious menacing look to the upper part of her face, which disagreeable expression is intensified by the extreme paleness of her countenance. Her dress was unassuming, neat and tasteful, save in the one article of jewelry, of which she wore as much as if the stock in trade at the Broadway perfumery store had been pearls and gold and diamonds, instead of perfumes and essences. Her deportment was self-possessed and ladylike, that is, if an expression of tireless watchfulness and unsleeping suspicion are consistent with refined and easy manners. She never took her steel-blue eyes from her visitor's face. She did not for an instant relax her confident smile. She did not speak but in the lowest, softest tones. But her auditor felt every instant more convinced that the voice was the falsest voice he had ever heard, the smile the falsest smile he ever saw, and that the cold, piercing eye alone was true, and that was only true because no art could conceal its calculating glitter. If one could imagine a smiling cat, Madame Clifton would resemble that cat more than any one thing in the world. Neat and precise in her outward appearance, not a fold of her garments, not a thread of lace or ribbon, not a hair of her head, but was exactly smooth and orderly, and in its exact place. Not a glance of her eye that was not watchful and suspicious, not a tone or word that was not treacherous in sound, not a movement of body or of limb that was not soft and stealthy. Her feline resemblances developed themselves more and more every instant, until at last the individual came to regard her as some kind of dangerous animal in a state of temporary and perfidious repose. And this impression deepened every instant, so much so that when the small soft hand was laid in his, he almost expected to see the sharp cloths unsheathe themselves from the velvet fingertips and fasten in his flesh. The language she used, when freed from the technical phrases of her trade, was good enough for every day, and she did not distinguish herself by any specialty of bad English. She asked her customer, with her most insinuating smile, if he would have her run the cards for him, and on receiving an affirmative answer, she took the pack of playing cards into her velvet hands, pawed them dexterously over a few times to shuffle them, laid them in three rows with the faces upward, and softly purred the following words. I am uncertain whether to run you a club or a diamond, for I do not exactly see how it is, but I will run you a club first, and if you find that it does not tell your past history, please to mention the fact to me, and I will then run you a diamond. 
She then proceeded to mention a number of fictitious events, which she asserted had happened in the past life of her listener, but that individual, who did not find that her revelations agreed with his own knowledge of his former history, tremblingly informed her of that fact, and she then, with a the most vicious contraction of the overhanging eyebrows, broke short the thread of her fanciful story, and proceeded to run him a diamond. She evidently was determined to make the diamond come nearer the truth, to which end she dexterously strove, by a series of very sharp cross-questionings, to elicit some circumstance of his early history, on which she might enlarge, or to get some clue to his present circumstances, and hopes and aspirations, that she might find some peg on which to hang a prediction with an appearance of probability. The individual, with humiliation, he confesses it, was a bachelor. His heart had proved unsusceptible, and Cupid had hitherto failed to hit him. On this occasion he proved characteristically unimpressible, and the insinuating smile, the inquiring look, and the winning manner all failed to effect and he remained pertinaciously non-committal. Finding this to be the case, the feline madam changed her tactics, and, as if despite her intractable customer, began to prophesy innumerable ills and evils for him. She apparently strove to mitigate, in some degree, the sting of her predictions by an increased softness of manner, which was only a more cat-like demeanor than ever. She spoke as follows, the cold eye growing more cruel, and the wicked smile more treacherous every instant. First, however, came this guileful question, which was but a declaration of war under a flag of truce. You do not want me to flatter you, do you? You want me to tell you exactly what I see in the cards, do you not? The customer stated that he was able to bear at least the recital of his future adversity, even if, when the reality came, he should be utterly smashed. Whereupon she proceeded, I see here a great disappointment. You will be disappointed in business, and the disappointment will be very bitter and hard to bear. But that is not all, nor the worst, by any means. I see a burial. It may be only a death of one of your dearest friends, or some near relative such as your sister, but I see that you yourself are weak in the chest and lungs. You are impulsive, proud, ambitious, and quick-tempered, which last quality tends much to aggravate any diseases of the chest, and I fear that the burial may be your own. Your disease is serious. You cannot live long, I think. I do not think you will live a year. In fact, there is the strongest probability that you will die before nine months. I think you will certainly die before nine months, but if you survive, it will only be after a most severe and painful illness, in the course of which you will undergo the extreme of human suffering. I see that you love a light-complexioned lady, but her friends object to her marriage with you, and are doing all they can to prevent it. A dark-complexioned man is trying to get her away from you. You must beware of him, or he will do you great injury for he has both the will and the power. He has already deceived and injured you, and will do so again even more deeply than he has yet. I see a journey, trouble, and misfortune, grief, sorrow, heavy loss, and heaviness of heart. I again tell you that you will die before nine months, but if you chance to survive, it will only be to encounter perpetual crosses and misfortunes. I might, if I was disposed to flatter you and give you false hopes, tell you that you will be lucky, fortunate in business, that you will get the lady, and I might promise you all sorts of good luck. But I don't want to flatter you. It would be much more agreeable to me to tell you a good life, for it sometimes pains me more than I can tell you to read bad lives to people. And I feel it very deeply. But I assure you, that I never saw anybody's cards run as badly as do yours. I never saw so many losses and crosses, and so much trouble and misfortune in anybody's cards in my whole life. Even if you outlive the nine months, you will have the greatest trouble in getting the lady, and will always have bad luck. 
She then tried, by means of the cards, to spell out the inquirer's name, but failed utterly, not getting a single letter right. Then she recommenced, and threatened him with so much bad luck, that he began almost to fear that he would break his leg before he rose from his chair, or would instantly fall down in a fit, and be carried off to die at the hospital. She told him that his lucky days were the first, fifth, seventeenth, twenty-seventh, and twenty-ninth of every month. Then perceiving that his feelings were deeply moved by the intractability of the cruel parents of the light-complexioned lady, and the black look of things generally, she slightly relented, and went on to say, If you will put your trust in me, and take my advice as a friend, I can sell you something that will surely secure you the lady, and thwart all your enemies. It is not for my interest that I tell you this, for upon my honor I make only five shillings upon fifty dollars' worth. It is no trick, but it is a charm which you must wear about you, and which you must wish over about the girl at stated times, and it will be sure to have the desired effect. The customer asked the price of this wonderful charm. It is from five to fifty dollars but as you are so extraordinarily unlucky, I would advise you to take the full charm. It is the Chinese ruling planet charm, and I import it from China at great expense. You must wear it about you, and every time you use it, you must do it in the name of God, so you see there can be no demon about it. By means of this charm I have brought together husbands and wives who have been apart for three years, and I say a woman who can do that is doing good, and there is no demon about her. While you wear it, you will not die or meet with bad luck, but it will change the whole current of your life. She then told her unlucky hearer to make a wish, and she would tell him by the cards whether he could have it or not. The answer was in the negative, and it was evident that nothing but the Chinese ruling planet charm would save him, and no less than fifty dollars worth of that. So the smiling madam returned the charge. If you will take my advice as a friend, take the charm. It is for your sake only that I say this, for I make nothing by it. But I feel an interest in you, and I wish you would buy the charm for my sake as well as your own. For I want to see its effect on a fortune so bad as yours. If you don't buy it, and all kinds of ill fortune befalls you, don't say I didn't warn you, and don't call Madame Clifton a humbug, but if you do buy it, you may be sure that you will ever bless the day you saw Madame Clifton. It is perhaps needless to state that the individual didn't have with him the fifty dollars to pay for the charm, but intimated that he would call again after he got his year's salary. She then said, If you happen to call when I am engaged, Tell the girl to say that you want to see me about medicine, and I will see you, for I never put off anybody who wants medicine, no matter who is with me. Say medicine, and I will see you instantly. Here she softly showed her visitor to the door, and smiled on him until he stood on the outside steps. He then departed, secretly wondering what kind of medicine she was prepared to furnish in case any unlooked-for occasion should suggest a second call. Her last remark suggested that Madame Clifton derives a larger profit from the peculiar kinds of medicine she deals in than from all her other witchery. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix. Details the particulars of a morning call on Madame Harris of number 80 West 19th Street, and how she covered up her beautiful head in a black bag. Chapter 16. Madame Harris, number 80 West 19th Street, near 6th Avenue. Madame Harris is one of the most ignorant and filthy of all the witches of New York. She does not depend entirely on her astrology for her subsistence, but relies on it merely to bring in a few dollars, in the spare hours not occupied in the practice of the other dirty trades by which she picks up a dishonest living. She has had a good many customers, 
and in one way and another she contrives to get a good deal of money from the gullible public. She has been engaged in business a number of years, and has thriven much better than she probably would had she been employed in an honester avocation. The individual paid her a visit, and carefully noted down all her valuable communications. He was told the whole story and the words following. We all believe in Aladdin, and have as much faith in his uncle as in our own. But we don't know the pattern of his lamp. We have no photograph of the genie that obeyed it. And we can make no correct computation of the market value of the two hundred slaves with jars of jewels on their heads. The customer, who is determined that posterity shall be able to make no such complaint of him or of his history, here solemnly undertakes, upon the faith of his salary, to relate the unadorned truth, and to indulge in no ad libitum variations, imagining, while he writes, that he sees in the distance the critical public, like a many-headed gradgrind, singing out lustily for facts, sir, facts. The next fact, then to be investigated and sworn to, is this Madame Harris, a very dirty female fact indeed, residing in the upper part of the city, and advertising as follows. Madame Harris, this mysterious lady is a wonder to all. Her predictions are so true. She can tell all the events of life. Office number 80, West 19th Street, near 6th Avenue. Hours, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Ladies, 25 cents. Gentlemen, 50 cents. She causes speedy marriages. Charge extra. Wearily, the inquirer plodded his way on foot to West 19th Street, fearing to trust himself to a stage or car, lest the careless conversation of the unthinking and the reprehensible jocularity of the little boys who hang about the corners of the streets which intersect the 6th Avenue and pelt unwary passengers with paving stones, should divert his mind from the importance and great moral responsibility of his mission. After encountering a large assortment of the dangers and discomforts incident to the pedestrianism in New York in muddy weather, he achieved West 19th Street and stood in sight of the mysterious domicile of Madame Harris. It is a tenement house, shabby genteel, even in its first pretentious newness, but it has now lost its former appearance, even of semi-respectability, and has degenerated to a state of dirt only conceivable by those unhappy families who live two in a house, and are in a constant state of pot-and-kettle war, and of mutual refusing to clean out the common hall. A little mountain of potato-skins and bones, and other kitchen refuse, round which he was forced to make a detour, plainly said to the traveller that the population of the house number ninety were in the habit of depositing garbage in the gutters, under cover of the night, and in violation of the city ordinance. A highly perfumed atmosphere surrounds this delightful abode, for the first floor thereof is occupied as a livery stable, which constantly exhales those sweet and pungent odors peculiar to equine habitations. Pulling the sticky bell-handle with as dainty a touch as possible, the individual was admitted by a slatterny weak-eyed girl of about eighteen with her hair and dress as tumbled as though she had just been running through a corn-shelling machine, and who was so unnecessarily dirty that even her face had not been washed. She was further distinguished by a wart on her nose, of such shape and dimensions that it gave her face the appearance of being fortified by a many-sided fort, which commanded the whole countenance. This interesting young female welcomed her visitor with a clammy, come in, and led the way upstairs, he, following, in due dread of being for ever extinguished by an avalanche of unwashed keelers and kettles, which were unsteadily piled up on the landing, and which, an incautious touch would have toppled over, and deluged the stairs with unknown sweet-smelling compounds, whose legitimate destination was the sewer. On the second floor, directly judging from the noise, over the stall of the bulkiest horse in the stable below, is the room of the madam. The customer took an observation. The furnishings of the apartment showed an attempt to keep up a show, 
which was by far too miserably transparent to hide the slovenliness which peeped out everywhere through the tawdry gilding there were so many oil paintings on the walls in such gaudy frames that it seemed as if the room had been dipped into a bath of cheap auction pictures and hadn't been wiped dry or had been out in a shower of them and hadn't come in until it had got very wet a broad gilt window cornice stood leaning in the corner of the room instead of being in its legitimate place a pair of lace curtains were wadded up and thrown in a chair while the windows were covered with the commonest painted muslin shades a piano stool stood in the middle of the room but there was no piano there were the indications of better days these were the shallow traps set to inveigle the beholder into a belief in the opulence of the occupants of this charming residence but the little cooking stove on which two smoothing irons were heating the scraps of different patterned carpets which hid the floor and made it appear as if covered with some kind of variegated woolen chowder the second hand conciliating please buy me look of the three chairs and the dirt and greasy grime which gave a character to the place told at once the true state of facts on one side of the room was a little door evidently communicating with a closet or small bedroom on this door was a slip of tin on which was painted office madame harris astrologist and into this office the weak-eyed girl disappeared with a shamefaced look as if she had tried to steal her visitor's pocket-book and hadn't succeeded presently there came from the closet a sound of half-suppressed merriment as if a constant succession of laughs were born there full-grown and boisterous but were instantly garroted by some unknown power until each one expired in a kind of choky giggle there was also a noise of the making of a bed the hustling of chairs the putting away of toilet articles out of sight and over all was heard the chiding voice of madame harris who was evidently dressing herself superintending these other various operations and scolding the weak-eyed maiden all at once at last this latter individual got so far the better of her jocularity that she was able to deport herself with outward seriousness when she emerged from the mysterious closet and said to the individual walk in at this time she was under so great a head of laugh that she would inevitably have exploded had she not the instant her visitor turned his back let go her safety valve and relieved herself by a guffaw which would have been an honor and a credit to any one of the horses on the first floor the room in which madame harris was waiting to receive her customer was so dark that he stumbled over a chair and fell across a bed before he could see where he was then he recovered himself and took an observation the room was a very small one so diminutive indeed that the bed which occupied one side of it reduced the available space more than two-thirds it was partitioned off from the rest of the room by a dirty patchwork bed quilt with more holes than patches the walls were scrawled over with pencil marks evidently drawings made by young children who had the usual childish notions of proportion and perspective and on one side of the wall near the head of the bed a bit of pasteboard persisted in this startling announcement terms cash a narrow strip of rag carpet was on the floor a small stand and a chair completed the furnishing of the room and a single smoky pewter lamp exhausted itself in a dismal combat with the gloom which constantly got the better of it when the cash inquirer stumbled and took an involuntary leap into the middle of the bed an awful voice came out of the dreariness saying there is a chair right there behind you this information proved to be correct and the discomfited delegate subsided into it and gazed stolidly at the madam if madam harris were worth as much by the pound as beef her market price would be about twenty-five dollars she was attired in a loose morning gown of an exceedingly flashy pattern open before disclosing a skirt meant to be white but whose cleanliness was more traditional of her countenance her visitor cannot speak for it was carefully hidden from his inquiring gaze and its unknown beauties are left to the imagination of the reader 
perched mysteriously on the back of her head, where it was retained by some feminine hocus-pocus, which has never been a sealed mystery to mankind, was a little black bonnet, marvellous in pattern and design. From this depended a long black veil, covering her countenance, and disguising her as effectually as if she had washed her face and put on a clean dress. She proceeded at once to business, and opened conversation with this appropriate remark. My terms is fifty cents for gentlemen, and the pay is always in advance. Here followed a disbursement on the part of the anxious seeker after knowledge, and an approving chuckle was heard under the veil. Taking up a pack of cards so overlaid with dirt that it was a work of time and study to tell a queen from a nine-spot, or distinguish the knaves from the aces, she presented them with the imperative remark, Cut them once. Then ensued the following wonderful predictions uttered by a dubious and uncertain voice under the veil, which voice seemed one minute to come from the mouth, then it issued from the throat, then it sprawled out of the stomach, then it was heard from the back of the head under the bonnet, and in the course of a few minutes it came from so many places that the puzzled hearer was dubious as to its exact whereabouts, these curious effects being, doubtless, attributable to the thick covering over the face. But its various communications, when gathered together, were found to sum up as follows. You face back misfortune and trouble, of which you have had much, but they are now behind you, and you have no more to fear. You will henceforth be successful in business. You will have a great deal of money. Your affection card faces up a young woman with dark eyes and dark hair, about twenty-three years old. She is older than she has led you to believe. There is a dark-complexioned man, whom you will see in two days, who is your enemy. You may not know it, but you had better beware of him, for he will do you an injury if he can. You will see him and speak with him the night of day after to-morrow. Your marriage card faces up this dark woman, as I said before. I don't see a great deal of money laying round her, but there is plenty of money laying round you in the future. Somebody will die and leave you money within nine weeks, not counting this week. You was born under the planet Mars, which gives you two lucky days in every week, Mondays and Thursdays. Anything you begin on those days will surely succeed. Here she handed the cards to be cut again, which operation disclosed a new feature in the individual's matrimonial future, for she went on to say, there is another woman who faces your love card, who has light hair and light eyes. She favors your love card, and will be your first wife. You will have five children, four girls and one boy. Look out for the dark-complexioned man, for he favors your first wife, and though she does not favor him very much, he will try to get her away from you. Your line of life is long. You will live to be sixty-eight years old, but you will die very suddenly for your line of death crosses your line of life very suddenly, which always brings sudden death. Having given this cheering promise, she again held out the cards to be cut, and said, Cut them now, and make a wish at the same time, and I will tell you if you will have your wish. When the required ceremony had been solemnly performed, she continued, You will have your wish, but not right away. Don't expect to get it before week after next but then you will be sure to have it, for there is no disappointment in the cards for you. She then informed her customer that she always answered unerringly two questions, which he was now at liberty to propound. He made a couple of inquiries relative to his future business prospects, and received in reply the promise of most gratifying results. Having then, as he supposed, got his money's worth, he was about to take his leave, when she interrupted him thus. I have a charm for securing good luck to whoever wears it. You can wear it, and your most intimate friend would never suspect it. My charge is one dollar for gentlemen. A great many have bought it of me. Many merchants who were on the point of failing have come to me and possessed this charm and been saved. You had better possess it, for it will be sure to bring you good luck. If you possess it, you will always be successful in business. Mr. Lynch of Mott Street possessed it, and has been very lucky ever since, besides a great number I could name. My advice to you is possess the charm. 
She then put her elbows on her knees after the manner of a Fulton Market apple peddler, in which classic attitude she awaited an answer. The decision was not favorable to her hopes, for the economical customer concluded not to invest in the charm, although it had brought such excellent fortune to Mr. Lynch of Mott Street. He departed, encountering again in his progress the weak-eyed one, who met him with a smile, escorted him to the door with a great laugh, and dismissed him with a joyous grin. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostics Treats of the Peculiarities of Several Witches in a Single Batch Chapter 17 A Batch of Witches the fortune-tellers so elaborately described in the foregoing chapters are by no means the only ones in New York engaged in that lucrative occupation. There are several others who were visited by the individual, but who in their surroundings approach so nearly to those already set down that a detailed description of each would necessarily be a somewhat monotonous repetition. So the prophecy only of each one is here writ down with a few words suggestive of the character of the immediate neighborhood, leaving the imaginative reader to fill up the blank himself, or to turn back to some foregoing chapter for a picture of a similar locality, if he prefers it ready-made to his hands. Madame de Bellini, number 159, Forsyth Street. For the benefit of those not familiar with the streets of New York, it is perhaps well to mention that Forsyth Street is a dirty thoroughfare, two streets east of the Bowery, and that it is filled for the most part with small groceries, junk shops, swill milk dispensaries, and stalls for the sale of diseased vegetables and decaying fruit, and that the inhabitants are mostly delegates from Africa and from the Green Isle of the Sea. Immediately adjoining the domicile of Madame de Bellini is a filthy little vegetable store, and on the opposite corner is an equally filthy Irish grocery where are dispensed swill milk and poisoned whiskey. The residence of the madam is a low two-story brick house, of rather better appearance than many of its neighbors, which are principally wooden buildings with those old-fashioned peculiar roofs, with little windows close under the cornice, which makes a house look as if it had had its hat knocked over its eyes. Madame de Bellini is a Dutch woman of very large dimensions, being a two hundred and fifty pounder at the lowest estimate. Like most fat women, she is good natured and smiling. She is apparently thirty five years old, of pleasant manners, somewhat embarrassed by the difficulties she has in communicating her ideas in English, and is much neater in person and dress than the majority of ladies in the same line of business. She would be a popular barmaid at a large beer saloon and would preside over the fortunes of the sausage and Swiss cheese table, with eminent success and satisfaction to the public. She welcomed the cash customer in a jolly sort of way, introduced him to her private apartment, and seated him on a chair at one side of the little table, while she bestowed herself on a stool opposite. Having ascertained that he did not speak German with sufficient fluency to carry on an animated conversation in that tongue, or to comprehend a rapidly spoken discourse delivered therein, she was compelled to ventilate her English, which she did, beginning as follows. I speak not very much good English. I speak German and French, but no good English. The individual, with his usual caution, inquired how much she proposed to charge for her services. She responded thus, I tell your fortune, fear ein toller, or I can tell your fortune, fear ein half toller. Fifty cents worth was enough to begin with, so she took his left hand in her huge fist, and as a preliminary operation, squeezed it till he gave it up for lost, and in the intervals of his suffering hastily ran over in his mind the various ways in which one-handed people get a living. Then she relented, and did not deprive him of that useful member, but said, You have good hand, very good hand. Your hand gives you good fortune. You was born under good planet, very nice planet. You have very nice fortune. You have much rich, 
Vera great monish. You have seen troubles. Trouble. Vera much troubles. More troubles you have seen, as you will see some more. That is, you shall not have so many troubles, pie and pie, as you have had long ago. For you have good planet. You will journeys make much in future, future, years. You will have two wives and much kinders, children, and your future years. And you will be vera much happy and pleasant, meet your wife, what you shall have your first time. But not so much happy and pleasant, meet your wife, what you shall have der two time. But you shall very much monish, have in der forter years. She then released the hand of her visitor, who was very glad to get it back again, and took up a pack of cards, which she manipulated in the customary style, and then said, Your carts run vera nice, you have good carts. Here is a gentleman's as is vera good to you. He is great friends mit you. Here is a letter what you shall become to you write always vera soon. It is good news to you. You must do just what das letter says. Here is a brown girl's vat loves, loves, you vera much. But you do not love stats girls, so much as das girls love you. You will not be der wife of das girl. For there is another girls what you loves pretty bad, und you will marry her. She is pretty good girls, und you will be happy. You will have lots of kinders mit das girl. Das girls half a man now, was loves her vera much. He is what you call das soldier. He loves her much, but he shall not have her. You shall have das girls. Here is a great man, was will be good friend to you. He is vera great man, a big king, not was you call der konig, but your big mans, your was is das, your president. The president bees good friends mit you. Here is dark mans, he is no good friend mit you, and you must keep away from the dark mans. This was all the information she appeared to derive from this pack, which were ordinary playing cards, so she laid them aside, and took up the regular fortune-telling cards, which are covered with various mysterious devices. These did not seem to communicate anything of very special importance, in addition to what she had already said, for she examined them closely, and then merely summed up as follows. Good fortune, good planet, good wives, plenty monish, much kinder, not more troubles in their future years, big friends, president much friends with you, live long, ninety-nine years before you die, leave fortune to wife, und tut kinder. The individual was curious to inquire wherein the fifty-cent dose he had received differed from the fortunes for which she charged ein Toller, and he received the following information. For ein dollar I gives you a charm as you fares on your necks, und it gives you good luck forever, und you never gets drowned, und you lives long whiles, und you bees rich, und vera much happy. The madam was also good-natured enough to exhibit one of these powerful charms to her customer. It was a piece of parchment, originally about four inches square, but which had scalloped on the edges, and otherwise cut and carved. On it were inscribed in German several cabalistic words. This potent document was to be always worn next to the heart. Madame de Bellini has been in New York but a year or two. She speaks French and German, and is taking lessons in English from an American lady. She has many customers, mostly German, and, as in the case of all the other witches, the greatest majority of her visitors are women. Madame Le Bond, number 175 Hudson Street. The house in which this woman was sojourning at the time of the visit hereinafter described is a boarding house, and the room of the madam is the back parlor on the second floor. The individual was received at the door by a short, greasy, dirty man, about forty years of age, who invited him into the front parlor, to wait until the madam was disengaged. This man, who is an ignorant, half-imbecile person, passes for the husband of the fortune-teller, and is known as Dr. Le Bond. He is a man of peculiar appearance. The top of his head is perfectly bald, and the fringe of hair about the lower part of it is twisted into long corkscrew ringlets, 
that fall low down on his shoulders. He informed the customer that the madam was then engaged, but he seemed undecided about the exact nature of her present employment. He first said she was telling the future for a young gal. Then she was engaged with a literary man. Then a dry goods merchant wanted to find out if his head clerk didn't drink, but finally he said that Madam L is a eaten of her dinner. After some ingenious drawing out, the doctor vouchsafed the subjoined statement of his business prospects. We seen the time when we hadn't fifteen minutes a day, on account of a young gal's a comin' for to have their fortune told. We used to be busy from mornin' till ten and eleven o'clock at night, a tellin' fortunes and a doctorin'. But now we don't so much, cause the young gals don't like to come to a boardin' house where the young men can see em especially in the evening. We's too public here. The young men a boardin' here likes for to have the young gals come. They likes for to see em in the parlor. But the young gals won't come so much, cause we's too public. We'll have to get another house on account of business. I don't get so much doctorin' to do as I used to, cause we's too public. I have doctored lots of folks, principally young fellers and young gals, and I can do it right. If you ever get into any trouble, you'll find me and my wife all right. You can come to us. We mean to be all right, and to give everybody the worth of their money, and we is all right. By this time, Madame Lebond had finished her dinner, and was waiting in the back parlor. She is a fat, slovenly-looking woman, forty years old or more, having no teeth, and taking prodigious quantities of snuff, which gives her enunciation some peculiar characteristics. When the individual first beheld her, she was standing in the middle of the floor picking her teeth. She requested her visitor to take a seat, and to pay her half a dollar, with both of which requests he complied. She then put into his hand the end of a brass tube, about an inch in diameter and a foot long, and said, Give me the type of your birth as dear as possible. This was done, and the following brief dialogue ensued. Was you bored at the boarding? I really don't remember. Do you have Betty dreams? I do not dream much. Did you don't have bad dreams? No. Did you was bored in the boarding? By which mysterious word she probably meant morning. She then continued, You are a pretty keen spout chap, sharp in business, but dot good in speculations, as you should confide your attentions to business. If you keep odd as you are going now, ad works hard, and don't mix it with bad company, and is oddest, and don't spend your buddy, you will be rich. You will travel much, you will travel much, but your travels is hardly begun. There is a long journey at sea now before you, and you will start on this journey most unexpectedly. You will always be lucky, and will be very rich. I don't say nothing to flatter no bud. Lots of fellers and gals cub here, and I tell them all just what I see. If I see bad luck, I tell them so. But yours is all good luck, and I see lots of it for you. You have had bad luck lately, but you will get over your bad luck, for you are a pretty smart chap, and have got a good deal of ambition, and you go ahead pretty well. You will bury a gal, a gal as you have seen, but don't know. Very well, she is a yard gal and a rich gal, and a good-looking gal. You will not bury her for sub time, but you will bury her at last. She has a bow, and you will likely have some trouble with him, but you will get the gal at last. The gal has light hair and blue eyes, and I could show her to you if you would like to see her. Of course the visitor liked to see her, so he was directed to clasp the brass tube in his right hand, and placed his hand over the top, then she stepped behind his chair, and began to go through with some extraordinary manual exercises on his head. She felt of the bumps, she squeezed his head, punched it, jerked it from side to side, and twisted it about in every possible direction. What was the object and intention of this performance she did not disclose, but when she had kneaded his unfortunate skull to her satisfaction, she bade him step to the window and look into the tube. This he did, 
and he saw a very dingy-looking daguerreotype of a fair-haired damsel with blue eyes, who bore, of course, not the most distant resemblance to any lady of his acquaintance. Then the fat madam had a charm to sell, to be worn about the neck, and never taken off, in which case it would secure for the wearer good luck for ever. The individual declined to purchase and departed, meeting at the door the curly doctor, who once again offered his medical services in case the stranger ever got into trouble, and who once assured that person with an air of mystery that me and my wife is all right. Yes, you may depend, we is all right, we is. Madame Marr and Madame de Gore, number 176 Varick Street. These two eminent sorceresses are in partnership, and drive a tolerably fair trade. They advertise in the papers, one week the heading being Madame Marr assisted by Madame de Gore, then the next week it will be Madame de Gore assisted by Madame Marr, and the profits of the business are shared in the same impartial manner. The house, number 176, is in the worst part of Varick Street, and the room occupied by the pair of witches is over a boot and shoe store, and a pawnbroker's shop is directly opposite. The room is a small parlor, neatly though plainly furnished, and with no professional implements visible. When the inquirer made his call, Madame de Gore was engaged in the kitchen, in her various household duties, and Madame Marr attended to his call. She is a tall and rather pleasing woman, neatly dressed and of quiet manners. She secured a dollar in advance, and then led her customer into a little closet-like room, furnished only with a small table and two chairs. She then announced that she is a phrenologist, and exhibited a plaster bust with the bumps scientifically marked out, and also some phrenological charts and other publications. She proceeded to give the character of her visitor in the unusual mode of phrenological examinations, after which she prophesied as follows. You were born between Jupiter and Mars. With such stars you can never be unlucky, for although you have seen trouble, it is past. Your luck runs in threes and fives, that is, you are unlucky three years in succession, and lucky the five years following. You are never very unlucky, but you do not do so well in your third house as in your fifth house. You could not be unlucky in your fifth house if you tried. You have now two months to run in your third house, then comes on your fifth house. Just now your life seems to be under a cloud, but after two months you will come out bright, and will enjoy five years of clear sunshine, and you will then be very wealthy. You will have more money then than you ever will again, though you will always have plenty. Your wealth runs fourteen at the end of five years, after that runs thirteen and a half, which is very wealthy. You will marry a young girl, wealthy and beautiful. You will raise two daughters, but you will never have a large family. You will be the father of many children, but your family will never be more than two children. You will go in business with a very wealthy southern man. His wealth runs fourteen. He has two sons and a daughter. You will marry the daughter, though you will be opposed by the father and one son, but the other son will stick by you. You will live with that wife twenty-five years, then she will die, and you will travel with your two daughters. You will go to Europe. In England you will marry a French widow. Your two daughters will marry well, and at seventy-two or seventy-three years old you will die, leaving a widow, two daughters, and a large fortune. Madame de Gore did not make her appearance at all, and after Madame Marr had failed to induce her visitor to pay her an extra dollar for a phrenological chart, she politely showed him out. Madame Lane, number 159, Mulberry Street. This distinguished lady lives in a dirty, dilapidated mansion at the corner of Grand and Mulberry Streets. The cash customer was admitted by the madame herself, who desired him to be seated for a few minutes until she had concluded her business with a boy of seventeen years old, who had called to find out what would be the winning numbers in the next Georgia lottery. Two dirty-faced children were playing about the room, making a great noise. One corner of the room was fenced off with rough boards, forming a narrow closet, 
in which two people could, with some difficulty, sit down. This was the astrological chamber, the mystic room into which visitors were conducted to have their fortunes told. Madame Lane is of the Irish breed, is red-haired, freckled, and dirty to a degree. Her dress was ragged, showing a soiled, dingy petticoat through the rents. She seated her customer in the little room, producing a pack of cards, and proceeded to tell his future, at times shouting out threats and words of warning to the noisy brats outside. Then she said, You are a man as has seen a great deal of trouble in the past. It will be noticed that this is almost a universal remark with the witches, probably because it is a perfectly safe thing to assert of any person in the world. Yes, you have seen trouble in the past, not real trouble, such as sickness or losses in business, but still trouble, and your mind has been going this way and that way and t'other way. But now all your troubles and disappointment is past, and your mind won't go this way and that way any more. Stop that noise, you brats, or I'll beat you. This to the children. Your cards run lucky, cause you were born under Jupiter, and folks as is born under Jupiter will always be lucky in business, in love, and in everything they undertake. If your business sometimes goes this way and that way and t'other way, it will all come out all right, for when a man is born under Jupiter, he must be all right in his business, and in his love, and in his marriage, and in his children. Young ones, stop that noise, or I'll beat you black and blue. You have had sickness lately, and your mind has been going this way and that way and t'other way, but you need not worry, for it will be all right soon. Children, stop that row, or clear right out of the kitchen. Now mind, I tell you. I see a girl here that loves you very much, but you don't love her, and won't marry her, but you will marry another girl with black whiskers. No, I mean the feller that is courting her has got black whiskers, and I fear you will have trouble with black whiskers if you are not careful. The girl has got black hair and is miserable because you don't write to her. I'm coming after you, young ones there, with a raw hide, and I'll cut the skin off your backs. You will marry this gal, and you will be very happy, and will have three children, which will be joys to you. Children, I'll come and kill you in two minutes. And you will always be prosperous in your business, and you will be very rich, and you will live to be eighty-five years old. Now you can cut the cards and make a wish, and I will tell you if it will come true. Yes, your wish will come true, because you have cut the knave, and queen and king. If you'd like a speedy marriage with the gal I told you of, I'll fix it for you for fifty cents extra. Children, if you don't shut up, I'll come and beat you blind. The individual invested a half dollar as requested, and received in return a white powder with these instructions. You will burn that powder just before you get into bed, and if you see the gal tonight, you won't see no change in her, but she will be changed tomorrow. She is kinder down on you now, but she loves you though her mind is kinder this way and that way. But she will be changed toward you tonight by what I will do after you are gone. The customer departed, leaving this fond mother engaged in an active skirmish with the two children, both of whom finally escaped into the street with great howlings. Madame Lane does a good business. She says that in pleasant weather she has from twenty-five to fifty calls a day, mostly women, but in bad weather not more than fifteen or twenty, and these of the other sex. Many of these come only to learn lucky numbers for lottery gambling and policy playing. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Witches of New York by Q. K. Philander Dostix Conclusion It has been already mentioned that there are a number of persons in this city who do more or less in the fortune-telling way, who never advertise for customers. These we must leave to their own seclusion, as our business has been with those who make a business of this species of swindling, and who use all manner of arts to entice the curious or the credulous into their dens, there not only robbing them of their money, but often putting them in the way to be injured much more deeply. This, of course, is especially the case with young girls. In order to give the readers of this book an idea of the part taken by these fortune-telling women in many of the terrible dramas of crime 
constantly enacting in city life, an extract showing the modus operandi is here inserted. It is from one of a series of very useful little books published in this city, and entitled Tricks and Traps of New York. Speaking of New York fortune-tellers, the author says, having previously indulged in some severe remarks about yellow-covered novels, to see how the fortune-teller performs her part, let us suppose a case. A young, credulous girl, whose mind has been poisoned by the class of fictions above referred to, is induced to visit a modern witch for the purpose of having her fortune told. The woman is very shrewd, and perceives, in a moment, the kind of customer she has to deal with. Understanding her business well, she is perfectly aware that love and marriage, courtship, lovers, and wedded bliss, are the subjects which are most agreeable. She begins by complimenting her customer. Such beautiful eyes, such elegant hair, such a charming form, and graceful manners, are altogether too fine for a servant or working girl. She must surely be intended for a higher station in life, and she will certainly attain it. She will rise in the world, by marriage, and will one day be one of the finest ladies in the land. Her husband will be the handsomest man she has ever seen, and her children will be the most beautiful in the world. Fortune-tellers always foretell many children to their female customers, for the instinct of maternity the yearning desire for offspring is one of the strongest feelings of human nature. Much more of this sort is said, and if the witch finds her talk eagerly listened to, she knows exactly how to proceed. She appoints days for other visits, for she desires to get as many half-dollars out of her dupe as she can. Meantime the girl has been thinking of what she has heard, has pictured to herself a brilliant future, a rich husband, every luxury and enjoyment, and, upon the whole, has built so many castles in the air that her brain is half bewildered. Even though she may not believe a little of what is said to her, feminine curiosity will generally lead her to make a second visit, and when the fortune-teller sees her come upon a like errand a second time, she sets down her prey as tolerably sure, and lays her plans accordingly. She goes on to state to the girl, in her usual rigmarole style, that she will, in a few weeks, make with a lover, and perhaps she may receive a present of jewelry, and by that she will know that the handsome young man has seen and been smitten by her many charms. When the half-believing girl has gone, the scheming sorceress calls to her aid her confederate in the game, the party who is to personate the handsome young man. This is usually a spruce-looking fellow, who makes this particular kind of work his regular business, or it may be some rich debauchee who is seeking another victim, will come and lie in wait, either behind the curtain or in the next room, where, through some well-contrived crevice, he can see and hear all that is going on. One or the other of these men it is, that is to assist the witch in fulfilling her prophecies, who is, at the proper time, to be in the way to personate the young beau, or rich southerner, and to induce her to visit a house of assignation, or in some way accomplish her ruin. Persons who have been puzzled to know how many of the young fellows get their living, who are seen about town, always well dressed and with plenty of cash, and yet having no apparently respectable means of living, will find a future solution of their questions in this explanation. Many of these men are kept by their mistresses, or by the proprietors of houses of ill fame. In the latter case, to make acquaintance with strangers, and to bring business to those houses, they are often very fine-looking and well-appearing men, and possessed of good natural abilities. But from laziness or crime, or some other cause, adopt the meanest possible business a man can stoop to. Humiliating as this may seem, and degrading as it is to poor human nature, what we state is, nevertheless, the literal truth. But to come back to our supposed case, a few days after her visit to the witch, the girl actually does, perhaps, receive a present, as the witch predicted. 
This not only pleases her vanity and love of admiration, but disposes her to put confidence in the powers of the fortune-teller to read coming events. Straight away, the deluded girl goes again to the witch, to tell how things have fallen out, as she foretold, and to seek further light upon the subject. It is now the cue of the prophetess to describe the young man. This she does in glowing terms, never failing to endow him with a large fortune, and the poor girl goes away with her head more turned than ever. Enraptured with the description, or sight of the picture of her fond love, the deluded girl is now all anxiety to see him in person. The witch, accordingly, gives her some magical powder, price one dollar, which she is to put under her pillow every night for seven nights, or wear next to her heart for nine days, or some other nonsense of that kind, at the end of which time she is told to take the ferry-boat to Hoboken or some such place, at a certain hour in the afternoon, and somewhere on her route she will have a sight of the gentleman she is almost crazed to see. The result is plain. The gentleman is there as foretold. An acquaintance is commenced, and the girl is ultimately ruined. We have been thus particular to give step by step the details of the mode of management pursued in these cases. There are, of course, many varieties, dictated by the circumstances of each case, but the general features and the result are the same. The incidents above given are the outlines of a real case in which the end of the conspirators was accomplished. The girl, however, was rescued by the managers of the Magdalen Asylum, and is now leading a blameless life. The individual has now concluded his labors, and he hopes not without profit to the community at large. He has heard it urged that this book will merely advertise the fortune-tellers, and that they will go on driving a more flourishing trade than ever. He cannot think that this will be the case. He cannot believe that any persons who read in his book the candid exposition of the style of necromancy dealt out by the modern Circes will be willing to pay money for any personal experience of them, and he respectfully submits that although they have heretofore been consulted by many ladies of respectability, from motives of mere curiosity, those ladies will risk no further visits when they learn that they may, with as much propriety, visit any other assignation house as a fortune-teller's den. A recapitulation of the various prophecies made to the cash customer would show that he has been promised thirty-three wives and something over ninety children, that he was brought into the world on various occasions between 1820 and 1833, that he was born under nearly all the planets known to astronomers, that he has more birthplaces than he has fingers and toes, that he has passed through so many scenes of unexpected happiness and complicated misfortune in his past life, that he must have lived fifty hours to the day, and been wide awake all the time, and he has so many future fortunes marked out for him, that at three hundred and fifty years old his work will not be half done, and when at last all is finally accomplished, a minute dissection of his aged corpus will be necessary, that his earthly remains may be buried in all the places set down for him by these prophets. But aside from a humorous contemplation of the subjects, he trusts he has done his work well. He is sure that he has done it faithfully, and he honestly hopes that some good may come of his labors to write down here honestly the ignorance and imbecility of the witches of New York. The End End of Chapter 18 And End of the Witches of New York